This is an NIH HEAL initiative workshop on myofascial pain. The formal title of our uh, conference is the Quantitative Evaluation of Myofascial Tissues, Potential Impact for Musculoskeletal Pain Research. This is day two of our event, and we're um, so happy to have all of the members of our panelists joining us and everyone who's watching in Zoom and also on NIH videocast. Thank you for joining us today. We're going to begin our second day. As you can see here, I have some slides. Robert, if you can move to the next slide, please. Uh, first, we want to acknowledge the many wonderful co-organizers and partners who helped make this event happen. And of course, our planning committee, as you can see the names of all of the members of the committee listed here. Thank you, next slide. And also we want to just welcome you back. Those of you who joined yesterday, you'll recognize these logistics, but just a brief reminder for all of our panelists and attendees, Zoom webinar panelists, please mute yourself unless you're speaking. Um, have your video on during your session. And then don't forget to raise your digital hand and wait until you're called upon during the panel discussion portion of your session and any session that you're participating in. If you're new to Zoom as a panelist, don't forget to click on your participant tab, which is at the bottom of your screen, and that will launch the participant box, which is where you'll find your raise hand feature. Next slide, please. For our Zoom webinar attendees who are gathering with us now, uh, just a reminder that you are indeed muted and your video feed is off. That's part of the webinar settings and it helps manage the technology of the meeting. Um, you may though post a question in the Q&A box at any time and you may raise your digital blue hand in, in the, during the open Q&A portion um, if you wanna ask your question live and I will be looking for that. And again, to find your Q&A tab or your raised hand feature, you want to hover over the bottom of the Zoom screen and you should see these little icons popping up and you should be able to click on them for raising the hand or for Q&A. And for our videocast viewers, as we said to you yesterday, please feel free to use NIH videocast feedback form at any time during the session to pose a question or you can send an email to nccihwebinarq at mail.nih.gov. So I think that covers all the logistics and again, a warm welcome to everyone. And I'm now going to turn it over to Dr. Alain Langevin, Director of the National Center for Complementary and Integrative Health to kick off our day and to introduce Dr. Jill Hinskirk. Well, thank you very much, Catherine. Good morning, everyone. It's my great pleasure to welcome uh, Dr. Jill, uh, Jill Hemskirk, who uh, is the uh, Deputy Director of the National Institute of Biomedical Imaging and Bioengineering, or NIBIB. And Dr. Uh, Hemskirk is going to give us some opening uh, remarks. Um, Dr. Hemskirk has a 18-year record of distinguished service at NIH. She joined NIBIB as Associate Director for Research Administration and subsequently was appointed NIBIB Deputy Director. Previously, she was Deputy Director for the Division of Adult Translational Research at the National Institute of Mental Health and Acting Director of the Office of Translational Research at the National Institute of Neurological Diseases, Disorders and Stroke, or NINDS. At NINDS, she built a large program in preclinical uh, therapeutics development for neurological diseases, emphasizing drug discovery, chemistry, translation of basic research findings to the clinic. Dr. Heemskirk has served on uh, scientific advisory boards for the ALS Association, the Spinal Muscul Muscular Atrophy um, Foundation, and the uh, Huntington's Disease Society of America. She earned her PhD in biochemistry and biophysics for the, uh, from the University of California, San Francisco, and conducted research in developmental molecular genetics at Columbia University. Um, welcome, Dr. Hinskirk. Thank you very much, Ellen, for that nice introduction. And good morning to everyone, and welcome to day two of the NIH HEAL Initiative Workshop on Myofascial Pain. Uh, this workshop has actually been planned for over 10 months now, and we're very excited to see it unfold. It was the brainchild 
of two NIH directors that arrived at NIH rather recently, Hélène Langevin, Director for Integrative Health, and my director, Bruce Tromberg, at the Bioengineering and Imaging Institute, uh, both came to NIH at about the same time, around the beginning of 2019. And their early discussions about the importance of fascia in pain and the need for imaging to characterize fascia and understand its role were a true meeting of the minds. Elaine helped us appreciate that fascia is a new frontier in biomedicine and uh, long unappreciated, very little understood, and a potential key inroad into pain treatments that have been eluding us for many decades despite enormous effort. The role of fascia and pain has since, since captured the imagination of many at NIH, and that is evident um, both from the number of NIH institutes that are involved in organizing this meeting and um, also uh, the role of the NIH HEAL initiative in supporting this meeting. So to propel the field forward, we really want to be able to see what is happening. And to NIBIB, this is an important invitation to explore and harness new imaging methods and new technologies. So we're very pleased to join um, NCCIH in organizing this workshop and excited to hear more from you all today about the promise of technology to unlock our understanding of myofascial pain. Yesterday, we heard about the vision and challenges of research into myofascial pain and potential approaches to visualizing its pathophysiology. Today, we'll hear more about um, promising technologies from imaging to sensors, to artificial intelligence, computational modeling, tissue engineering, all of which are very important areas of focus for NIBIB and our hope is that this workshop will result in new collaborations and synergies between myofascial pain researchers and technology developers that will transform our understanding. We all recognize that effective pain treatments are urgently needed, and I'm very grateful to all of you for your efforts to understand myofascial pain. Opening up this frontier through imaging and other novel approaches can inform development of pain treatments so that they can be applied effectively and broadly to relieve the tremendous suffering that arises both from pain itself and often from resulting opioid misuse. So let's get going with today's discussions. And with that, I will turn the meeting over to Alex Tuttle from NINDS, who is chairing our next session on emerging technologies for myofascial pain. Thank you very much. Hi, good morning, everyone. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Alex Tuttle, and I am at NINDS. And my co-chair, Chuck Washaba is at NIAMS, and together we're very proud to present the next session, um, which we'll be focusing on emerging and promising technologies for myofascial pain syndrome uh, with a focus on electrophysiology, MRI, and PET. So let me share. Okay, so this will be the meeting schedule um, for the majority of the rest of the morning. Um, so we have four speakers who will be going through uh, potential technologies that can be adopted to better understand myofascial pain syndrome. So yesterday, uh, we had a great overview of what MPS is, and then we had a, a, a very vibrant discussion on the pathophysiology of MPS before moving on to imaging and other techniques like electrophysiolo uh, electrophysiology, ultrasonic vocalization, and, uh, um, and other techniques to uh, better understand myofascial pain syndrome. Today, we'd like to focus on emerging or other technologies that have been developed to study other types of pain and other types of muscular biology that can be adapted to better understand myofascial pain syndrome. So with that in mind, we have, uh, like I said, four speakers and then a, uh, a panel of um, experts in other areas of chronic pain who will be able to shed light on ways that we can adapt these new technologies to better understand the pathophysiology and underlying biology of myofascial pain syndrome. Our first speaker, uh, Dr. Chadhari, uh, will be speaking on innovations in PET for future applications in myofascial pain syndrome. All of our speakers were asked to characterize how their technologies could be adapted to understand the peripheral biology 
underlying myofascial pain syndrome. And you can see that Dr. Chadhari will be talking primarily about applications that can be adopted to better understand structural and vascular immune and metabolic uh, processes. Next, we have Dr. Spangenberg from East Carolina University, who will be talking about the application of techniques that assess physiological and metabolic parameters of skeletal muscle to, under to advance our understanding of myofascial pain syndrome. Dr. Spangenberg will be focusing primarily on vascular, immune, and metabolic uh, processes that can be studied to better understand the syndrome. Dr. Rutkov will then be talking about electrophysiology techniques and the potential applications for myofascial tissues, focusing on structural, structural, mechanical, and neurophysiological processes. Finally, we have uh, Dr. Fairmans from NYU Langone Health, who will be talking about uh, in vivo imaging of tissue and mus muscle microstructure. So she'll be doing uh, diffuse tensor imaging techniques. Uh, she'll be talking about diffuse imaging techniques uh, that can better understand structural, vascular, immune, and metabolic processes. So with that, I'll hand it over to our first speaker, Dr. Shadhari. Is everybody able to see my screen? Yes, we are. Perfect. All right, good morning, everybody. Uh, bright and early here on the West Coast. And uh, uh, first of all, I would like to thank the organizers for asking me to speak at this meeting. Um, we've seen this slide multiple times and the aspects that I'll address are, are the vascular immune metabolic components that are highlighted in red here. But I also wanted to point out that there was a lot of discussion yesterday about the structural aspects of fatty filtration and fibrosis. And, and of course, there's a molecular aspect associated with evaluating these, uh, uh, these structures as well. And so I'll also describe them uh, a little bit. Right off the bat, I have to say that in my literature review, uh, PET has had a very, very limited role in the characterization of myofascial tissues. Uh, and, and even more so in the context of myofascial pain syndrome. However, in this presentation, I hope to describe some recent advances in PET that uh, have uh, really you know, made it, or it's well poised in some ways to benefit the characterization of myofascial tissue and also to address some of the concerns that, that uh, we've had about the application of PET in general, but also specifically to myofascial tissues. Now, we spent quite a bit of time talking about the anatomical spectrum of the in vivo imaging uh, uh, components per se, but my focus is going to be on PET, which is more so focused towards the metabolic and molecular aspects of uh, imaging. And uh, if we look at molecular imaging methods uh, and uh, look at the spatial versus the sensitivity scales, we can readily see that uh, PET has very high sensitivity typically of the, at the picomolar level. It does not compete with other modalities in terms of spatial resolution, but in terms of sensitivity, it's considered one of the highest uh, imaging modalities that we have. Also, it's quantitative, which is essentially that the uh, concentration of this uh, radioactive tracer uh, essentially is reflected directly uh, in the images that we get. So how does PET scanning work? Well, we inject a radio tracer that is targeted towards a specific uh, a molecule of interest. Then we detect the annihilation photons using a PET scanner. And then finally, we reconstruct the images uh, using image processing methods. So I'll describe a few of these aspects as, as we go along. Now, I, I should say that there's been significant advance in the context of PET radio tracers over the past several decades. Uh, initially, radio tracers were very generally targeted. However, we have been been uh, more and more specific. So uh, and that's, I think, one of the nice uh, things about PET. And here is what has been radio labeled uh, with these PET radioisotopes. And of course, uh, as you go down this list, you'll see that there are a number of targets here that might be of interest in myofascial pain syndromes. Uh, the scales associated uh, go all the way from nanometers to about hundreds of, uh, hundreds of nanometers. So, what has happened, of course, is improved sense uh, specificity associated with these radio tracers. And what this means really is that uh, there's more uptake 
in the regions of interest and lesser uptake in the background. And that, of course, is beneficial as, as we discussed yesterday uh, in uh, Dr. Bissall's uh, presentation. Now, the, the advancements in the aspects associated with radiochemistry has gone hand in hand with uh, advancements in systems that, that we have and instrumentation. So of course that has led to significant improvements in image quality as you can see in this, uh, uh, in this uh, image on, on the right hand side. Now of course uh, standard pet technology is uh, that you have a, a person or an animal on the scanner and, and mostly for human beings we scan parts of the body and we step the person through the system. Now we have realized in our field that this particular configuration leads to collection of only less than 1% of the total signal that is available. And therefore we have lower number of detected photons and we have a corresponding high dose. Within the last seven to eight years, there has been significant development in this idea that's been around since the eighties, but we're just not able to uh, have the instrumentation and the, uh, you know, the electronics that's necessary, but it has become available. And this idea is how about we cover large portions of the body? And of course, you see that in the Pen Pet Explorer, there are large portions of the body that are covered. In the UC Davis Pet Explorer, you actually have the entire body that is covered by detectors for pet. So this configuration of surrounding the body by uh, these uh, detectors allows us to allow to give uh, much higher sensitivity. Uh, 40 times higher than conventional systems or 25 to 30 times higher than conventional systems. Now, the importance of uh, these in the context of myofascial pain syndrome is that you get total body coverage or kind of large parts of the body. And that's something that we talked about is the extent of myofascial tissue uh, across the body uh, is something that could be evaluated using this technique. And what is shown in the center is a maximum intensity projection and, uh, and slices from the different areas that you can kind of slice and dice the body to look at uh, the different aspects. But also what comes with these systems is this uh, benefit associated with signal to noise ratio. Again, much uh, better uh, ability to see you know, smaller objects and also lower dose because of the sensitivity that's significantly higher. And in this context, uh, uh, in the context of Pet Explorer at, the U at UC Davis, this is about a 40 times benefit. So that actually really makes uh, these uh, uh, techniques much, much more easier to apply to a general population in the context of repeating scans, for example, or actually evaluating using different radio tracers and different processes at the same time. Uh, speed has, has also gone up. And, and of course, we have the ability of imaging longer, and I'll discuss what uh, the benefits are in, in a minute. But uh, the spatial resolution of the modality, again, is not, uh, does not compete with anatomical modalities, but, but it still uh, has gone up uh, by a factor of two from about six millimeters to about three millimeters in recent systems. Now, these developments, of course, have kept uh, uh, kind of a abreast of kind of the animals models as well, actually. And so we had uh, these micro pet scanners a couple of decades ago that scanned the entire animal body. However, recently, uh, the same approaches of total body pet have uh, uh, come to bear for uh, non-human primates and for large animals. And what is shown in spatial scales are scans associated with the same uh, underlying mechanism of glucose metabolism and fluorodeoxyglucose across species. So the same processes and same procedures can essentially be performed across uh, multiple species in terms of imaging uh, using PET. And uh, the same processes can be evaluated. And this is useful for uh, from a translational point of view. So let's get into the details about uh, specific areas uh, that that could uh, uh, that of uh, of uh, targeting that could benefit myofascial tissues. Uh, if we just look at inflammation, of course, there's a number of uh, uh, these targets uh, that have been radio labeled. And what is shown are, are the targets on top and then the corresponding radio traces in the list of radio traces at the bottom that have become available. These range all the way from glucose transporters, for example, or mitochondrial proteins to uh, receptors, dnf alpha receptors, as well as integrins. So you can see that you have the opportunity using PET to target different processes uh, in the inflammatory cascade. And I think this is beneficial for being able to tease out some of the biological aspects associated with the disease. There's just a few examples here. Fluorodeoxyglucose, the most commonly used radio tracer with a substitution of radioactive fluorine. It is internalized into cells via the glucose transporters, undergoes phosphorylation, and gets trapped in the cells. 
Uh, therefore, in steady state, uh, this uh, particular uh, radio tracer provides a marker for glucose metabolism. Of course, this has been used in, in a number of conditions. Uh, in this context, we are showing an example of autoimmune arthritis, where you see uh, classic pathologies associated with inflammatory arthritis, uh, such as joint inflammation, enthesitis, and sacroilitis, uh, are, are highlighted by uh, uh, the glucose uptake, and this can be quantified. Now, if you want to get more specific, you can look at the uh, translocator protein activity. Uh, this is uh, a, a mitochondrial per protein and uh, is a signature associated with macrophage activation and infiltration. It has been employed in, in different contexts, muscle inflammation, as well as in the context of intraarthritis. So again, going from a more generic uh, glucose metabolic process, basically to a bit more specific in terms of uh, proteins. The spatial resolution has gone up significantly and that has actually led to uh, uh, you know, us being able to see small objects, which is again, very important uh, for the evaluation of let's say trigger points. At the same time, a uh, reduced dose. Uh, so this image on the, on the right hand side was acquired at one fifth of the dose and it's just a section through the whole body image that is shown. So fatty infiltration is the other piece of, of this. And of course there has been a uh, proof that uh, Sarcopenia and cachexia have been imaged. So this is again, stru not structural, but uh, the metabolic components associated with structural imaging. And oh, I mean, this, uh, is that uh, you can, uh, uh, the fluorodeoxyglucose PET in this context provides independent value over the uh, uh, you know, anatomical imaging modalities for, uh, for evaluation of, of muscle in this context. And of course that's been correlated with uh, survival in cancer stadium. There have been a number of studies looking at fat metabolism and, and uh, physical activity as well using uh, these approaches. Perfusion is another part actually that can be evaluated. The same radio tracer for deoxyglucose, you can actually watch the wash in and wash out characteristics. You don't have to wait and just look at the steady state metabolism, but you can watch the wash in and wash out characteristics. And there's been work looking at the wash in associated with the radio tracer and correlating that with perfusion. And of course, you know, there's been a long history in PET going back three or four decades now of radio traces that are specific to blood flow. Uh, this is oxygen 15 water or carbon 11 butanol. And in, in this context, it's been shown in the context of cerebral uh, blood flow. However, at that point, the sensitivity of the scanners was not very high and the ability of the scanners to evaluate their total body was not very high. And of course, so now these approaches can be brought to bear in the context of uh, what uh, we, uh, we spoke, talked about, which is biofascial tissue characterization. Sites of pain, uh, Dr. Biswal already presented uh, these data yesterday, looking at uh, when uh, there is inflammation at sites of pain versus uh, looking at the sigma one uh, based uh, more targeted approaches. And then finally, uh, there is a drug biodistribution. So antibodies can be labeled using PET radioisotopes, and then you can watch the wash in and wash out characteristics associated with these antibodies. This is useful uh, for drug labeling because then you can, you know the biodistribution of the drug, not over just a small duration of time, but over multiple days, and uh, therefore allow better uh, characterization of, of the biodistribution of these drugs and uh, potential efficacy. And these methods can be repeated in humans in a similar analogous way. So to conclude, uh, I hopefully have described that there have been promising advances in PET that actually uh, have allowed to uh, uh, combine it with other imaging modalities and, and make contributions that are, are poised to affect the uh, myofascial pain field. And these applications could span myofascial tissue characterization as well as uh, on the other hand, treatment selection, uh, screening and, and optimization. So uh, with that, I will conclude my presentation and thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Chatari. Next, we have Dr. Spangenberg from East Carolina University. Hang on a second. My, uh, I had to, my computer died. Oh dear. And so hang on one sec. Hopefully this goes. Well, I'm on a different computer, so let's see now. All right. Can you guys see my screen? Yes. Okay. Yes, we can. Yep. Good. Perfect. All right. Um, so um, first of all, I wanted to thank 
the organizers for the invitation. Um, I'm going to take a little bit of a left-hand turn um, and then I'm going to talk about both preclinical models and how we can apply the information we get in preclinical models and how we can try to collect similar information in humans in a non-invasive fashion. Um, so hopefully I'm going to be able to build on some of the things that we've already talked about. Um, I'm really going to focus mostly on the skeletal muscle aspect of it and then the blood vessels a little bit um, and I'm going to leave the nerve to the next investigator. Um, one of the things I really want to get home, though, is, is we're being very general uh, so far in our talks about the skeletal muscle and the fascia that's within the skeletal muscles. And I just want to point out real quickly that each muscle is unique and, we're, and we can't totally be general about it, meaning that a muscle in the shoulder may not be the same as a muscle in the leg, may not be the same as a muscle in the arm. And that we know that based on fiber type distributions, which I'm showing you here, these are two muscles collected out of the same animals. They're typed for their different muscle cells. And you can see, without me really going into a lot of detail, that there's clearly differences across these muscles. Two, same animal, different muscles, different types. And that composition has a large effect on its phenotype. So, and I can show you this a little bit better here. This is three different muscles. This is a muscle in the foot, a muscle in the calf, and then a muscle on the front of the shin. Um, and what we've done is done a proteomics approach. So it's a discovery-based approach. We're identifying as many possible proteins as we can, which is well over 2000. If you're on this side of the curve here, so it's a volcano plot, what we're seeing is more of these proteins are expressed in the soleus muscle, which is in the calf, versus the muscle in the foot, which is the FDB muscle. The ones in red are the mitochondria proteins, the, and the ones in the black are cytosolic proteins. And so what you can see is a massive divergence between the two muscles. We can do the same thing. Here's the FDB, so it's our foot muscle, and then the muscle on the front of our leg. And again, we get the same effect. The EDL is over here, and the FDB is over here, and same thing down here in the soleus and the EDL. This has been shown at the transcriptional level too um, by Karen Esser and Michael Hughes. So my only point here really is to drive home the idea that the muscles, are, they're not all equal. There's heterogeneity across all of our muscles and likely within the fascia that it surrounds those muscle fibers. So we have to be real careful to not assume that because a mechanism is activated maybe in a muscle of the shoulder, that the exact same muscle uh, mechanism will be activated maybe in the arm. Um, so what I'm going to do is anchor myself within this slide and you're going to see here, I'm going to talk my way through what is marked in red and what kind of procedures we can use to assess those. Um, one imaging technique we haven't really talked a lot about, but this is a laser Doppler imaging approach. Um, this is in with doing ischemia. So my lab um, with Joe McClung's lab does a lot of ischemia work. Um, I'm just showing you two different kinds of strains of mice. The darker the red, the higher the perfusion. So this is an anesthetized animal. It's alive, and we're just simply assessing the perfusion of the limb. We've made the left limb ischemic, and so you can see there's very little red color. We can flip the animal over in a prone position. Again, look at the other side, and you can see we can quantify or we can measure the amount of perfusion, and then we can quantify it. Um, and we can do this over time, and you can, we can track it in a longitudinal fashion. We can track oxygen content as well using FNIRs. Um, so you can see oxygen saturation. Again, this is non-invasive. And so we're doing this in an animal model, but we can also do this in humans over here. It's an inexpensive approach. Um, and so it's relatively easy for labs to adopt. And you can see that we can occlude it, make the signal go away and reperfusion returns it. Um, we can also measure mitochondrial respiration. This is done. This data I'm showing you is invasive. These are fiber bundles. And so the fiber bundles here is where we pull the fiber bundles out. The muscle structure retains its complete, we're retaining its structure. We're retaining the native state of the mitochondria and we're measuring its oxygen consumption by driving um, very specific metabolites to each complex. This is all maximum respiration. Below we're showing you, I'm showing you mitochondrial respiration, but this is an isolated mitochondria. The difference here is we're uh, managing the energetic stress these muscles are seeing. And what we can do here is do it in a physiological range. So this is a very unique approach that we just recently adopted. Um, we can measure that. We can measure the membrane potential of the mitochondria. And then we can plot that as a function of each other and get an idea of the efficiency. So the more leftward uh, shifted you are, the more inefficient you are. So you can see right here, these are two different muscles, the mitochondria coming, and we have one that is very inefficient compared to the other. 
we can do this non-invasively as well. So again, this is FNIRS. This is data published by Daryl Neufer's lab, um, who's here at ECU as well. And basically, you can couple FNIRS with some fairly sophisticated modeling um, approaches, and you can get an idea of a respiratory capacity of each muscle. You can use NMR, which we haven't really talked about. Um, it's been done very successfully by Dave Marcinek um, and Kevin Conley at University of Washington. Um, and this is a nice approach where we can assess mitochondrial uh, function. We can also get into the structural relationships. And I'm going to actually focus on this part here because I think this is the most interesting part we haven't touched upon as much is the volume change that you see with the myofascial dysfunction. And there's a pretty good amount of data demonstrating that muscle strength is a strong predictor of myofascial pain. Um, and so in preclinical models, this is pretty straightforward for us to assess. We can assess it in longitudinally by anesthetizing the animal. And here we're stimulating the motor neuron to stimulate the muscle to contract. And then we can measure the force production. In this case, the mouse is pushing on a foot pedal. We can do it in the quadriceps muscle. We can do it in the TA muscle. I'm showing you data from both a rat and a mouse. We can also take the muscle out invasively, put it in a bath and do a field stimulation approach. And again, assess different muscles. This one's a little more limited because it only works with specific muscles. Um, this is what the data looks like quantified here. We're doing what's called a force frequency curve. So we're stimulating the muscle at different frequencies and then assessing force production. This is ischemia. So remember this is a condition that is associated with myofascial pain syndrome. And you can see the effect that a short-term bout of ischemia has on force production of the muscle. It goes down quite dramatically. And we can actually pick force drops um, up as early as an hour. Um, we can assess this in humans as well. We can see muscle strength um, and we can do this longitudinally. So we can track people. This is cross-sectional data. We can track it in both men and women. And you can see that diff there are diff subtle differences in men and women uh, when we consider it as an absolute measure. Um, if we normalize it to the amount of mass, those measures aren't as quite as distinct. But again, it does require a little more sophistication in the equipment level, but it can be done. So what contributes to changes in muscle strength and how would this affect an individual with myofascial pain? Well, obviously muscle mass is one. Um, we can measure that in multiple different ways. In a preclinical model, we can just simply take the muscle out and weigh it. We can actually measure the entire diameter of the muscle. We can measure the individual fiber size. Um, and we can plot that as a frequency distribution, get a, an idea of how many small fibers there are versus how many large fibers there are. Um, we can do this in humans as well, if it's possible to go invasive. Um, this is human data from CLI patients, and you can see the CLI patients as chronic limb ischemia. You can see that they've lost quite a bit of size in their musculature, which contributes to their weakness. We can also make non-invasive measures, which has been ta talked about um, quite a bit yesterday, so I'm not gonna spend any time on that, but that's just an MRI measure. One thing I wanna hit home to is that muscle size does not always explain muscle strength, um, meaning that we also consider something called muscle quality, which muscle quality is the amount of force divided by the size. So we're accounting for how much force per unit area, which gives us an idea of how good the muscle is. And I'm using an extreme example here. I'm showing you some Belgian cattle. This is a whippet. And then this is a mouse model, all of them which have a mutation in the myostatin gene. So you can see they're quite huge. And so the expectation is they're going to be very, very strong. And that generally is quite true, that they are stronger. Here's our mutant mouse, for example. However, if we account for this size and then measure their force, what we actually find is that they're not as producing as much force as we quite expect. So size doesn't always perfectly predict what the force output is going to be. And it doesn't necessarily perfectly predict the quality of that muscle. We can certainly have a smaller muscle that's quite strong, which we would say it's a high quality. The reason we care about that is muscle quality is highly related to mortality. And so if you look, these are divided into quintiles. Here's the upper quintile up here. That is the highest muscle quality. Here is the lower quintile. That's the lowest muscle quality. And this is just simply tracking people over time and assessing the mortality. And what you can see is individuals with a low muscle quality have a, are, have a higher mortality. And the same thing occurs in women. Um, it's a little more exacerbated in men in that both quintile two and one don't differentiate as much, but they do in women. So muscle quality is an important feature that we need to consider as well. 
Um, there's a whole lot of regulators of muscle strength. Um, I'm only giving you a few just for time's sake. What I've tried to do is document which ones we can measure invasively and non-invasively. So cross bridges, so the actin, myosin, the very ultra-structural units, that requires invasive measures. The mitochondria have shown you both non-invasive and invasive. Sarcolemma, non-invasive. Two invasive. minutes. Yep. And sarcoplasmic reticulum. I have this as an open one because we can make some inferences about it, but we can't directly measure it without being invasive. Um, and then the capillary here, here is doing both nuclei um, invasively only. And then the tendon, which we haven't really talked about, you can do non-invasively and invasively. Um, and this is just an example of doing exactly that. This is actually data taken from rotator cuff injury um, that we recently published. And we're just showing you fatty infiltrates coupled with the fibrosis. So you can see that quite clearly. But what we can do is track that non-invasively. Here, we're just using CT scan and we're tracking the accumulation of the fatty infiltrate. So it's possible to get inferences, but I think one thing that we're gonna have to really take home is not just the imaging, but coupling the imaging with functional measures that really is gonna increase our understanding of what's happening here. And we can't rely on just assessing one area. We're probably gonna have to really think beyond just you know, if we're assessing the arm, we think about the leg, that we think about the shoulder, or we think about the back, that we're thinking about all of those tissues because we can't assume that skeletal muscles are created equal. Um, and then I just need to acknowledge uh, my lab who collected quite a bit of this data in the NIH, and I will end there. Thank you, Dr. Spankenberg. I think that's an important point to realize that not all muscles are the same and that we need to take into consideration um, all fact, you know, different factors between different muscle groups. And I'm sure there'll be questions related to that in the discussion. Next, we have Dr. Rutkov, um, who will be talking about um, electrophysiological techniques. Uh, so Dr. Rutkov. Great, good morning, everyone. Uh, hopefully you can see my screen and I will just put this into presentation mode here. So thanks, uh, I just want to thank the organizers uh, for inviting me to speak today. Uh, and I slightly retitled this to newer electrophysiological techniques uh, and potential applications for myofascial pain because I don't actually study myofascial pain and I, I initially was gonna go through a litany of every technique that's ever been used, but I decided to focus on some of the newer ones instead. Uh, I, I do wanna just comment, I do have a couple conflicts here. I'm, I, I do a, some of the work on electrical impedance myography we've been commercializing. I'm not gonna be speaking about any specific products here. Um, so the electrophysiologic techniques of interest, I've kind of grayed out the ones I'm not talking about. I'm going to focus on electrical excitability studies and electrical impedance myography. Um, we heard a little bit about standard needle EMG yesterday. Um, I think um, my, I think Jordi, uh, Sarah, who's on the uh, panel, will be talking about microneurography. So, um, and in terms of this famous uh, 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 figure. Uh, I, I, I sort of, there are a number of different areas here that I thought I'd be addressing, but I'm, I'm talking mostly about nerve and muscle in this, this talk more than anything else as we go through this. Um, a little bit of connect, about connective tissue. So first, electrical, electrical excitability testing uh, is basically a, a series, is a technology that's sort of been developing over the past 20 years or so, uh, and it's essentially a series of stress tests to the peripheral nerve. Uh, what we do is focus on assessing membrane electrical stability or, and instability, you can actually measure both motor and sensory neurons. It was actually developed for motor, but it can be used for either. Also can be applied to muscle fibers, and there's been a number of papers on that. To my knowledge, there's no work to date that's been published on myofascial pain, but there's no reason one couldn't certainly apply this technique, and it might actually be very, very valuable in, in this uh, condition. Um, this work was actually uh, started in the 1960s by uh, Joseph Bergmans, uh, uh, but uh, it was kind of dropped and forgotten about until the late 90s when Hugh Vostok at University College London picked it up and started really pursuing, he's a physiologist and uh, actually has created a whole, has a lot of followers now across the world who are performing this technique. Um, it's, it's actually kind of a combination of techniques. And so it's got, I call it electrical excitability testing, but it's also called threshold tracking. It's because one, one part of it, but basically the way it works is you give a electrical stimulus, it's all surface it, in humans at any rate, you can do it in animals as well. It's all surface electrodes. You basically give uh, so you basically do something to the nerve. And in this example here, you're giving either a hyperpolarizing or a depolarizing DC pulse that's strong enough to change the membrane uh, behavior, but not strong enough to actually cause a depolarization in the neuron. 
Then on top of that, you give a test stimulus, a, a bigger stimulus, and you actually measure what happens to the, what happens to the response. And by targeting, by setting a target in the middle, and I showed, it was on the earlier slide, but I didn't actually show, mention it, you actually try to maintain a certain level, uh, a certain amplitude by slowly uh, changing the stimulus intensity. And that actually looks at the excitability of the neurons. On the right, you see the basic system that was developed to, to, to test this. Um, what you get out is a fairly complicated set of, of, of values that would take me probably two hours to explain. And frankly, I, it's very challenging. But the basic idea is each of these four plots, A, B, C, and D, represent a kind of different stress test and a different way these different procedures are performed on the nerve electrode. The, the electrode, sorry, threshold electric tonus, which is what I kind of diagrammed out in that long DC pulse, is what's diagrammed in B. And you can see they're hyperpolarizing and depolarizing stimuli. And the amount of current you need to actually create the stimulus changes depending on that. Uh, and you can look at and you can look at changes in diabetic nerves and um, in nerves affected by demyelinating or polyneuropathies. You can look at muscle fibers. People have done it in myopathy, for example. Uh, in D, I'll just point out this one. This is the standard recovery cycle, uh, which which he's sort of taken to a, a new, has sort of pushed out further, where you look at the refractory torque period, the relative refractory period, and the periods of subexcitability and superexcitability. Uh, and that can also tell you about the nerve. And as you can see at the bottom, there are some different channels that are mentioned here. And these are all, um, these are presumably what are being studied with each of these different tests. Again, has not been applied to, to a myofascial pain to my knowledge, uh, but I think potentially interesting and, and a valuable technology. And now I'm gonna switch gears entirely and talk about electrical impedance myography. So this is a technology that I've been working on for the past 20 years myself. Uh, which is a really a bioimpedance based technique. And in that case, it's, it's basically an application of a very weak high frequency electrical current, alternating current to an area of muscle and the assessment of the resulting voltages, either surface or, or in, in within the muscle itself, if you're doing it uh, uh, with needles, for example. Basically what you do is you put a very high frequency electrical current in, uh, you measure the resulting voltage and the characteristic change in the voltage relative to the applied current can tell you something about the tissue. Um, and you, this, this goes back to high school physics, but it's basically Ohm's law. And uh, the relative amplitude of the current voltage relative to the applied current tells you about the resistance of the tissue. A delay in timing or the temporal shift tells you about the capacitance of the tissue, but we generally term it reactance because it's, we're looking at the entire um, uh, circuit. Uh, and on the left, on the right here, you see there is a uh, just sort of circuit diagram showing uh, in this model where the resistors, intracellular resistance, extracellular resistance, and the capacitor within the membrane of the myofiber. fiber. Um, there's one other measure we look at, which is the phase or phase angle, which is basically just a trigonometric relationship between the reactants and the resistance. Um, so basic concepts, I, I think of electro EIM more as a concept of electromorphometry than electrophysiology. In the sense, it's like ultrasound, you're applying energy to the tissue, but electrical, not acoustic. You're looking at transmission rather than reflection. And you're not really focusing on producing an image. Um, so you're evaluating the passive electrical properties, not the active electrical properties of the tissue. Now, having said that, you actually can get at the, act, the active electrical properties too with this. And we do see changes that are very small with contraction, but I'm really not going to get into that part here. Um, you can also look at, so you're really looking at the composition of the tissue in terms of fat, connective tissue deposition, or edema. Um, myofiber size, and I'll show you a little data to support that we can be pretty good at, at predicting myofiber size ba just based on the impedance parameters. Uh, fiber disorganization, I'm not going to get into that. And muscle shape and size, including contraction stretch. Anything you do to change the size or shape of the muscle is going to ch change the impedance. This area has been barely explored uh, uh, to date, to my knowledge. And you can also look at changes in fatigue um, uh, with exercise. Um, so we've had a number of different applications uh, at, to doing this, both in animals and uh, humans, and both using surface and needle. This is sort of the, my old figure, just showing the basic idea where you have basically some adhesive electrodes. The outer electrodes apply the current. The inner electrodes measure the voltage. This is a newer system where you actually have it all within a single device, and the electrodes are, with, are basically applied to the skin and are inside the device itself. This is how we do it in mice. Uh, we have a uh, we have the same volt current and voltage electrodes in this little metal grid. We remove the fur with nair, place it on the skin, and get data. You can also use needles in mice. We also do needles in rats. This is an example of the four electrode needle array. Uh, what's harder about the animals than the humans is actually the fur, uh, and that actually causes some challenges with the contact uh, impedance issues. But, but by using these tiny needles that really just puncture the skin, 
we can actually get beautiful uh, data, for example, in a rat here. Um, we also are developing a, uh, in, a, an impedance EMG needle. So this needle will be, will uh, basically collect standard electrical myography data, concentric needle electromyography data, and measure muscle impedance values as well. So both basically looking at the active electrical properties and the passive electrical properties of the muscle at the same time. Um, this is just a basically a quick once over looking at the frequency spectral changes over time. And this is a case of an ALS rat. Um, you can see the same thing in a human, but this is the simpler picture because it's just uh, done over a shorter period of time. But basically in healthy animals, you see this nice uh, curve in the phase value here, this peak generally at about 50 to 100 kilohertz, and that generally disappears as the, as the muscle disease progresses. Um, so this is just looking at some other data we've collected in aged mice. These mice were obtained from the National Institutes of Aging. Uh, and you can see that uh, expected reduction in twitch, twitch force relative to the young mice. Uh, and you would also get a sort of concomitant reduction in, in, the, in one of the values, the reactants in, in aged animals. Uh, we also look at, uh, we also had animals go up in the last space shuttle mission in 2011, which was a lot of fun. Uh, and we studied them uh, when they came down ex vivo uh, and compared them to a bunch of ground controls. And we saw similar expected changes in phase and reactants. So this is just one couple plots showing that change. You can also see here, there's a relationship between the phase slope value that we calculated here in the muscle fiber area as well in the put, when you put the ground controls and uh, space flight animals together. Um, we can also get measures of connective tissue and fat deposition. So on the left, uh, this is looking at muscular dystrophy mice. Uh, and wild type combined, uh, and uh, hydroxyproline is a sort of surrogate assay for connective tissue deposition in, the, in that model. And you can see there's a reasonable correlation between uh, the hydroxyproline levels and, and the reactance values. On the right is some work we're doing now. We've kind of moved to sort of more advanced, um, uh, advanced uh, uh, prediction models using lasso technique. And we can actually, just using impedance frequencies alone here, can predict the amount of fat deposition within the muscle of a, a obese DBDB mouse model. Um, one of the, I think the most interesting things that, and that might be relevant here is that we get a really good, easy, quick measure of myofiber size. This is, I think, the cleanest. Oh, let's... Thank you. Cleanest example, which we did in uh, mice, uh, of immature mice. And you can see how the reactant spectrum changes as the fiber size gets bigger. And again, we can use an, a prediction model and actually just use, based on the impedance data alone, we can actually predict fiber size within about 16%. Uh, with only about 16% error, which I consider pretty good. Uh, we've now also been able to do this using a surface approach, this used needles. Uh, in humans, uh, we have similar data. This is just showing DMD data in a, in a group of ki kids with Duchenne muscular dystrophy versus healthy controls. And you can see the DMD kids sit a lot lower as compared to healthy controls, and the healthy controls show increasing values as they get bigger, likely relating in part to enlarging muscle fiber size. And this is just an example of a uh, changes in, after patients with fracture. This is after the fracture, the, when they're, if they've been non-weight bearing for a while, uh, increasing values after they've returned to full weight bearing uh, uniformly across 10 different people. Uh, last significant slide here is just showing my only data in pain patients. Uh, this is patients with chronic low back pain, a small study we did using a surface device and just looking at the lumbar paraspinal muscles. The, on the left, you can see some reduced phase values in patients. Uh, compared to healthy. What I thought was the most interesting is that we found this clear asymmetry in all the impedance parameters uh, in, the, in these back pain patients. I don't know what that represents, but uh, it's, it was clearly different than what we saw in the, in the healthy controls. So to conclude, um, I think electrophysiological approaches may offer insight into motor and sensory dysfunction in muscle and nerve. Uh, electrical excitability testing may provide novel insights into nerve and muscle function with channel specific application. And electrical impedance myography may provide information on muscle morphology and composition that can be achieved with just four surface electrodes very quickly. Um, and just as a comment, I think my, in my opinion, people are less excited about adopting electrophysiologic methods in general since there's no image. It's really hard to sometimes get wrap your head around what's going on electrophysiolo electrophysiologically. But you know, I do think there's something to be said for just getting some data and being able to compare numbers, even if you're not necessarily sure where they're being generated from. Uh, and, and seeing differences. I'll just give an example here of a healthy person and one with muscular dystrophy. It's a little more challenging perhaps to quantify the MRI data versus the electrophysiology data. So I will stop there and just thank NIH for their, their generous support over the years and thanks for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Rutkoff. Uh, seems like 
uh, there, we need to bring to bear every measure and every uh, application we can to better understand uh, the muscle. And imaging is good, but these other techniques are good to consider as well. Finally, we have Dr. Fairmans, who will be talking about uh, diffusion MRI uh, and, and different applications for in vivo imaging. Dr. Fairmans. Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm going to share my slides. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank the organizers. Uh, it's a very interesting symposium, and I already learned a lot myself. Um, also for inviting me um, to give this presentation. I hope to share some insights on how you can use MRI to probe the muscle microstructure in vivo. Um, I have following disclosure to make. Um, so this slide um, is showing the different uh, abnormalities that may be relevant for my facial pain. And I will mainly focus on how MRI can be used to look at structural changes and then in particular pertaining to the muscle. Um, so yesterday there were two talks in the uh, second session by Dr. Bruce Damon and Dr. Gary Gold who were uh, showing state-of-the-art MRI methods, um, how they can be used to potentially assess um, muscular disorders as well as myofacial pain. Um, and it was also recognized there that actually with MRI you can resolve millimeters and here I would like to go um, to a much smaller scale. I would like to um, assess the microstructure of the muscle, which is shown here. This is a histology slide of skeletal muscle. And as you can see from the scale bar, the my myofibers are tens of micron, which is well below the nominal MRI resolution. Uh, however, with diffusion MRI, you can actually probe the scale. Um, the signal is still coming from your millimeter voxel, but you measure the random motion of water molecules over milliseconds. And during this random motion, the water molecules actually probe the local tissue microstructure. And therefore, you can argue that diffusion MRI can act as an in vivo microscope. Um, so just to explain exactly how um, this works. So if you would have a, a glass of water and you would look at the diffusion, then you could see that um, particles will diffuse randomly with increasing diffusion time, it will be isotropic in all directions. And the diffusion coefficient, which is the mean square displacement over time, the diffusion coefficient will not depend on diffusion time. So how does it then look in biological tissue, for instance, in muscular tissue? Well, this is illustrated here. If you would add a membrane, uh, then at short times, the particles can still diffuse in all directions, but with increasing diffusion times, the particles will preferentially diffuse along the membrane. And as a consequence, the diffusion coefficient will now decrease with time and the diffusion will become anisotropic. And so this diffusion time dependence of the diffusion coefficient as well as the anisotropy is exactly what we uh, try to measure with diffusion MRI and that can give you information about the muscle uh, microstructure. Um, so the most common um, diffusion method is diffusion tensor imaging, where the diffusion um, is characterized by a diffusion tensor shown here, uh, visualized by an ellipsoid. Uh, using this, you can perform uh, fiber tracking of the muscle as shown here. You can also quantify those diffusivities of the tensor um, by the um, different diffusivities, the axial along the fiber, radial perpendicular the, uh, to the fiber. Um, and then the fractional anisotropy is kind of showing you the, again, the anisotropy of the muscle. Um, here, um, this is taken from a review paper showing the MD values in the tibial, tibialis anterior muscle, as well as the fractional anisotropy from different studies. Um, you can see that there is variation uh, between those studies. Part of this variation is biological, um, as also said um, uh, in the previous talk, um, there is variability um, in, in muscle, also between muscle groups. Um, but some of this is also methodological aspects. Um, it's an active field and a lot of effort is being put in um, streamlining uh, the methodology right now. So with uh, diffusion MRI and also with DTI, um, it's been shown that you are sensitive to changes in the muscle. Um, you're, change, you're sensitive to changes in the myofiber size, permeability, inflammation, edema, and so on. 
um, and it's been shown in a multitude of muscular disorders. Um, I haven't come across uh, two studies uh, that study my facial pain, um, but it could potentially also be applied. I think right now where the research is going is we want to um, not only show the sensitivity, but we also would like to understand what exactly of these underlying processes is driving the change that we observe with diffusion MRI. And this requires um, beyond DTI acquisitions, simulations, realistic simulations of the microstructure to understand what's going on and by physical modeling. And one uh, particular uh, interesting approach is to measure the diffusion coefficient and increasing diffusion time. Um, this has already been done um, in the uh, 1970s by John Tanner, who showed it in frog muscle. Um, here it's actually shown in cuff in two different types, um, tongue and heart muscle. And what you can see is that the diffusion coefficient, if you look along the fiber, there is not much time dependence, but if you look perpendicular to the fiber, you see there is time dependence and this time dependence is different uh, between uh, different types of uh, muscle, which is expected because those muscles, the myofibers have different diameters. So the time dependence is directly reflecting uh, the myofiber size. Um, this is again showing this measurement, but now done in vivo uh, in human calf muscle. And uh, um, recently we proposed a random permeable barrier model uh, to interpret this time dependence. Uh, in this model, we, um, we model the uh, myofiber, mem the sarcolemma by uh, infinitely thin flat membranes. And then you can characterize the diffusion in such a system by the diffusion, the intrinsic diffusivity when there wouldn't be any membranes and the surface to volume parameter, um, which is the second parameter, surface to volume parameter of these membranes, which would give you a direct measure for the myofiber size, as well as the permeability of the sarcolemma, um, which would depend on your aquaporin-4 density, uh, but could also be potentially be affected by ATP-driven uh, membrane transport. Um, so these measures we can actually do measure in vivo, um, but of course they have been validated. And this is shown here in a model of muscular, Duchenne muscular dystrophy, um, where the surface to volume has been measured from histology and compared to the RPBM derived values measured both in vivo and ex vivo, and you can see that particularly ex vivo, there's a good agreement. Um, this model has also been um, uh, uh, validated by the group of Sam Ward from San Diego, where um, they performed realistic simulations in different types of muscle geometries, and they showed that the surface to volume, as you predicted with RPBM, um, is actually in very good agreement with what you actually get from histology. Um, so the S over V is not uh, what is typically uh, measured in uh, clinic or, or considered a clinical measure, but it is kind of a proxy for the fiber size. Um, and this is shown here. Um, initially, it was proposed with a prefactor of four and um, it's shown now that this is a better prefactor, but you can see that there's a good agreement again between the RPBM predicted fiber size, which you can measure in vivo with MRI and the actual fiber size. Um, so you could then think about applying this method in, the, in a clinical study. This is shown here. Uh, this was a study where we um, measured volunteers that had their leg in a cast and were immobilized and therefore had atrophy. And once their cast was removed, they were scanned at week zero and then followed up longitudinally and compared to the uh, other leg, which served as a control. And what you can uh, see here, I hope, is that if you look at week zero, um, the fiber size A is actually decreased, myofiber size. And this could be detected with diffusion MRI, despite the fact that if you look at the T2 way, that you can see that there is a lot of edema um, in the immobilized leg. Um, you could also see that there is an, um, this is shown here also in the bar plot, the uh, fiber size does go up with time and uh, nearly matches the control leg after time. You can also see that the permeability actually does decrease slightly with time, which potentially could be related to the presence of edema here. Another example uh, where this could be applied um, is in patients, uh, both controls as well as patients with 
chronic exertional compartment syndrome. In this case, uh, the, the measurement was done before and after exercise. Uh, you can see that uh, pa the patient with compartment syndrome, they actually have fluid buildup, which you can see very well on T2 weighted MRI, but you can also see that actually on an elevated diffusivity. Uh, when we do um, the RPBM measurement, we actually notice that in the volunteers after the exercise, the individual myofibers, they dilate and their diameter increases, whereas in the compartment syndromes, uh, syndrome patients, this increase does not happen, which was an interesting observation. Um, one caveat is that the uh, space in between the myofibers, the extracellular space was not uh, taken into account, which is something uh, that should be further adjusted. Thank you. For the last two minutes, uh, I just briefly want to touch upon the fact that diffusion, while it's uh, sensing the microstructure, could also potentially be used to look at microcirculation and microperfusion. Um, this is shown here. So typically, we measure at the random motion in the cellular structure, but also there is coherent motion in the um, vasculature, but because of the random orientation of the vasculature, it looks like incoherent motion. And this is what we call intravoxel incoherent motion. Uh, basically, you can measure both the tissue diffusion as well as the pseudo diffusion from which you can derive a perfusion fraction that will give you information about a perfusion of the muscle. Um, it's a growing field. Um, and this slide here is showing different perfusion fractions for different types of muscle. You can see that there's a lot of variation. And um, here, this slide is uh, showing you that you can, again, do diffusion MRI before and after. You can both look at DTI as well as IVIM, and you can see that the changes in the diffusivities, which are pointing to structural changes, are uh, fairly low on the order of 3 to 10 percent. But then the changes in the microperfusion measures with IVIM are a, a, a much bigger factor. So that brings me to my summary. Um, muscle diffusion MRI provides a range of biomarkers that are sensitive to microstructure and microcirculation. And um, I believe that they could be used to study muscle pathology and uh, my myofascial pain syndrome. Um, these tools that I showed can be used both for static imaging, but you can also use them pre and post exercise. Uh, DTI in particular um, has been proposed as a quantitative biomarker. Uh, if you supplement this with um, more advanced diffusion protocols and modeling, you can aim to achieve more cellular specificity. As I showed with the RPBM, you can actually measure my, the surface to volume of the sarcolemma, as well as membrane permeability. And finally, IVIM uh, could give you measures on microcirculation. I think I'm out of time. I had some future directions, um, but I would like uh, to uh, end with acknowledging people from my lab, as well as Eric Sigmund, who um, has been uh, working in our, at our institute on muscle diffusion and uh, helped me make this presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Fiermans. And I, I'm sure we're all eager to hear about your future directions. Maybe we can address those during the discussion section that's coming up. We are five minutes ahead of schedule, so I want to thank everyone for being very concise with time. Um, I'm going to take an, an extra moment just to thank the, uh, some, the, the workshop organizers, uh, particularly our colleagues at NCCIH, um, Dr. Chen, uh, Director Langevin, and uh, uh, Dr. Sabri, especially for keeping us all on track and keeping us organized. Um, I also want to thank my co-chair, Dr. Washaba, who I'll be handing over uh, to in one second. Um, he was very instrumental in helping put this panel together. And finally, I want to thank all of the presenters who shared very interesting data. Uh, it's obvious that we have uh, lots of tools in our armamentarium to study the peripheral uh, musculature and peripheral processes involved with myofascial pain syndrome. And hopefully this event can help us sort of uh, arrive at a common set of uh, initiatives and, and strategies to better understand myofascial pain syndrome. Uh, keeping in mind also that, you know, this is one aspect of the syndrome, but that there are central processes and uh, other techniques that we're also working on in other areas of chronic pain research uh, that should also be considered as we better understand this syndrome. With that, I will hand over things to Chuck Washabaugh. Chuck, take it away. Thanks, Alex. Can you hear me? Yes. All right, good, because I was having a little bit of problem with hearing and I didn't test to see if anybody could hear me. So I was I'm glad to hear that works. All right, so those were four really great talks. And 
What I'd like to do now is we're gonna move into the panelists' uh, comments and we're gonna start with uh, Vanya Apkarin from Northwestern University. So Vanya, are you um, able to, do you have slides to share or are you unmuted? Let's see. I am unmuted. I just Perfect. unmuted myself. I do not have any slides to share. Perfect. Uh, I, will just, I will just make some general comments. Uh, I, I very much have enjoyed the, this symposium overall. It has been very revealing to me. I, uh, uh, it's amazing the, the spread of technologies that are available to us. And it's in fact, in some ways shameful how little of these things we have used in the field of pain research. And that, yeah, I, I even take the blame myself in a sense on, on the subject. Uh, but so uh, I have some very simple questions. Uh, how, how one would, for example, I, our research for the last 20 years has concentrated on back pain and, and and in fact, ignoring all of these peripheral processes and only concentrating on the brain. Uh, but I'm open-minded and I would be more than happy to explore some of these tissue pro properties. Uh, but, and you know, the, the technologies that we saw are wonderful, but again, how specific would they, how specifically would they apply? For example, in a patient with back pain, can I look at, um, the physiological measurements that were first posed by simply looking at stimulus response curves, for example, across muscles in the back. Would that, would that be one uh, a simple approach that one can use? Similarly, we use DTI in the brain. And in fact, we love DTI because it's one of our primary markers of predicting who in the future will develop chronic pain. So in a sense, brain myelin properties for us are fundamental uh, uh, predictors. But uh, can I apply that to the back structure, fascia, connective tissue and all of that and learn something specific? I'll stop there and, I, and expect some answers to my questions. <laughs> I think you're raising some very interesting questions there, Vanya. So thank you very much. So next up, we have Dr. Mark Doze from Vanderbilt. Mark, are you able to unmute and share? Yeah, I, uh, I have sure. a uh, slide I will share. Perfect. Um, it's not necessarily all that informative, but um, I, uh, it's just as a way of introducing my own kind of research work. You know, I've uh, not done any work in uh, pain and uh, very little in muscle in general, but, um, you know, throughout my uh, career, I've worked on this kind of problem of characterizing tissue at the subvoxel level, like you just heard about from Dr. Fearman's uh, with MRI. And, and you know, I, I think of it process as being described by this little chart here where you're kind of always going around in circles a little bit, but uh, you know, it's a combination of modeling the tissue, but then also figuring out how uh, methodologically to probe that uh, model, and then how figuring, you know, figuring out how computationally to invert that model. And I've got some questions for both uh, Dr. Fearman and Dr. Um, Rutkov about those kinds of problems. And then of course, the tricky part is always how we validate to know what we're, we're um, we're really seeing, and, and again, I'm going to have some questions about that. So, I um, I'll leave it there, but I'm going to come back and specifically um, ask questions to both the MRI and the um, electromyography about how we can uh, how we can really uh, complete the loop here. Wonderful, thank you very much. Okay, uh, next up we have Dr. Jordi Serra from King's College London. Hi, do you hear me? Yes, we can, okay. thank you. Thank you, so I'm going to share the screen. Let's see how it works. Uh, this is going to be this one. So I'm going to talk, uh, I'm Jordi Serra, I'm a neurologist at King's College. Um, we have been working over the last years in with this technique called microneurography, uh, which basically, as you all know, over the years, we have had, from a neurophysiological point of view, 
like a big uh, difficulty in recording from the small fiber afferents in the peripheral nerves. <clears throat> Micronography has been out there for decades now, but it had never been translated into a kind of clinical setting. This is what we have been doing here in the last, uh, during the last five years at, at King's College. So we are now routinely assessing patients uh, with all sorts of pains, ongoing pains. Uh, we see lots of patients with small fiber neuropathies, uh, but we are also seeing uh, lots of patients that uh, are complaining of chronic myofascial uh, type of pain. Uh, we are able to record from C fibers from the periphery, and you can see on the right of the panel <coughs> that these shark fins correspond to the nociceptors. And in these patients with peripheral neuropathy or with an engagement of the peripheral nervous system, what happens is that these fibers discharge spontaneously. And we strongly believe that this spontaneous discharge is the cause or the pathogenic cause of the pain in these patients. Uh, we recorded uh, some years ago now uh, from fibromyalgia patients. And we also had this uh, big surprise that several of these patients, I would say a great majority of them, also displayed uh, many abnormalities in the peripheral nervous system. And I will leave it here, uh, just summarizing, saying that there is this technique that can record directly the activity of the peripheral nervous system. And that's a, it's a, it's a direct uh, questioning of the system. And we can understand what's going on in many of these patients. Thank you. Great, thank you, Dr. Sarah. Uh, let's see. Next up, we have Sam Ward from UCSD. Sam, are you there? And I'm here. Can you hear me? Screen. There he is. Can you see my screen okay? Yes, we can. Just make it into your... There you go. Okay. So uh, much like Mark, uh, we're very interested in the complex signals that come from imaging tools like MRI to understand tissue. Uh, my lab is interested in muscle design and plasticity, and we focus on chronic diseases in the shoulder and spine. Um, we use animal and human tissue, sorry, we use animal and human tissues to, um, to study this biology and physiology, and in our hands, the biology is pretty complicated. So uh, we have found that when we look at imaging signals, sometimes these, these biological changes produce competing demands on imaging signals that are difficult to interpret. So our solution has been to use these tissue samples to generate both in silico and in vitro models of muscle disease that allow us to perturb one or more variables biologically and see how they impact uh, imaging signals so that we have a better understanding of these really nice fancy uh, clinical images that we get in the shoulder and spine. These are diffusion images. Um, the signals that we get here are, are difficult to reconcile directly with biology. So we've created this system of both simulating the tissue in silico and in vitro um, as we try to understand these clinical images. I would say net net, we're very in favor of just going in and grabbing a piece of tissue uh, until the, the imaging signals can be completely understood as a function of time. So I'll stop there and I have lots of questions for the speakers as well. Great, thanks, Sam. Okay, so um, now that we've had our introductions of our panelists, I think that now what I'd like to do is tell everybody not to turn off their share, uh, their screen sharing, and then we are going to move into the panel discussion. Now, remember, in the panel discussion, what we're going to do is we've already heard there there are many questions that uh, many of the panelists have already asked, I uh, and and said that they have to ask. So what we wanna do is there's a, on the right for the panelists, that you can raise your hand, your blue hand. And when you do that, then either I or, or um, Alex will chair, will ask you to um, ask your question. And you can direct that directly towards someone, or if it's a general question, then we will decide, we'll, we'll flip a coin and see who gets it. So uh, we'll, we'll figure that out as we go. So, all right, Sam, do you wanna turn off your share screen? If you would, I think you're still there or, or no, he's off, okay. No, oh, no, he's off, yep. All right, great, great. All right, so the, we have one person already with their hand up and it looks like Dr. Sluka. Dr. S Kathleen, would you like to ask a question? Uh, Find the unmute button. There um, you go. Thanks, Chuck. Um, yeah, I wanted to talk, a little bit about, I'm glad to see all the muscle um, 
part of this today because I think it's really an important component of myofascial pain. Um, but I wanted to see if the panelists could talk about uh, some of the things that I've been thinking about and I don't have any answers to, but uh, we know that things like uh, muscle contraction can result in release of substances like lactate or decreases in pH into the extracellular matrix. Those things can activate receptors that can then turn on pain pain or other functions like activating fibroblasts or macrophages. So how do we get at imaging that in humans and how do we translate that back into animals? And the second question, um, and I'm not sure who this is also directed to probably most of the speakers, but what about the role of fiber types? We haven't talked about that. We talk about muscle as a homogeneous entity and we already heard that it was not. Um, I think by Dr. Spangenberg, but uh, what about the role of fiber types? Would some fiber types be more susceptible than others? So muscles with various different fiber types and would they release different substances that might have a different response? Great, thanks, Kathy. And actually your second question was my first question that I had after listening to the talks about how, how fiber type um, mm. and what role, if any, it does play with, with, with uh, the generation of um, uh, myofascial pain. So. Um, let's see. So based on those questions, you've all heard them and we can always have Kathleen re-ask them. Um, I'm thinking that this might be someone like maybe Espen to answer. Espen, uh, do you want to take a shot at this? Um, I'll do some of that. Um, I, I thought you might. <laughs> the, the fiber type part, I mean, that was sort of where I was getting at um, on that first slide that I showed um, is that the, the heterogeneity, I mean, some muscles have a significant amount of heterogeneity with fiber type and some are a little more homogeneous, just depending on what muscle we're talking about. You know, I, I was, I'm new to my myofascial pain um, as a field. So when I looked um, in most of the slides shown, there's not, there wasn't an obvious candidate where it stood out to me like, well, we would see muscles there that we would expect this kind of fiber type or that fiber type. I mean, most of what I saw was mixed. So I'm not sure that the fiber type has anything to do with risk or not. But what I would suggest is that it would be, it's gonna be really tricky if you have a fiber type that's more likely to show pain than another fiber type. And then for us to be able to pick that up, it's gonna be really challenging um, if we can't get invasive, um, if we're trying to stay non-invasive. So I think that's gonna pose a significant hurdle to get over if that is in fact the case. Um, with respect to the other part that you brought up about release of substances, obviously muscle over the last 10 to 15 years, we've become very aware that it releases all kinds of things um, from various um, anti-inflammatory um, cytokines to, uh, you mentioned lactate, um, to other metabolites like just succinate, for example, which has recently mm -hmm. become um, a more high profile. So understanding whether or not that interacts with the fascia, I think it's gonna be important. Can we get at it in animal models? Absolutely, because we can do genetic mutations and get at it and really pick it apart. How we translate that to humans will be, again, a bigger challenge um, that I think maybe Sam or some of the other guys can address. Yeah, I can, I can answer also, Chuck, if that's okay with you. Sure. Kathleen, that, that fiber type question is persistent in, in the literature. The, the trick is particularly dealing with animal and human data. You know, the, the animal division of fiber types in a muscle is much stronger than in humans, right? If you guessed 50, 50 or 60, 40 in a given human muscle, you'd be, you'd be close because they're, they're mixed like Espen's saying. That being said, there is some large animal data suggesting that uh, degeneration, which this is not my field, so I don't, I don't really understand or I haven't surrounded the literature related to actual cell degeneration, which is something that we measure in animals and in humans in our disease processes. Um, there is a bias towards susceptibility in, in type one versus type two fibers. It's not, it's not perfect, but the discussion is certainly in the literature. So if that resonates in some way with this condition, it might be something to explore, but you got to go get the tissue. And, and if I may add one other comment, uh, it's, it's a great, the fiber type question is a great one. I do know from my work with NASA that, you know, many astronauts do develop chronic back pain while in space, especially after long duration space flight. 
Uh, and you know, there is a clear change from type one to type two fiber predominance that occurs in space over time. So one wonders if that could be somehow playing a role. Hmm. Yeah, it's an interesting right. point because fiber type switching does happen. So we know that. Um, any other comments on this on these questions? Yeah, I guess I have a, a related question in the sense that these different muscle types and their again reflexive responses in the presence of pain, I would assume, would change their excitability as well. How much do we know along those lines up as to when it just in a simple acute presence of an acute painful stimulus? How do these these systems adapt with different? types of fibers or muscle types themselves. I mean, in a sense, that kind of uh, interaction would be present for all pain conditions in general. And uh, it's a search of a, of a causal relationship between pain and muscle excitability or muscle properties overall. How, how do we tease these things apart from each other? Can we? Well, I, I guess I can try answering that partially, maybe. Um, uh, you know, I think, I think what we do know is that uh, long-term, like for example, long-term immobilization of muscle will ca cause instability of the muscle membrane. And so you do get electrical excitability uh, to some extent of the myofiber, uh, but you know, how that relates to neuronal changes, I don't know, um, or like small fiber changes, and that, that could also be related to pain, I don't really know. But the muscle itself probably be, does become to some extent hyperexcitable and may be predisposed to some um, activity in some fashion. All right, great, thank you. Uh, let's see, we'll move to another question. Leelam, do you wanna ask your question? Um, you, you said in the chat you've asked a lot of questions already, but that's okay. <laughs> Um, yeah, so I, I wrote it out, but and, and maybe it might be a silly question, but in, uh, I'm going to butcher your name. So uh, is it Rut Dr. Rutkov? Is that how you pronounce it? Spectacular. You didn't okay. <laughs> Perfect. Um, people butcher my name, so I, I like to be respectful. Anyway, so in your, in your presentation, uh, I believe I saw the EIM data with uh, the young uh, with the children, there's greater vari variability as they enter puberty uh, for the healthy population, but for the uh, uh, the MD population, it seems the data is more consistent. It's a lot more tightly packed, so to speak. So when we know that as children enter puberty, if they're healthy, there's uh, much more noticeable development in their uh, connective tissue. And also there's greater vari variability in that as well. So is it possible that some of the variability that we see in your data is as a consequence of the fascial portion and your, your, your uh, measurements are focused on the myo portion? Yeah, no, that's a great question. The, the, you know, if for the surface measurements that we do, for example, in children, it really is a combination of factors. I mean, it, you are enhanced by the muscle, but virtually anything in there will contribute to the overall impedance of the tissue. When you're sticking a needle in it, you know what you're looking at for sure. Um, but in this, but even in that situation, you've got muscle, you've got connective tissue, you may have fat deposition as the major, major components, even in a healthy person if they're heavier. So all of that may contribute. Uh, so to answer your question, sure, it's possible, but for, it could be also fat, fat deposition uh, as well to some extent. Mm -hmm. Muscle size for surface measurement may also contribute to some extent. Okay, yeah, I was just, um... Okay, that, that answered that question. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Um, so we have another question from Mark. Mark, do you want to raise your question? Yes. Um, I, um, this is, I guess, oops, sorry, I lowered my hand. Uh, this is a question that applies to both uh, Dr. Rutkova and Dr. Fearman's. Um, so both of your techniques are similar in a way in the sense that they're uh, a model-based uh, Maybe you're inverting, maybe you're not. Maybe you're just trying to do a empirical characterization, but you're interpreting your results based on some model of either uh, the electrical transmission or the diffusion of water. And I'm wondering just how you, uh, what your feeling is on how sensitive these models are to, you know, um, different confounds such as we've heard uh, fat infiltration. 
And you know, this might affect both the signal inversion as well as the signal acquisition. I certainly know in the case of MRI, that's going to be a, an issue. Um, so I'd just be interested to hear both of your perspectives on the, the inversion problem of uh, you know, dealing with all kinds of different compounds such as that. I'll, I'll go first. I mean, for my technology, you're absolutely right. I think it's always easy to live in a nice world where you model something in a you know perfect disuse model or an immature model to sort of get at a very basic question. Uh, there's no question. You know, you can build your, make your models more complex to try to incorporate different types of uh, of pathologies, but it will get limited to some extent. So yeah, I mean, in terms of from my perspective, as far as the impedance stuff goes, you've got to. If you have got a clean pathology, your interpretation is going to be a lot easier than if you've got multiple confounds, without a doubt. Els, do you have any comments on this? Um, yes, uh, I think uh, Mark raises a very good point. Uh, validation is uh, critical when you come up with a model and um, <clears throat> you need to understand if it's really um, the model is really applicable and valid. And in terms of confounding factors, um, I think the diffusion MRI measurement itself um, has, uh, for instance, FET is indeed a confounding factor and um, there's several ways you can suppress the FET and um, like we use pair FET suppression to kind of minimize the role of FET, but still then you may have an effect of uh, um, uh, fatty infiltration. But I, I, I guess what we, uh, need to do is we need to do more validation. I think I showed it. Um, there's also the group of Sam Ward uh, doing these really sophisticated um, um, uh, realistic geometries, both um, based on numerical simulations as well as based on actual phantoms to kind of validate the methods, as well as I think it, it is an in vivo non-invasive measurement, um, but you can do histology studies in animal models, as well as like, for instance, you can look at known um, um, changes, for instance, when you have atrophy due to immobilization to understand, do we indeed see the change that we are expected to? And of course you can do cross-validation, especially for IVIM, you can compare to other MRI methods like ASL, DCE MRI. So um, yeah, there's lots of validation that should go hand in hand with the modeling. Can I, can I jump in uh, on this discussion else? I, I was actually, I mean, I'm very curious as to how far we are from the day when, you know, when I do a brain scan, I can move the, the scanner, if, you know, half a meter down and look at the back, uh, use a, another five minutes of DTI and, just look at correlations between muscle structure and, and, and properties versus the brain properties. And when, when do we get there in a way? Well, or are we there already? I, I don't know. Well, I think it's an interesting uh, suggestion and I think this could be, this could be, this could be dumb. Um, I mean, well, we maybe I, I should give you a call then. Done something, but I think especially in the brain, uh, most of the development has happened in the brain, especially for modeling, and uh, some of these techniques also can now be adopted, especially in the pre-processing, like removal of noise, uh, outliers, like in muscle you have uh, involuntarily uh, contractions that give you signal voids, which the techniques that have been developed in the brain can be applied now to the muscle. So. Um, I think muscle diffusion is a promising field, but also ready for clinical, uh, I mean, not maybe clinical adoption, but for research, clinical research. For research yes, to, to link actually the, the muscle properties with, with brain properties in a sense directly. That would be actually, a, I think uh, NIH would give us some money on that too, you know, so. <laughs> uh, so I have a similar question, if I may. Uh, regarding the PET studies, uh, I mean, the PET data is beautiful, this whole body PET data, but again, how practical is it? How available is the technology for us to use? Yeah, that's, a, that's a really good question. So uh, the uh, first systems actually went online uh, just about a year and a half ago. Uh, for a while, if you can imagine, actually building these long uh, PET uh, axial field of view PET scanners was was a really expensive endeavor. And essentially there was really zero commercial interest in actually making this technology available. 
So that has happened within the last few years. And the two projects that I showed actually are, are leading the charge. Now the uh, uh, manufacturer of one of those systems, uh, United Imaging for the, for the Pet Explorer UC Davis actually has about 20 systems already that are being used clinically uh, in China, and they have a kind of long-term plan for marketing those systems in the U.S. So the, I mean, I so I don't know whether actually you know your um, your standard uh, um, kind of medical hospital is going to have one, but I think they'll be available as core facilities per se in a number of places that are could still likely to be accessible at this stage. Um, I, I guess that's kind of my my perspective. But uh, it's always with imaging, we always have this issue of you have to show the uh, you know, the effectiveness of the modality first before it turns into widespread adoption. Uh, you know, previously, as I mentioned, uh, commercial entities were limited to what what I showed actually very low field of view. But recently, there's been you know you know mid level. So you know the scanners now have become from 20 centimeters to one meter long. And so slowly and steadily, I think it's happening that uh, the systems will will become longer and longer, and therefore these technologies will become more and more available. So it might not become the whole body scanner, but it still will become kind of half a body scanner first, basically. And then you'll be able to look at maybe the brain and the hand up, up to the uh, to major parts of the torso first. Uh, but I think these technologies are coming and we just have to see how they play out. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we had a... Um, Alex, do you want to read Dr. Bosbaum's question? Because I can't find it in the chat. Um, Alan, oh, are, are you are you here? Alan can ask it if he if he's on the call. Alan actually is. Um, I see only video for him, so I will go ahead okay. and I will um, ask the question. So Thanks, Dr. Catherine. Bosbaum asks: Is there any information on the extent to which effective oh, peripheral peripherally active analgesics? alter the imaged parameters. And he says as a follow-up, of course, I am specifically referring to NSAIDs or steroids. That's the question from Dr. Basbaum. Take right. it away, Chuck, who should take that? Who would like to take this? We could either, uh, let's see. I, I mean, I think this could actually affect almost everybody everybody's imaging uh, or everybody that presented what they what they've already said that I think there could be possibly an, an, an effect so um, we could start with Abjit do you, you want to say yeah. if this, uh, modifies anything in your methodology yeah so uh, so I, I think there has been data in that looking at the brain of course and looking at opioid analgesics and and changes uh, in the brain in glucose metabolism or kind of cerebral glucose metabolism actually associated with uh, with analgesics. I'm not aware of peripheral data uh, or on the peripheral system uh, from it. All right, what about um, uh, Seward? Any, any, anything from your side? Well, uh, I mean, I mean, corticosteroids, I mean, just obviously makes me think of steroid myopathy kind of things, but in terms of actually neuronal issues, which I think you're getting at, I don't know the data. I mean, the, you know, the excitability testing in as much as the drugs impact neuronal excitability, it could impact uh, impact uh, uh, the measures. So, but I, I don't know offhand. Okay, Els, um, I'm going to call on everybody. So, <laughs> um, what no. do you? The, I I I also don't know really uh, offhand how this would be um, affected on diffusion imaging. Um, actually, um, maybe it, it would give you, well, as I said before, diffusion is sensitive to changes, so it could give you a change, but I'm not aware of, of work that has looked into this, n n not peripherally, but uh, I, I was actually checking uh, for brain, but I'm, I'm not sure. Okay, thank you. Uh, who's left? Espen, anything to add? Um, so... I'd add a couple of things or I'd think about it maybe differently than um, I think it would depend on the, the mechanisms of action of the NSAID. They don't all act the same. And then I think it depends on where, you know, so if we're talking about ibuprofen versus something else, you know, where is that is the mechanism of action for that particular NSAID apparent in the musculature or the myofascia? Is that is that mechanism actually expressed there? And I think that would dictate whether or not it would affect what your actual measurement is. 
Um, then the other thing I would, you know, consider with the NSAIDs is, and I think this came up yesterday during the discussion, um, is that we know that the NSAIDs can actually affect, in some cases, negatively affect your ability to re for the muscle to recover from an acute insult. Um, so it, it's definitely uh, something that, you know, we need to consider. And I, I think it's probably is going to be NSAID to NSAID to NSAID is going to dictate whether or not it affects our outcome measures based on what, um, you know, where, where, it, where it acts or how it acts, or assuming we know how it acts, that might be the other issue as well. Jeff, this is Sam. I'm not sure if you're going to call on the panelists or not. Yes, you can. I, I, I planned on it. Good. Uh, is it okay if I go first then? Yeah, go ahead. Just to reinforce uh, Espen's perspective, the, they do have an impact on recovery. Um, it's a little bit tricky, you know, that the, the biologic and physiologic direct measurements on animal tissue are, are more concrete and they bypass pain. In humans, it's more complicated. So recovery, whatever that means, if it's performance recovery, then you probably need to weigh not only the impact on the physiology of the muscle, but the impact on pain in the system. So that's a little bit tricky. If you're talking about the biology of the muscle itself, I agree there's a negative impact on it. As it relates to performance, I think the jury is sort of out because there's this pain physiology competing demands issue and how they impact imaging. I've never seen anything in muscle. Thanks, Sam. Okay, so uh, Dr. Majumdar, Sharmila, are you there? Can you unmute and ask your- Yes, I can. Yes, I can. Um, I'm dating myself a little bit, but I never didn't hear very much about the role for phosphorus spectroscopy, which used to be in my, when I was young, was the big thing for looking at muscle fiber types, conversion, and changes from one fiber type to another has been connected with pain. So I'm just wondering whether people see a role for uh, that. In this conversation, it just hasn't come up for today. And I'm just wondering what people think about that. Espen, what do you think? Um, yeah, I, I mean, yes, it, it's still heavily used. I think it's very dependent upon the group you're talking about. And I just think the, the sample selection here just doesn't include someone that really actively uses it. Um, but if we had, for example, someone from University of Washington here. Well, I was just saying, yeah. Yeah, they, they would be you know, banging their fists saying, yeah, absolutely, we should be using this. Yeah. So I think, I just think it's just a representative of the selection of individuals here. But so, but I think I pointed to David Marcinick, if he was here, he certainly would be yeah. absolutely championing that approach um, as something that could be utilized in these patients. And it could ab absolutely elucidate um, some, you know, some unique insights. Any other comments on this? By any other panel members? Uh, can I just uh, raise another question uh, sure. to Alan ba ba Basbaum's question? Uh, so, do you think? Don't you think that if steroids or anti-inflammatories NSAIDs actually cause a reduction in inflammation, that we wouldn't see it in muscle T2? At least my gut feeling tells me that the impact of NSAIDs or steroids will be seen in the imaging but it'll be seen as a result of the effect it produces by way of reduction in inflammation, thus reduction in T2 or some of the other measurements that you would be getting. Uh, so what do people think about that concept? Yeah, I, I agree. That was gonna be my comment um, that you know the, the effect would be indirect as far as MRI goes, but if you are reducing inflammation, that's going to change your signal in a number of ways. Yeah, also agree. But um, it might be too small to reliably measure. I'll add that. Yeah. Um, well, on the PET side, of course, there has been literature on looking at uh, the reduction uh, or changes in FDG signal, uh, in especially in the context of, let's say, rheumatoid arthritis or some such an influence of NSAIDs. So again, it's an indirect measure, I guess, of glucose metabolism. Uh, on the other hand, there has been uh, work in COX, which is essentially a target for NSAIDs, and uh, directly kind of radio labeling COX-2 and uh, looking at the changes. And again, in the 
in the context of swelling and so on so forth that again is another uh, place where uh, there has been some literature looking at more targeted processes in the context and, and I could add, I mean, just generalizing it beyond myofascial pain, uh, if you're looking at conditions like myositis, autoimmune myositis, we know that uh, MRI, for example, or in, we've seen also with impedance measures that uh, you'll see uh, you'll see increased water in the muscle that will obviously improve yeah. the therapy. Yeah. So that would be the most dramatic yeah. example. Yeah. Great, thank you. Um, Dr. Langevin, you have your hand up. You've had it up for a while, so sorry. What is your question? Uh, yeah, first I'd like to uh, offer um, just a comment uh, about the, the discussion about the uh, NSAIDs and, and, and inflammation. So one, one component of inflammation uh, is also part of what turns off inflammation, right? That's been really nicely shown that the work of Charlie uh, Surhan at Brigham and Women's Hospital, showing that there are components of the inflammatory response that actually uh, help resolve it. Um, and some of these compounds are also derived from uh, omega-3 fatty acids like DEPA and DHA. And they they are um, they are also can be suppressed by anti-inflammatory agents. So that's again the jury's still out about what what exactly do NSAIDs do? Do they they suppress inflammation, but do they also prevent the natural recovery of it? Um, and then the other question I had, the question I had was in follow-up Dr. Sluka's comment about pH. Um, we haven't really talked about that too much. How can we measure pH? <laughs> it seems like it shouldn't be that hard. Could we get like a sort of a uh, detailed uh, three-dimensional mapping of tissue pH? <laughs> yes, use my MR spectroscopy for muscle. Spectroscopic imaging would give you a measure of tissue pH. And how, how precise would that be? Would that be able to resolve uh, differences in pH at the level of say, you know, like small parts like myofascial trigger points or something? Could you, could that be? That I do not know what the resolution would be. Phosphorus spectroscopy, the resolution isn't that high and it isn't that great compared to proton spectroscopy. Uh, proton spectroscopy can also be used to measure pH uh, to the best of my knowledge using lactate and the lactate peak, et cetera. Um, I'm, I haven't kept up with what spectroscopy is doing in muscle, but as I said, I'm dating myself when I started my career, it was quite the in thing. And with all the advances in technology, I don't know, maybe Mark knows, Bruce Damon has left, I think. But if Bruce Damon were here, he might be able to fill in more. But Bruce has his hand up and yeah, 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 go ahead, Bruce. <laughs> Bruce, please. Yeah, so, so I have a couple thoughts on, uh, first on phosphorus spectroscopy. Um, so, um, you know, it's, well, I guess a question about how big is a trigger point? <laughs> Well, let's say, okay, let's let's shoot something uh, we don't know. Like, uh, you know, when you palpate a lesion, it, it feels like it's quite large, but uh, like I would say maybe a, a centimeter or two. Okay. Um, but uh, it could be that there's a focal lesion. Say, imagine that there was a, uh, a smaller area that would be the focus of this, say, for example, around a muscle spindle or something like that, that could be of the order of millimeters. Okay. So if it's if it's on the order of centimeters, I think that is something that you could, uh, you know, realistically expect to characterize using uh, spectroscopic imaging, and you know, especially at at a, at a uh, ultra high field like seven Tesla, um, and you would certainly be able to look at uh, a variation in pH compared to surrounding tissues, and you might be able to look at something like the, you know, the Fossil creatine to inorganic phosphate ratio. Um, the interpretation of that is a little nonspecific, uh, but uh, you might find it very valuable as a predictive biomarker. Um, the way another way that phosphorus spectroscopy is used uh, is to look at uh, the oxidative metabolic rate. Um, the, there, there's a lot of uh, both theoretical and experimental support for looking at the post-contraction rate of phosphocreatine resynthesis as an indicator of the oxidative metabolic rate. 
uh, that does mean that you need to find a way to, uh, you know, provoke an, an, an exercise challenge uh, uh, to be able to do that. Uh, historically, uh, people have looked at, uh, have done what's referred to as a saturation transfer experiment to look at um, and um, for a long time interpreted that as a measure of the oxidative metabolic rate, uh, say at rest. Um, I think what we've learned in the last 10 years is that um, uh, that's probably an oversimplification. And so the interpretation of a saturation transfer experiment is, is a lot less clear uh, than we thought it was. Um, and then just to echo um, uh, the comments on uh, proton spectroscopy, there, there is a pH sensitive peak in the, in the proton spectrum. Um, so the, uh, the one that I'm most familiar with is the carnosine peak. Uh, that's a dipeptide that acts as a pH buffer in, in muscle. And uh, it has a, um, it has a peak position that, that is very sensitive to pH. Um, it doesn't, uh, all MR is very signal limited. Uh, that is very true of phosphorus spectroscopy. It's, uh, but proton spectroscopy is gonna be the most sensitive method that we have in that regard. Can I ask a quick follow-up? Mm -hmm. Please. Can you, can you differentiate between the changes that are occurring intracellularly at the muscle level, which is what I thought mostly we were measuring versus those that might be occurring in the extracellular matrix. Uh, so in the case of phosphorus, well, both phosphorus and, and carnosine, um, almost all of those metabolites are intracellular. Um, mm -hmm. And so what they're really gonna tell you about is the intracellular pH. Right. Um. Just to add to that, if we were using animal models, then absolutely we could address that. We have a lot of fluorescent. Well, we've done that. <laughs> yeah, a lot of fluorescent indicators, but yeah, I mean that that would be a lot more straightforward because you could image it using intervital imaging, and you could directly see what's happening and quantify it. Right. So it sounds like a measurement of extracellular pH is still a gap. Um, well, I think. Uh, oh, go ahead, please. I, I was just going to say, uh, measurement of extracellular. Malu, beyond pH, there be lactate, ATP, things like that that are regularly released to, to contracting muscle. I think it is a gap. I mean, we can do invasive microdialysis, but being able to image that is is definitely a gap. Would I think, Bruce, go ahead. Sorry to interrupt there, you. Uh, uh, there is a, a pH sensitive contrast agent uh, that has been used in cancer imaging. Uh, the person I'm most familiar with who's, who's done that is a guy named Bob Gillies. I think there might be some, um, some semi-validated CEST methods with MRI as well mm -hmm. as para-CEST methods. So using a contrast agent with CEST. Um, I should know these things off the top of my head, but I'm not like quick on it. I was also going to say that in the context of, again, talking about cancer, there have been uh, specific PET radio traces, carbon-11 bicarbonate comes to mind, actually, that are sensitive. But So my question to Dr. Langevin is, what is the magnitude of difference that you're looking at uh, in terms of kind of, you know, uh, healthy tissue versus uh, trigger point, let's say, what's what's the magnitude mm -hmm. of pH difference? That's a good question. Maybe, is Dr. Jay Shaw around, uh, on the panel, because he, he had done some interesting early studies of microdialysis that were inserting a needle into myofascial trigger points and, and found that there were some pretty dramatic, if I can recall, yeah. differences. Are you there, Jay? Yeah. Yes, I'm here and I'm listening very, very contently. This is fascinating. And you know, to Kathleen's point, Dr. Saluka's point about pH, it is such an important component and you know the pH that we had found in the active trigger point was as low as between four and five, and um, which is of course a very very acidic milieu, which would have major implications in terms of pain sensitization. And as I mentioned yesterday in my talk, if that is also happening um, with respect to the effects it could have on acetylcholinesterase, etc. So um, I'm just really excited to hear about this discussion. Regard, with regard to perhaps being able to look at pH. You may not even need to go that low. So, I mean, we, we can get activation of 
the channels that sense pH, the acid sensing ion channels with things at 6.9, 6.8, 6.0, which are out of out of normal range, but it doesn't actually necessarily take a lot. And if you combine it with inflammatory substances, then even that can go up into seven and still activate nociceptors. So there's a lot that's, of sensitization. Exactly. So I think that's, that's a range good. is 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 important to see, mm -hmm. but understanding that that range is probably not in isolation. Right, right. But but I think also in terms of pathophysiology, the, the, the concept of looking at not just at local nociceptors and sensitization, but the synergistic effect um, mm -hmm. that these different biochemicals may have. And that's why, the, as I said, I think this, this is perhaps an important area that if this can be investigated in this way, it would be wonderful. Well, can we go back into Dr. Chaudhary's question about the what what we might be able to detect? I mean, does that does that help you in determining what what's feasible? Yeah, I mean, I, I the reason I asked was, uh, of course, when when we uh, think about cancer tissue, you kind of see large variation, uh, significant amount of variation, of course, and and I was just wanting to ask if uh, if you would see that big of a difference in in, in this this these tissues versus uh, versus cancer tissues, for example. Because I think most of the work, even in PET, has actually been in the context of cancer tissues. There are several peptides that have been radio labeled. Bicarbonate well, has been radio labeled. But very abnormal know. tissue. Yep. So um, I just wanted to draw to everyone's attention on the panel that um, we are at 10.36 a.m. So it's time for us to be in our open audience Q&A session. Um, for the next 15 minutes. And we're actually getting a fair number of questions. In fact, our Q&A session moderators have dropped these into the Zoom chat if the panelists would like to follow along with me. Um, Chuck, is it okay? I'm gonna kick off with question number one. Yes, Super. yes please. Um, so this is a long one. So follow along if you can in the Zoom chat. Um, I found an interesting data point from Dr. Spangenberg's EIM slide on lumbar paraspinal muscles of patients with chronic lower back pain showing, quote unquote, greater asymmetry in values compared to healthy, unquote. Was the asymmetry measured three-dimensionally as opposed to only one of the planes vertically, horizontally, or sagittally? Was it measured how that related to the torso as a whole, as opposed to just the lower torso? And then the person notes that Alexander technique based interventions focused on improving body schema and proprioception that can address these asymmetries through better proprioceptive awareness. And EIM might be a useful outcome measurement research tool. So Dr. Spangenberg, I believe you're gonna take the first crack at this one. <laughs> yeah, I didn't present that data. So um, I, who, I'm not sure. Who, this is, it's, it's, it's my- was Dr. Rutko, yeah. 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 I'll, 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 I'll say, I'll say yes. you the so, same okay. crack. I was like, question that you can't ask. I thought for a second there, I wasn't sure who gave that, but yeah, yes. Yeah, no, that's totally fine. Um, yeah, no, uh, that's a, there, it's a great question. Uh, the data was collected sagittally. So basically the current, it's a little hard to explain. The current is basically being directed along the length of the lumbosacral paraspinal muscles. And so that's the data that we were getting there. There was no comparison or nothing was interpreted, interpreted more broadly around the torso. So that's the only information we have. I mean, we have other information on the patients, but that's all. So short Great. answer to a long question. Oh, well, thank you. No, these are, I, I love that we're getting such questions that you know people are really deeply diving into your talks today. Our second question uh, comes from a member of our uh, audience that's asking, small fiber neuropathy has been shown in fibromyalgia. Would you think that small fiber neuropathy is a causative factor or an epiphenomenon? Chuck, who should take that? I think I should answer this one All right. myself. All right, go ahead. <laughs> well, it's uh, it's a it's a difficult question, right? Uh, but uh, it's obvious. So one thing I would uh, like to point here is that the abnormality in the peripheral nociceptors detected in fibromyalgia patient was detected in cutaneous nociceptors, not in nociceptors coming from the muscle itself. So one may think, well. Maybe there is a local or focal abnormality in the muscle and this secondarily activates the nociceptor and this is what we are detecting. But this is not the case. The case is that we see a widespread abnormality in, in nociceptors. And this is 
I think we are realizing more and more as we uh, deep, uh, go deep in these patients, there are many human conditions that up to now we thought were focal painful syndromes that we are collectively putting together into a kind of under, under, underlying neuropathy. And, I, and every, I would say that almost every single medical specialty have these quartz mystery diseases. So we have been recording from patients with chronic uh, dry eye syndrome or chronic itch syndrome in the eyes, patients with burning mouth syndrome, patients with interstitial cystitis, uh, patients with chronic vulvodynia. So you have all these patients and then you began recording and you are picking that many of these patients, I would say an overwhelming majority, what they really have is an abnormality in the behavior of these peripheral nociceptors. So the scope of more fiber neuropathy, I think is much wider and much more rich, much richer than we neurologists thought in the beginning that when we thought about the small fiber neuropathy, we were thinking about bilateral burning feet. I think that the spectrum of, of diseases that are be, going to be caused by small fine neuropathy is much wider. So epiphenomenal or pathogenic, I, I would vote is pathogenic. Can I, can I jump in on this discussion? Um, sure. Uh, I mean, I love microneurography technology. I've been teaching it to, the, to my students for many, many years. We, I think that it's one of the unique advantages of, of the somatosensory system in general. but. So in these patients where you see all these um, uh, C fiber activity, how you, you have the ability of directly correlating that activity with perception and how do how those these issues uh, relate in these patients in this the variety of types of patients where you have all these exuberance of peripheral C fiber activity. I mean, classically, we would think that every action potential in a C fiber gives rise to a localized pain perception. Does that still hold in, in these subjects? I'm sorry, this is the helicopter of the hospital just landing right now. <laughs> so just 30 seconds. So that's a very interesting question. And, uh, and I think that um, we have, and actually for the last two years, we have been studying the correlation between uh, the amount of peripheral, abnormal peripheral discharge and the uh, perceptual sensation by the patient. Um, it's not true that every single action potential in a peripheral nociceptor is going to be experienced. You need, there is certain constraints in terms of temporal summation and spatial summation for this afferent barrage to go into consciousness and be, and be perceptually perceived, so to speak. Uh, what we have done is uh, two things. One, we have uh, looked into the amount of spontaneous activity, whether the fact that a fiber discharges faster or slower, whether this correlates with the amount of pain. And we didn't find any correlation. And that was interesting. So that it looked like the temporal summation factors at the level of a single fiber were not important. But then we did another thing, is that we tried to correlate how many fibers are discharging simultaneously with the amount of pain. And there was a strong correlation. So it looks like special summation factors for this kind of ongoing widespread discharges from the periphery are very important, much more important than actual temporal summation factors. And this actually could explain why many of the anti-neuropathic uh, drugs uh, acting in the periphery have not been very effective. Because even if you diminish a little bit, you know, the frequency of discharge of these fibers, if there are still lots of fibers discharging, this because of special summation in the spinal cord and higher up is not going to have a massive effect. On the perception of, of pain, and, and is that is that unique to the patient population? So, in classically, again, the C fiber single action potentials have been at least I've been teaching to my students that they relate to perception of localized, you know, perceived receptive fields and localized association of noxious stimulus perception, and so is this a, the pathology of the chronic pain or that that's there is a shift in this representation or is the, is the classic data simply oversimplified? Well, I don't know whether the patients with chronic neuropathic pain are going to have a kind of quad rectification in the sense of uh, you know, modulation at central levels of the afferent barrage. 
uh, what's for sure in the nociceptor system is that you need more than one action potential. So if you have an action, a single action potential in a Pacini, in a large myelinated Pacinian axon, you feel it. So it's very interesting, even from almost a philosophical point of view, right? Single yeah. action potential is already perceived and is with its, its attributes of quality, temporal and special characteristics. Uh, this does not happen in the nociceptor system, in the C nociceptor system. You need more than one action potential and not only more than one at a certain frequency to be perceived. Otherwise it goes unperceived. Thank you, Dr. Sarah and Dr. Abkarian. That was uh, an interesting exchange. I'd like to, if possible, move on to our third question. But I'm also going to remind our Zoom attendees that if anybody is brave enough to raise a hand in the attendee pool to ask their question directly via audio, I can try to give you access to do that. In the meantime, I'm going to pose our third question. Segmental sarcomere contraction is proposed to be associated with the trigger point or the taut band. Can imaging help identify segmental sarcomere structural change or ion channel changes like the KATP channel that may be associated with muscle function? Dr. Washabaugh, who should take this or Dr. Tuttle? Well, let's see. Uh, given what they're asking, I would probably ask um, either Espin or Seward to to possibly chat on this. Seward might not might be a little bit out of his, but uh, Espen? Did we lose Espen? No, am I back? Uh, you're back. Yeah, you're okay. back. Sorry. Oh, yeah, yeah. Lost you. The phone went off at the same time. Um, so I think in the, this would be tricky um, because the individual channel activity to image, I'm not, you know, in a preclinical model, sure. Um, in a non-invasive fashion, I think it would be really hard. I think this is sort of one of these things where you would have to be able to understand the outcome of the physiology of the channel. So what does the channel do to the physiology of the system? And then can you measure the physiology of the system in a manner to make a prediction about what the channel is doing? Um, so the, the, uh, the example I might use is like, can we, we can use the relaxation rate of a muscle after a contraction to get an idea of what circa activity is doing. Um, again, it's not a direct measure, it's an indirect measure, but at least gives us a potential idea that something's happening there. But could we get down to the, to the level of like a KATP channel? I, I don't think so, not, not anything that I'm aware of. Um, maybe Sam could correct me on that if he knows of something, but I'm not aware of it, at least not in a non-invasive fashion. I, I think that's right, Espen. I don't. I can't think of a non-invasive way to do it. I think that the contemporary method or or the draw would be to try to use something that you can cannulate into the muscle, like a two po two photon microscopy type technique. The problem with that is clinically we use things like needling to change the physiology of that whatever that thing is that we're trying to get out in this entire conference. So I'm just worried that poking it is going to change its physiology a little bit. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Spangenberg and Dr. Ward. Um, let's move to our fourth question. Um, so this, again, slightly longer. This person is referencing Clancy and Cronin in Murphy and Robinson 2010. Quote, unquote, there is a 17-year lag between evidence and practice, likely the result of many clinician barriers, including lack of time, resources, or training to locate and appraise research. Another great insight from the study, being knowledgeable about research is substantially different than making use of it. For the panelists, how do you see your research being applied by allied health practitioners, especially OT, PT, and speech? Chuck and Alex, who do you think should take a first crack at this one. Wow, well, Alex, any, uh, who do you think? So this is sort of the applicant, Dr. Ward, it looks like you might have a hand up for that. Yeah, this is, you know, this is the lag time from, you know, basic science discovery to the bedside, the bench to the bedside sort of problem that we have in biomedical science in general. So Dr. Ward, do you have any, uh, any thoughts on this? Well, I mean, just a starting point, I, I think most people that are on the call probably agree, starting with a research team that includes those people on the front end is the right way to 
go about it from a translational perspective, but how you get that information disseminated widespread into practices. Uh, I mean, there, that's a whole field of research, right? So I, I don't have any concrete answers. Maybe somebody that does, I don't know if there's anybody that does dissemination implementation research on the call, but that's the right person to ask. I think Dr. Myers just noted in the um, chat that he intends to cover this a little in his next session. We have one minute. I see that Dr. Sluka has put her hand up. Uh, Dr. Sluka, would you like to contribute to response to this? And then we'll close out our Q&A session with your comment. Yes. Um, in my world, I have also tried to do a little implementation research. Um, and we're working on one right now um, with with NIAMS, but um, it, it is a difficult process. I think uh, you have to have the understanding first. You have to understand what the pathobiology is. This may or may not affect treatments, but it is a long process to understanding the pathobiology. I think it's very important as a clinician to explain that to your patient, explain why they have what they have and that you can change that with say an exercise program or with this. We're not there for myofascial pain. That's why we're here trying to understand that. By understanding the pathobiology, we may be able to better effectively treat it and develop better treatments, whether it's a, at a physical level or at a pharmacological level or some other level. We don't we can't improve treatments without understanding that in the first place. And so I think you have to be patient and wait for that. I think the internet is actually slow, is actually speeding up that 17 years from discovery into implementation. Um, so once you get to a clinical trial, it's not 17 years anymore before it gets implemented. It is a lot shorter, so that's a good thing. But there's lots and lots of pieces along the way. It's a huge area to talk about in such a short period of time. Okay, great. Thank you, Dr. Zinka, for your insights. Um, Chuck and Alex, uh, I think we'll wrap up our Q&A portion there. We're supposed to be moving to a break at 10.50. Uh, any final comments that both of you might have to close out your session? Any final thoughts as we wrap up here? I would just like to say thank you to the panelists and all the attendees and everybody that's been uh, participating in this discussion. The presentations were outstanding. The, the questions asked were great. I think it's opening, it's ask, it's formulating more questions than more answers, which is what we really wanted. So I will just say thank you again, and I'll pass this to Alex. Yeah, I, I said thank yous before the uh, panelist session, um, but thank you once again to everyone who participated this morning. I thought it was a very interesting discussion. I'm very excited to see the next panel, the next session uh, this afternoon that we'll be talking about um, artificial intelligence, tissue engineering, computational modeling. These are other things, these are other technologies and other techniques that we can sort of bring into the fold um, to better understand myofascial pain syndrome. So thank you everyone and looking forward to discussions later today. Well, thank you everyone. And I would ask all of my panelists now to go ahead and mute and turn off your video. We're going to go into a break. Um, we'll be returning from break at 11.10 a.m. for the start of session five, which as Dr. Tuttle said, will be on emerging promising technologies for myofascial pain syndrome, tissue engineering, artificial intelligence, and computational modeling. So we look forward to seeing you back here, all of our audience members at 1110 AM. Thank you so much and we'll see you shortly after our break. This is session five, Emerging Promising Technologies for Myofascial Pain Syndrome, Tissue Engineering, Artificial Intelligence and Computational Modeling. The chairs of our session are Dr. Yolanda Vallejo from NIDCR, and her co-chair is Dr. Teresa Cruz from NICHD NCMRR, which is the Rehabilitation Research Area. Um, Dr. Cruz, please let us know if you are ready, when you are ready to go with slides. And in the meantime, Dr. Vallejo, is there anything you'd like to just uh, say as an opening remark while Dr. Cruz pulls up the slides? Um, yes, uh, I really, so, so I, Teresa, sorry, did you receive the slides? Yep, I'm getting them up now, thank you. Thank you, okay. Apologies for the technical issue this morning, everyone. No worries. 
I think we're fine now. Thank you, Dr. Cruz. That looks good. Perfect. Thank you. Um, so I will go ahead and start. If you could put it on slide one for slideshow, I see them. So good morning and welcome to session five on emerging promising technologies for myofascial pain syndrome. I'm Yolanda Vallejo from the National Institute of Dental and Craniofacial Research, and I'll be chairing the session together with my colleague, Dr. Teresa Cruz from the National Center for Medical Rehabilitation Research within the National Institute of Child Health and Human Development. Um, next slide, please. As program director for the oral facial pain program at NADCR, I'm particularly excited by the research and ideas being discussed at this workshop, as they hold potential to move the needle forward for very complex, painful conditions, such as temporomandibular disorders, that are an area of emphasis for NADCR. Uh, TMDs are a heterogeneous and poorly understood set of disorders that manifest in the temporomandibular joint, muscles of mastication, and surrounding tissues, compromising quality of life for many individuals. TMJ mechanics, which are quite complex, allowing for translational and rotational movements of the mandible, depend on four major pairs of muscles, the masseter, temporalis, and lateral and medial pterygoids. So as you can imagine, one of the main categories of TMDs are masticatory muscle disorders, including myofascial pain, that are often of a known etiology and lack correlation between overt signs of injury and pain intensity ratings. As such, understanding tissue level abnormalities, as well as interactions between different tissues using evolving non-invasive technologies Multimodal measurements and multi-scale modeling represent key research areas for expansion. With that, next slide, please. With that in mind, I'll remind you that if you are a Zoom attendee, uh, a Zoom webinar panelist, you should mute yourself unless speaking. Please have your video on during your session. Please raise your digital blue hand and wait until you're called upon. For Zoom webinar attendees, Please post a question in the Q&A box at any time. You can raise your digital blue hand to ask questions live during the audience Q&A portion of the session, and videocast viewers can post questions in the NIH videocast feedback form at any time. Um, with that, let's get this session started, and we'll be hearing about tissue engineering, artificial intelligence, and computational modeling approaches. And I will hand it over to our first speaker, Dr. Jeffrey Loth from the University of California, San Francisco, who will tell us about quantifying associations between paraspinal muscle quality, spinal pathologies, and skeletal biomechanics. Dr. Loth, the floor is yours. Thank you for the introduction, and thank you for the organizers for providing me the opportunity to present. So I'm gonna talk about um, how we can think about the role of muscles, uh, particularly paraspinal muscles in uh, chronic low back pain. So this is the, one of the organizational overview slides for this meeting. And uh, where I wanted just to place some emphasis is where content for my presentation may fit in with the broader context of the, of the session as we think about quantitative methods to investigate hypotheses in myofascial pain. Uh, there's a component of structural. I'll talk about how we characterize muscles in the spine. Uh, mechanical, what are the, uh, what's the role of paraspinal muscles in stabilizing the spine? Uh, and the role of inflammation and crosstalk between muscles and other tissues in the back. So, so as back pain, you, you likely know, is a, is a big uh, problem in this country and across the world. And, you know, the challenge is really trying to disentangle where the focus is. They're historically, uh, because disc degeneration is seen fairly easily with routine imaging, uh, the assumption is that disc degeneration uh, can be tied as a root cause to the pain experience for patients. However, we are, have learned that uh, degeneration is seen with traditional structural imaging really doesn't uh, co uh, correspond to pain in a reliable way. Uh, so the, the challenge for really moving back pain research forward is to have a more integrated approach to, um, uh, to factor in uh, various uh, risk factors for individual patients and try to disentangle which is contributing 
uh, the most from an individual patient. And I think we've had historically blinders in terms of our own tissue of interest and tend to focus on one tissue in isolation and not integrate information across various tissues and how they might be um, integrated in the system. And I'll touch today upon uh, some research that's trying to help us understand where and when muscles play a role. This is a organizational uh, or causal map that uh, Paul Hodges has published. It's come out of a body of his work that's focused on how muscles and muscle injury plays a role in uh, the transition from acute to chronic back pain. And some of the things here I'll just make uh, emphasis on is the, you know, the injury can cause changes in muscle and that muscle changes can cause uh, uh, you know, pain and, and uh, psychological factors such as catastrophization, and that leads to fear avoidance, which might also um, provide some feedback into how patients move, uh, how muscles are loaded, uh, ultimately leading to potential disuse and atrophy and uh, dis uh, dysregulation across this musculoskeletal system. So the, in the presentation today, I've uh, kind of distilled down some aspects of that causal map to uh, focus on the role of paraspinal muscles, how it's associated with other tissue pathologies in the back, and this interaction influences not only local spine biomechanics, but global spine biomechanics. And then these can be influenced by um, other factors such as pain and, pain and disability. So one study that uh, is, I think, insightful in looking at this association between paraspinal muscle quality and function and spine biomechanics uh, is one that was uh, conducted on a series of, of astronauts who were exposed to six months of microgravity. And so uh, we know that uh, exposure to microgravity can induce uh, what's uh, called this uh, adaptation, microgravity adaptation back pain, and then also increased disc herniation uh, on, reply, on return to earth. And so the question is where, you know, what are the causal factors and how does the loss of gravity influence the skeletal system? Uh, so we had the opportunity to study crew before and after uh, they returned from six months on the International Space Station and then a 30-day follow-up period. Some of the things we measured were MRI, um, standing and supine, a dynamic fluoroscopy, some functional tests and questionnaires. The, uh, you know, going into this, our primary hypothesis was that microgravity would, um, because of the loss of diurnal fluctuations, have its most significant effect on intervertebral discs. But what we found is that the, the, the tissue that had the most reliable um, pre-post-flight change was actually the paraspinal muscles and in, in particular the multifidus. So this is, shows some data where uh, segmentation of the multifidi and assessment of the fat fraction and quality of, of the multifidi varies over time. And you can see this progression of, of uh, the fat fraction going from the medial border out to the periphery, which uh, was significantly changed with uh, six months of microgravity. And that had direct effect both on posture, a lower doses and on uh, movement as, as characterized by the flexion extension uh, dynamic fluoroscopy. So that uh, this shows the uh, correlation between the change in multifidus cross-sectional area pre post flight and the loss of lumbar lower doses. So as the multifidi uh, atrophied, the, the spine flattened um, and as the multifidi atrophied, the spine flattened, there was also a change, a reduction in movement or stiffening of the spine. So this was a direct correlation that was uh, not influenced by changes with other tissues that we measured, such as intervertebral disc. Uh, trying to extrapolate those findings to the clinical population, we've used uh, a technique called ideal or fat fraction MRI to look at clinical populations. This is an example of uh, two different patients which have different fat compositions uh, in a transverse plane. Uh, here, increased fatty infiltration in the multifidi versus a healthy subject. And Jeannie Bailey's published some data in a cohort of back pain patient control showing that looking just at multifidus fat fraction, uh, it has a, 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 an association between a measure of a disability, the Zoswestry Disability Index. So this suggests that the um, the changes induced by microgravity um, and their effect on uh, the loss of stabilization of the spine uh, has potential role in understanding disability in chronic, uh, chronic pain patients in a clinical setting. So the, the, spot, the multifidus and the paraspinals really don't operate in isolation. So they are part of their 
you know, dynamic system that helps balance the static, uh, uh, the static properties of the disc and uh, ligaments and so forth to provide stability of the spine. And there is a crosstalk between the two, both in terms of biomechanics and inflammation. This is a, an example of um, uh, one of the crew which had a disc herniation um, at the L3-4 level on the, on, the, on the left. And you can see that there's, this is the, the multifidi imaging on both sides at different levels. And you can see on the side of the herniation, there's increased multifidi fat fraction at multiple levels as opposed to the non-herniated side. This suggests the, and supports evidence that's come from preclinical studies that when you damage the disc, there's a corresponding uh, disruption in the function of the multifidus muscles. So this crosstalk could be a combination of both uh, chemical and mechanical. Uh, I think a more important chemical irritant for adjacent tissues that's relevant to patients is uh, damage to the interface between the vertebra and the disc that can be seen as motor changes on uh, MRI scans. And this, these motor changes result from uh, inflammation, irritation, um, and uh, an autoimmune reaction when the boundary of the nucleus is violated. These nuclear cells are... Um, normally sequestered from the blood supply. So when that boundary breaks down, you have inflammation, neo-innervation, and pain arising from the surface of the end plate. And so we have been looking at techniques to characterize better the intervertebral disc and that interface as a more sensitive assessment of when that boundary breaks down and could be uh, problematic for the patient. And one of the techniques that seems to be pretty useful clinically is ultra short time to echo MRI. This shows how you can see increased contrast in that cartilage, which separates the intervertebral disc from the adjacent bones. And when you quantify um, the end plate using UTE in clinical populations, you find that the presence of end plate damage uh, has a significant predictor, the high odds ratio that that patient is a back pain patient versus control. And this is a much more significant association. Some of the other approaches have been used. A Furman is a clinical degeneration grading scheme and uh, motor changes are a qualitative assessment of this bone marrow changes in the adjacent vertebra. So characterizing end plate damage, it seems particularly important in identifying pain in these patients. And when you uh, adjust for motor change of Furman grade, that odds ratio remains and it's, uh, the odds ratios increase uh, by about a factor of two for every disc where you see these uh, disruption in the cartilage end plate. So the, so the question is then, does, is there um, some relationship uh, like we've seen in herniation and disc injury between cartilage end plate damage and the multifidus? So in this population, as I mentioned, there's a high odds ratio that these patients have pain when there's evidence of end plate disruption. But if we take measures of uh, fat fraction from the multifidi and we stratify these patients, those that have a good quality multifidi versus those that have poor quality multifidi, we find in the patients with good quality okay. multifidi, that, that uh, those odds ratios go away. So this suggests that even in the presence of disc damage, if the quality of the multifidi are, are good and they can stabilize the spine, this may protect that patient from becoming symptomatic from other pathologies. I'll spend the last few minutes talking about um, looking at another dimension of how uh, muscles in the back and, and connective tissues in the back might in, be important for back pain patients. This is in looking at global biomechanics and movement. And so, as I mentioned, the multifidi, they act like a bowstring, they help support lordosis in the spine. And when that, uh, the multifidi atrophy, you may lose lordosis and this is disrupts the center of gravity, which causes patients to have to compensate with the lower extremities. So the, uh, we think there's information from looking at global posture movement that um, provides data that helps us understand uh, disruptions in uh, the biomechanics that might have clinical meaning for diagnosis and treatment monitoring. Uh, to be able to do this in an accessible way in the clinic, uh, as opposed to having to go to a biomechanics laboratory, uh, we've been developing techniques using depth cameras. This is a, a Microsoft Connect, which sends out an infrared speckle pattern that allows you to get a three-dimensional map of an individual without the use of targets. So this can be done routinely in the clinic uh, in a, in a five-minute uh, assessment. And the, the features behind this, which have made it important for um, uh, use in, in uh, interpreting uh, 
clinical biomechanics in a meaningful way is actually in building in a, dy a dynamic uh, biomechanical model. So Rob Matthews has put a lot of energy into taking the raw depth information that's provided from the camera, uh, integrating this with a biomechanical model at scale to the individual in terms of the lengths and the, and the weights of the arms and legs, et cetera. And from that scaled biomechanical model, now you can calculate uh, torques moments at various joints in addition to positions and with some assumptions about uh, the muscle anatomy, you can predict forces in various tissues in the back. And this is an example of what this uh, clinical assessment would look like where a patient's performing a sit to stand maneuver. And while the patient's performing that maneuver, you can be uh, quantifying various biomechanical parameters that may have uh, particular meaning, uh, particular uh, meaning for the clinician. And this, again, is a camera from the front, but we're getting three-dimensional information. So uh, this uh, can provide some, I think, unique clinical insight. Uh, this is an example of using this in a clinical setting where uh, a patient uh, preoperative, this is a, a lateral view of a patient performing the sit to stand. And these are various measures that um, appear to be important for spine surgery patients. One in particular down here is this sagittal vertical axis, which is the time uh, history of how that patient's trunk is uh, um, oriented relative to the horizontal plane. And you can see after surgery in blue that the patient has uh, successfully recovered in their ability, not only the speed in which they rise out of a chair, but the coordination between the trunk and the lower extremities. And that influences the, the mechanical demand across the whole system. So the so the question is, can we extract features uh, from these dynamic movements that have clinical meaning to help us subclassify patients so we can better align them with treatments? And so there's approaches that we could use to look at uh, simple peak values. Here's an example of looking at the peak sagittal vertical axis, knee energy, et cetera, spine torque. And does this allow us to classify patients here, controls versus back pain? And that seems to do reasonably well. But um, you know, more importantly, there's additional data in those time histories, which uh, I think are critical. This is a uh, work in progress from Bob Matthew looking at patients with have predetermined dis dis uh, problems with either the knee, hip, or spine. Uh, 50, so we've got a number in addition to controls with a number of repetitions. And the question is, can we uh, use machine learning algorithms to classify these patients uh, when we know a priori what their condition is? And so this is showing the accuracy of the classification just using the raw uh, kinematic data uh, positions uh, and, and uh, this and peaks. And if we increase to look at uh, additional uh, velocity data, uh, this association improves, uh, improves even further when we look at dynamic data. Uh, the data, uh, but there's additional information in the shape of these curves the beyond just the peaks that has a significant enhancement in our ability to use this as a classify patients in these different categories. So using the whole time history of machine learning allows us to come up with some movement signatures that may be valuable in, in uh, assessing these patients in the clinic. So in wrapping up the, um, we think there's important parameters that can be measured clinically in populations to allow us to look at uh, how muscle and movement is important in back pain and how it associates with other pathologies. We have a, a, an opportunity through the uh, Backpack Consortium now to integrate a number of measures in these populations. The goal of identifying biomarkers we can measure with accuracy, how that informs us phenotypes that might align with customized treatments and better outcomes. And so the challenge is what are the comprehensive bio biomechanical markers that address the biopsychosocial model that can be deployable in an accurate man manner in the clinic and have those be uh, in developed into algorithms that are interpretable. So how does a clinician understand what this algorithm is telling them and how do the mechanisms behind this algorithm align with action, uh, mechanism action and potential treatments? So we hope to have uh, some exciting data for you from this project over the coming years. And uh, thank you very much for your attention. And I thank my collaborators for this work. Thank you, Dr. Lodes. Um, next, we will hear from Dr. Sharmila Mujumdar from the University of California, San Francisco. And she will tell us about the role of machine learning for muscle segmentation and characterization of muscle properties. Uh, Dr. Mujumdar, the floor is yours. Good morning. Uh, thank you for inviting me to speak at this uh, symposium. It has been extremely enlightening and I hope you can see my screen. Good. 
Thank you. So yeah. here are my disclosures. Uh, there are none for this particular talk, but we do get research support. And using the es essentially the slide which was uh, provided for this meeting, you've heard over the last two days, the role that imaging can play all the way from structural to uh, uh, PET imaging, to looking at, uh, essentially looking at fibrosis, looking at muscle cross-sectional areas, spectroscopy, vascular behavior, diffusion, and so on. So clearly the role of imaging and spectroscopy has been demonstrated very well for myofascial pain syndrome and the way it can look at muscle or, and also the adjoining tissues. There hasn't been a concise or a consistent amount of data which has been specifically aimed at myofascial pain syndrome, but the role of imaging has certainly been identified. Whenever you're trying to do any of these studies in imaging, there is a critical need to identify the muscle as well as the tissue, and therefore you need to have muscle or tissue segmentation. When I was planning this talk, that was all I was going to stick to, but as, as we evolved in our discussions, I don't know why it's not working, okay. Um, I began to think that how could I present what I was going to present in the con context of myofascial pain, it's complete multifaceted uh, behavior, and that it, it is a cascade of events from numerous organs, I mean, tissues that resulted in myofascial pain. And I want to focus this discussion in the context of lower back pain, but certainly the extension for osteoarthritis, other musculoskeletal pain, et cetera, is also possible, and I could have used that as well. But for now, let's just concentrate on lower back pain as a model, because it was also stated that imaging has never been found to correlate very well to lower back pain. And uh, I think there are multiple reasons for this, because when we do imaging for pain or, or try and related, we usually do it in a univariate way. The studies are either done for looking at muscle size, composition, maybe vascularity, but maybe not. It's just degeneration by itself. But there are clearly, there are other factors, spinal alignment relate, uh, results in myofascial pain, inflammation of the nerves as a result of disc degeneration. There's a cascade. And this is where I think artificial intelligence, machine and deep learning in imaging plays a role. Most of the work in MPS has been, in, there has been work in machine learning, but it is basically clustered analysis, support vector machines, random forests of that ilk. Applying it in the, in the context of imaging, it has not actually happened, but I think there are tools which are available and artificial intelligence can play a major role in pulling together all of the elements in imaging in order to uh, serve a particular purpose. It could be used for the objective segmentation of tissues, quantitation of alignment, ca 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 calculating muscle cross-sectional areas, composition, disc, similarly composition and morphology, looking at the nerves, tracking inflammation. We heard about neurography, uh, end plate changes as the case may be. So let's just start with spinal alignment. By looking essentially at coronal x-rays, uh, the spinal alignment is often defined as an offset between the uh, C7 vertebral body and the sacrum. And this is a very tedious process. Most people do not like doing it, but by identifying essentially key points and training a neural network to do, do, uh, to do this kind of identification, we have been able to look at coronal imbalance uh, with performance which is almost comparable to that of ra two radiologists. The, the, uh, the measures for scoliosis and alignment that come out of x-rays are called alpha angles, and these angles have also been calculated from these coronal x-rays, and essentially the errors that you see in terms of the model calculating these errors is again akin to two radiologists doing the grading. What does this do for us? This enables us to do rapid measurements of scoliosis if the x-rays exist in a larger population in something that the radiologists take a lot of time to do. And, uh, and we can certainly do it at the level of the radiologists in terms of reproducibility. Could one do better? That is a different question and it will be asked at the end of this particular talk. Similarly, looking at sagittal imbalance, another thing, in another me metric for uh, alignment. This is also the, our model that we trained can actually perform 
exactly at the level of the radiologist, actually better than the performance of two radiologists in this particular case, because the sagittal x-rays can be a little bit uh, murky in terms of uh, their quality. Hardware failure is another issue for spinal alignment. Once again, the model sensitivity and the area under the curve was again to the ilk of the radiologist. So for spinal alignment from x-rays, an important measure for looking at lower back pain potentially result, uh, which might result in myofascial pain syndrome, it can be done. And of course it needs validation. Now, one of the other things that you're going to hear about later on is the creation of potentially subject specific musculoskeletal models, basically calling upon the mechanical nature of the spine of the musculoskeletal system, which might result in myofascial pain. These models are typically based on uh, you know, sex-specific, subject-specific models, including their uh, demographics, as well as the body mass index and so on. Medical imaging is used to find important tissue types, such as the vertebral bodies, the discs, the muscles, all done manually. If one could do that with machine learning, that would become much faster. The centroids of these tissues are obtained, plotted, and models are created. Activities may be simulated and you can get muscle forces, joint reaction forces, vertebral loading and relationships therefore with respect to pain, disability and so on. This is work being done at Beth Israel uh, by Dennis Anderson and Mary Buxheim and clearly utilizes medical imaging but requires a manual segmentation role. Muscle can be very adequately imaged both for composition and size using magnetic resonance. You heard about the ideal technique. You heard about T1-weighted images, which show muscle and fatty infiltration, as do the ideal images. We have had students do this kind of segmentation, and typically it's in studies of 10 and 15. And even then, they at the end of the day, they have threatened to leave or uh, destroy themselves or whatever it is. It's a very, very tedious process, but it does have a certain reproducibility if somebody is doing well with it. Using these manual segmentations, we have trained models to automatically segment the, the thigh muscles, the gluteus medius, the as well as the paraspinal muscles and in a sequence, as well as vendor independent way, we can use GE images as well as Siemens images. And I show you the cross-sectional area. You can see the correlations on this graph on the right-hand side are very good between the manual multifidus as well as the automatic multifidus cross-sectional areas. We can look at asymmetry, fat fraction, extract spectroscopic images from specific voxels if we have that available and diffusion data if that is available. This is just a depiction of the ground truth, the segmented vertebral bodies, the disc and the muscles, and what the model actually inferred basically using these particular images and the algorithm that was developed. And again, if you look at the correlations that you get dice as a measure for the performance of the algorithm, it is very close to that of the radiologist's inter-reader reproducibility. So from that perspective, we are getting as good as our training data set. Now, it, it really depends on the training data set. And again, we will address this at the end. The, you can derive centroids and potentially move on to calculate the biomechanical models. But so far we've talked about biomechanics of the spine and therefore uh, the relationship to myofascial pain. The tissues are also degenerating. Biomechanical properties are changing as a result of tissue biochemical changes. Furman grading, we've heard about that a little while ago. Furman grades are a way to look at tissue degeneration and actually measuring these for a radiologist. I show you the reproducibility between two radiologists that we have over here. This is just to say whether it's normal versus abnormal. A trained model actually performs just as well as a radiologist. As you will see, this is the model performance shown in this curve here in this ROC curve and the radiologist performance are shown over here. And similarly, you can go towards not just binary, but separating mild, moderate, severe, et cetera, by training these algorithms. We've looked at end plate changes, modic changes, again, tedious to uh, define, wide variability between the radiologists in terms of uh, what they call modic one, two versus three. And a model can actually, with good sensitivity and specificity, uh, a neural net can actually uh, grade two minutes. changes. 
Similarly, stenosis can be graded. We can look at biochemical changes which occur in the disc. You heard about T1 rho values, and which shows a degradation of proteoglycan. If you could link this with, this is just showing how multifidus, erector spinae, and psoas uh, asymmetry relate to these biochemical changes. This can also be done with these segmentations. Moving forward, if you could do the same thing with, new, uh, with the nerves, you can get neurograms, which are easily defined, rapid neurograms with the nerve segmentation, which actually de define some aspects of myofascial pain syndrome. We can do this with reconstruction. Uh, Gary Gold showed some of these reconstruction techniques, but if these reconstruction techniques cannot actually derive the modic changes, they would not be very useful. We proved that they could do these modic changes. Moving forward, wouldn't it be nice to have a fast scan, which instead of producing just an image, but simultaneously use the data and produce all the things that you want. This is a T1 row map. This is also a segmentation that can be produced simultaneously. So the goal moving forward is where are we with artificial intelligence and myofascial pain? Not a whole lot has been done, but with imaging and with the tools of artificial intelligence, you could certainly have your baseline model, subject specific model, you could automatically get ideas about tissue, about alignment, tissue morphology, composition, uh, PET, if you wanted to put into it, it would require some amount of segmentation, stenosis, diffusion. These are all things you can gather. And by using AI to at least get derive the data from the images you could put in for a subject specific model, you could combine it with all the electro EMGs that you have. You could uh, certainly derive models, including patient reported outcomes, response to uh, acti activities, therapy, and also possibly coordinate it with uh, functional brain MRI. This is if you actually extract parameters. On the other hand, if you have very large data sets, you could also do fully data-driven models where you don't derive these features, but just use all the images, all the sensor data in an artificial intelligence model. This can also be done. So this takes us to the premise that you can do large imaging cohorts, you can do this fast, you can do it in time saving in a standardized way and build complex multidimensional models for what essentially is a extremely heterogeneous consider syndrome, which is myofascial pain syndrome. In order to get there, what do we need? Validation, testing, deployment, uh, Thank you, Dr. Majumdar. Your time is up. Do we have time for one final thought? Okay, this is it. In, uh, these are the thank needs you. in order to get there. And with that, I would like to thank the team that has assisted and worked with me tirelessly to bring you this uh, particular slideshow. Thank you. Thank you for that excellent presentation. We will now move to Dr. Ha Yao from Clemson Medical University of South Carolina, and he will tell us about integrating multimodality measurement and multi-scale modeling to assess temporomandibular disorders. Um, Dr. Majumdar, can you see sharing your screen? So, I Dr. Yao, you, you're sharing. Ah, okay. Dr. Yao, can you share your screen? Uh, Yolanda, I'm sorry. I thought Dr. Blumker was next. Oh, I'm sorry. You're correct. Dr. Blumker is next from University of Virginia. So sorry about that. Um, Dr. Blumker will talk to us about multi-scale computational modeling, integrating biology and mechanics to prove new insights into muscle dysfunction. Thank you, Teresa. Hi, thank you. Uh, can you hear me? And see my screen? Yes. Awesome. Thank you. Um, well, uh, thank you for the introduction. And uh, oops, it is. Um, and I'd like to first thank uh, the organizers of this meeting and uh, for hosting this and for the invitation to speak. And I'd also like to thank all the spe other speakers and panelists. Um, it's been a super interesting uh, day and a half so far, and I've learned a lot. So I wanted to tell you a little bit about um, how we can use uh, multi scale computer modeling. Uh, which integrates biology and mechanics to give new insight. And I think that there's some real uh, opportunities for um, leveraging multi-scale modeling in the context of myofascial pain. So just a, a quick disclosure statement. So alterations in tissue structure and, uh, and physiology uh, at multiple life scales are related to myofascial pain. So I've sort of organized 
uh, a number of the measurements that everybody's been talking about now uh, over a range of scales. Because I think that it's an opportunity and then it's, it's a challenge thinking about um, there's mechanical factors that are really many of them at the larger scale that relate to movement or tissue. Now there's underlying structural features that are more at the level of the tissue and sub-tissue level. And then there's um, cellular and biochemical and molecular factors that even are also at play. So part of the challenge I think uh, with this particular syndrome is that uh, these features uh, span multiple scales. And so how do we think about how do they relate to each other, affect each other and integrate to, to, to end up with this syndrome? So the goal of my lab, my slides have a mind of their own, is to create computer models that allow us to uh, approach this challenge, is create models at multiple length scales that then once they're kind of all in the computer, we can uh, start to think about how do they relate to each other and affect each other in lots of different ways. So I think of this as a new model system sort of compared to an animal model or an in vitro model or, or other types of models that you might be using to, to study a disease. A computer model is another model system. So why do that? Well, I would argue that you know, in, in the context of many disease uh, mechanisms, there's, we're at, this, at the period where we have a lot of data. There's wealth of, it, of excellent experimental studies, whether they in vivo or in animal models, but provide some real, um, real meat to our understanding of, this, of our system. So what a computer model could do for you is to take all that wealth of information, essentially, why I like to say, put it in the computer um, and combine that with things like equations for laws of physics that we know are true, right? Um, and then also um, integrate that even with known behaviors of, of cells and, and subcellular features uh, that then once we have all that together, we can replace now our mental model uh, or not replace, but uh, complement it with a computational model that then allows us to play with it. Uh, we can reveal causal relationships, re re explore what if scenarios, estimate things that are unmeasurable or design new experiments, many other things, ultimately um, allowing us to explore new questions, generate new ideas and develop new hypotheses that can then move the field, field forward with new experiments or treatment ideas. So I'd like to uh, propose uh, present a few examples of this in the context of Duchenne muscular dystrophy. And because so I have a particular interest in a fair amount of research in this area. And I think there are some, some very similar things between DMD um, or at least the muscle involvement in DMD and myofascial pain syndrome. So if you look at a, of a thigh and a, and a boy with Duchenne muscular dystrophy, you see actually, you see a fair amount of fatty infiltration, which is, a, which is thought to be a marker of degeneration. But interestingly, not all the muscles degenerate the same, despite the fact that all of these muscles uh, are lacking the dystrophin protein, which is thought to lead to the degeneration. Some muscles have little, some muscles have a lot, and some muscles are kind of in the middle. So why is that? Um, and I think this speaks um, this sort of to the conversation earlier today is not all the muscles are the same, and that's really an opportunity or a challenge, but also an opportunity. And so let's think about, so there's lots of mechanisms that are known to contribute to the degeneration of the muscle in DMD over time, incre increased susceptibility to injury, a pro-fibrotic state, chronic inflammation, uh, altered satellite stem cell dynamics, those are important stem cells for regeneration of muscle. So many of those things are involved. So how do we think about how we might use computer models to help understand this, uh, this uh, overall arching question, but sort of establishing some sub questions. So there's many possibilities from, uh, I would say macro scale movement to micro scale mechanics, looking within the tissue and even down to the cellular environment of the muscle. So thinking about the macro scale movement, one thing we do know, as I said, dystrophic muscles are highly susceptible to damage from eccentric contraction. These are some classic uh, experiments published in the early 90s on uh, the, the mouse model of muscular dystrophy showing that under eccentric contraction conditions, the MDX is the mouse model has much higher um, uh, damage of muscle fibers from an eccentric contraction as, as compared to the control and other types of contractions. So we used a macro scale simulation of walking, uh, which allows us to do something uh, for the example of, of, of estimating things unmeasurable. It's measuring that estimates all the forces across all the muscles of the lower extremity, uh, what they experience during walking, and use that to calculate essentially the level of eccentric contraction, which we measured as, as negative work during gait, um, higher negative work, higher eccentric, lower negative work, lower eccentric, 
and uh, compare that with published measurements of a uh, level of damage across boys with DMD across all the muscles and just to examine if there's a relationship there. Um, and then lo and behold, you see that lower uh, eccentric contraction corresponds with lower fatty infiltration or lower damage and higher with higher with some outliers there. Um, and, that, and that holds for both the upper and the lower extremities, which gives you a sense for how a, a macro scale model could give insight. Um, we follow that on with looking at things like how changes in um, different walking patterns, like different slopes, um, and how that would influence eccentric contraction, which had the application to how to guide uh, exercise management in boys with DMD. We've also used our model to actually develop a simulated uh, uh, gait mimicking protocol to go back to the mouse model to better to create an assay that essentially tests the mouse muscle in a way that resembles what happens to the muscle in, in the human. Uh, and then we've also even compared uh, um, uh, the uh, fiber uh, behavior between a mouse uh, computational model and a human model to also help understand why and how the mouse model of the disease has a different phenotype, though genetically similar, different phenotype from the human. So many types of things you can explore. Uh, the next one is microscale mechanics. So we've developed what we call a micromechanical model that um, uh, of sort of at the fascicle fiber level that incorporates um, uh, mechanics of muscle fibers of the extracellular matrix and also the, the membrane between them using a nonlinear uh, representation of the, of the links of the proteins that pr provide that membrane. And then we test this model in shear. And I thought this might be a good example for this group, since I know there's a lot of interest in, in shear properties of the, of the ECM uh, you know, within an outside muscle. So we can test them in the shear deformation that mimics the deformation seen during the eccentric contraction and, and look at uh, strain in the membrane and also strain within the ECM is, is, uh, are these sort of boundary areas. And then the blue here, which are kind of representative of the pink, um, those are the fibers. And so then we can uh, measure um, some uh, what we call fiber membrane strain, which is the strain that's experienced at the membrane boundary between the muscle fiber and the ECM. And that's really thought to be um, damaged uh, during an eccentric contraction. So a higher strain would be higher susceptibility to damages compared to lower. So of course, a dystrophic muscle has fewer links that connect that. So you're gonna see more strain there. So what we found, if we, we looked at a healthy sample, you had a certain, for a certain, uh, uh, you had a, a relatively no, low membrane strain, but as you decrease these transmembrane proteins simulating this dystroph uh, muscular dystrophy, you saw an increase, but then if you start added fibrosis, um, you see a slight more increase. And then, uh, then of course, if you start adding fat infiltration, so we modeled sort of replace some of the fibers with fat, much like you'd see later in the disease, uh, you see sort of a um, sort of a, a balancing. But one interesting thing that I thought the group would be uh, curious about is actually uh, what we assumed for the properties of the extracellular matrix really impacted this. So this is a scenario where we assumed the, muscle, the ECM is relatively stiff, much like consistent with what we'd think fibrotic. But then if we made the uh, ECM more compliant, you actually, at especially early stages, you saw an increase in the membrane strain, which really kind of suggests that actually a stiff ECM in this, in this situation plays somewhat of a, of a protective role in terms of the muscle's susceptibility to damage. Then uh, we did some follow-on work to really kind of see if we could really validate the predictions from the model by um, comparing, making models from uh, specific histologic samples and Go comparing next. that thank you, um, with Prussian orange dye uptake, a measure of fiber damage, and saw a nice correlation and even really helped understand why some muscles over here on the right, you see a higher membrane strain uh, within the EDL muscle as the soleus, these are mouse muscles, really explaining why some muscles tend to be more susceptible than others. And last, I wanted to point to um, our models of cellular dynamics, sort of thinking about the regeneration. So we've developed these agent-based models that um, can simulate damage and incorporate behaviors of, of all the um, key cellular players in regeneration derived from rule, which are uh, developed by rules derived from experiments uh, where we simulate a damage in blue, uh, the, the kind of uh, taking away the damage, the inflammation, and then the recovery of the muscle fibers over time. And then we can validate those by comparing with experimental measures of cell cellular dynamics post-injury, so over time. Uh, both the satellite cells, fiberblasts, 
uh, macrophages and also overall the, the regeneration of the muscle itself. And then we can modify it to simulate different um, stages of disease, like number of fibroblasts, um, the behaviors of the macrophages, fibrosis, satellite stem cell dynamics. And then we could see how at different stages, because of different uh, uh, biochemical environments, you have different amounts of uh, regeneration. In particular, the profibrotic mouse um, saw a very um, uh, diminished capacity to regenerate following an injury. And we found that really in our model, what best predicted that was the recruitment of satellite stem cells, not the initial number, but the ability to recruit, which ended up being actually related to the collagen density of the model. So higher collagen density actually limited uh, recruitment of the satellite cells, which led us to do some follow-on experiments, uh, injecting TGF beta um, and studying how that impacted regeneration and predicted the model design experiment. And we also has led us to start to delve a little bit more into the, the, the properties and, and sort of density and, and arrangement of the ECM and how that changes in DMD because it seems very, very complicated. Um, so with that, I just wanted to give a final plug for um, the group of, of NIH funded investigators that are all doing multi-scale modeling. We call ourselves uh, the IMAG or Inter Interagency Modeling and Analysis Group. We have an annual meeting where everybody comes together, lots of different applications, but it might be an interesting opportunity to think about how multi-scale modeling can, can um, help uh, this community or at least plug in. And I'd like to finish by acknowledging my students and collaborators and, and funding sources. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Bunker. Um, and now we will move on to Dr. Hayao from Clemson Medical University of South Carolina. Um, Dr. Yao, can you please share your screen and take the floor? Uh, could you see my slides? Uh, not yet. There they are. Great. Okay, so, uh, okay, sorry, I should back to the first slides. Okay, so first thing, uh, the organizer gave me the opportunity and to uh, talk about our research work uh, at this workshop. And so I'm gonna follow actually Dr. Beck's uh, uh, previous uh, uh, talk and uh, to emphasize on the multi-scale modeling. Uh, so the general idea is uh, how we're gonna integrate actually so those you know, different cluster of the measurements and uh, be able to provide the patient-specific uh, predictions using the multi-scale modeling approach. So, temporal mandibular joint, it's uh, uh, mechanically and structurally, it's a, a complex uh, a joint. And so you can see here, and so it include at least eight muscle uh, groups and to perform the motions. And so this, the complex thing is that they have two joints to work at the same times. So they have a pretty large motion, a range of motion, including rotation and the translations. So in the 2008, uh, there's a paper in the New England Journal of Medicine and Dr. Scavani actually formalized these uh, research, TM, current uh, TMD research paradigms. Uh, so, uh, so then actually, so all the related research focus is a focus on the different levels. And so far, actually, the research has gained the fruitful knowledge about the pathogenesis of the TMD uh, disorders. So here, I just list actually uh, the research focus in my lab. So we perform the TMD research at uh, different scales from joint level to the cellular level. First, we are look at the joint level uh, to assess the auto function and the overall TMD uh, mechanical uh, functions. And also we study the uh, TMJ anatomy and to look at the variation of the morphology, how can it impact the TMJ function? Uh, so those uh, functions come from the, you know, the tissue uh, uh, mechanical properties. So we try to look at the relationship uh, between the tissue structure and the tissue mechanical uh, property and also the other mechanical, uh, other material properties. And so, uh, so then we look at how the cells can respond to the, this kind of different mechanical environments and try to remodel the tissue structures and then maintain the healthy of the overall joints. So basically we are looking at uh, the joint level, tissue level, and the cellular level. But the question challenge is how can we integrate those different levels of the measurements and make meaningful 
uh, prediction for the specific patient. So the idea is here. And uh, so, uh, so here I'll show the example. Uh, so this is the last year, actually, the paper actually in the science. So they uh, look at how this the human sound system was shaped by the longitudinal change in the binding configuration. Uh, use these so-called silicon models and all called the virtual human trials. So basically they look at those kind of measurements and put in the computational models and to do the predictable uh, uh, assessment. So we use the same approach and try to uh, integrate all these different modality of the measurement and the body level, joint level, and the tissue level and to make the predictions. So here I'm gonna introduce two levels of the integrations. First, we'll look at the body level uh, measurements. So the body level measurements, the core is uh, the TMJ stereometry and the inverse dynamics models. So it's highlighted in the orange. So using these two modeling approach, so we be able to integrate the morphological data from the imaging and the motion data and EMG data uh, to predict joint force and the muscle force. Those information normally is very hard to direct measure using the uh, non-invasive in vivo uh, measurement modalities. So here as, as an example, so we use the uh, CBCT. This is the Combi CT and it's very popular in the dental clinic and then MR and get the anatomic information. So then we put on the motion tracking markers to look at the motion of the patient when they perform different oral tasks and simultaneously to record uh, the EMG signals when they perform different oral tasks. So combine those informations. So we put into the, uh, the computational modeling. Uh, so here as an animation, you can show this uh, computational model can really predict the muscle behavior. In this case, to look at the muscle length change during the different oral task. And also this multi-scale model can predict the overall joint reaction force and the muscle force in each individual TMJ muscles. So clearly we can look at the muscle actually in a force and in these two subjects, it's clearly it's different. So why it's different? So we further look at on how these morphological variations impact the mechanics. So here we clearly shows the female TMJ, normally they have the larger joint reaction force and the muscle force. This is mainly due to the morphological difference. In this case, it's a small mandible lens and a small conducts that create a large force in the TMJ. So that means we use this model to establish relationship between the anatomy and the mechanics. And also using this modeling approach, we can have the direct clinical impact. So use the model, we predict the pre-op and the post-op for the craniofacial deformity patients. And when they manipulate the manipulative lens, how I'm gonna change the joint reaction force and the muscle force. Here clearly shows when you have the surgery, you restore the, uh, the occlusion patterns and you achieve the uh, in a normal occlusion pattern, but at the same time, they also change the joint force and the muscle force. The, in this case, specifically, the muscle force is increased. So there's a indicate there are some risks that you cause the increase the muscle activity after the surgery. And we also know the different oral behavior when it determine the different TMG mechanics. It's how we want to quantify the oral behavior in the natural environment. So this is a very challenging task because the lab recording to determine auto task and behavior mechanics is different from the natural environment. So here we use the example, we use the portable EMG recorder to record EMG and then use the pattern recognition algorithm. In this case, we can use all different variety of AI algorithm to do the event detections. So eventually, so we record the the EMG signal during the sleep in the natural environment and use the algorithm we detect in a, during the sleep in the pain group. So the patient does have a, a upregulated muscle activities specifically. So they clench more and their clench magnitude is high. So that means actually, so we can really predict the muscle activity 
uh, in the natural environment. So unfortunately, those kind of portable devices are still very uncomfortable. So now actually the smart sensor has been incorporated into these systems. So direct match the you know, auto behaviors. So, so we, after we determine the overall at the joint level, the mechanical force, so we can use this information and combine with the tissue property and the cellular property we obtained. Uh, so we can input into a so-called metaphysic finite model to predict the mechanical, electrical, chemical, and biological events within the TMJ tissues. So before we talk about this specific model, so I would like to emphasize on the tissue structure and the material properties. So for the muscular skeletal tissues, they have the well-organized tissue structures. So that's why they normally can exhibit uh, the anisotropic mechanical properties. So here we focus on the different technique to look at the inhomogeneity and anisotropic bit of the tissue mechanical properties. So besides using the you know, non-invasive other non so imaging models, we use the optical imaging technique, so-called second harmonic generations, to establish the structure function relationships for the mechanical properties. And also, we are looking at the transport properties. So those properties receive the much less attention uh, in the studies. So uh, uh, beyond the MR technique, we look at the water diffusion tensor. We use the optical imaging approach in this case, we develop a 3D uh, frag technique, look at the diffusion property uh, for the variety of different biomolecules. So we use these material properties, actually can, and the cellular properties we measure, we can input it into this metaphysic finite animal model to predict the mechanical signals. So here you clearly see, can see the mechanical stress in the TMJ disc uh, is high in the a female group that explains, you know, so those mechanical work deposited into the TMG disc in the female group, they're going to really raise the risk uh, to the female group actually to develop uh, TMG symptoms. So not only the mechanical signals, this model also can predict uh, the chemical environment and the biological signals. Here we demonstrate, so this model can predict the glucose lactate oxygen uh, concentrations within the connective tissues. And using this data as well can predict the cell viability in those tissues. And here actually on the right panel, actually you can clearly see in the TMB group. So the cell viability and nutrient availability is really compromised compared to the healthy groups. So overall actually, so we demonstrated using this multi-scale approach and modeling approach, we can really integrate those different modality of the measurements and be able to predict, make the patient specific predictions for the mechanical signal, chemical signal, electrical signal, and the biological response. So right now, actually, so we are moving forward in the 2020 for the TMJ studies. Actually, for the most recent actually, you know, study paradigms actually has been laid out in this most recent you know, TMD study report from the National Academy uh, this year. So in wrapping up, actually, so we demonstrate this multi-scale modeling approach is very powerful and can be applied you know, to the myofacial pain syndrome studies. And so the main concept is try to integrate those four clusters of the measurement maybe beyond, we also can incorporate the behavior and the genetics components actually into this metaphysic modeling. And eventually we'll be able to do the patient specific predictions to facilitate the diagnosis and as evaluate the risk and the progression. And also we can have the impact uh, to refine the treatment planning and uh, to assess the clinical outcomes. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Yao. Thank you to all the speakers for their excellent presentations in this session. I'm going to hand it over to my colleague now, Dr. Teresa Cruz, who will lead the panelist comment and panelist discussion session. Thank you. Thank you, Yolanda, and thank you to all the speakers. Um, I heard a lot of great things that can be brought to bear uh, in, our, in our new toolbox for uh, myofacial pain syndrome. Um, from the, looking at time course to new ways to do segmentation, 
uh, the, uh, the agent-based model seemed particularly relevant, um, as well as um, the, the models to predict uh, muscle forces. So thank you all. Um, I think we have a lot to discuss. Uh, our first panelist is Lucia Sevedanes from the University of Michigan. Lucia, would you like to share or would you just like to speak? <laughs> Can you unmute yourself? Yes, I will share my screen. Great, thank you. And oops, if it's unfreezes, sorry for that. Um, thank you so much for participating in this workshop that has been fascinating. And um, starting from the discussions yesterday, I actually really like Sylvia's question yesterday of um, you know drawing a line between degenerative conditions, inflammatory processes, and our understanding of all of these different conditions. Um, I haven't done work on myofascial pain uh, specifically, uh, but my work uh, that we have been fortunate to be funded by NIDCR is on osteoarthritis of the temporomandibular joint. And we have used data science approaches for modeling and predicting uh, osteoarthritis of the temporomandibular joint. Uh, I have adapted this figure that was published in a paper in, 2000, in May 2020, led by Dr. Bianchi, uh, where our approaches go from data capture, right? And I actually adapted here because biological markers uh, would be detecting the alterations in metabolism. The imaging that we have done in our work is structural, but I absolutely agree with what has been discussed in this workshop in terms of mechanic needs for mechanical and physiological imaging assessments. The challenges for the TMJ is the protocols for, because it's such a small joint in terms of my field um, of interest, uh, and that imaging protocols, for example, with MRI or MRI elastography or ultrasound are very challenges to image this is this is small joint. And of course, um, the importance of all of the very careful and thorough uh, clinical information from the patients uh, to combine all of these markers. Uh, we have used secure web data managed systems with de-identified data to then look at different uh, modeling approaches. And Dr. Hall was talking that about his multi-physical approach being with finite element modeling. We have actually tested a number of different uh, modeling approaches uh, from the models that we have tested up to now. We tested uh, conventional statistical models with different uh, deep learning approaches here, mentioning two of them like GBM and XGBoost uh, to look at the selection of the markers in the interactions between of these markers of the conditions uh, to then come up uh, with a model of osteoarthritis of the TMJ to, to help clinicians in decision making. Um, this, is, this has been done for baseline data, uh, but we also have to address challenges related to the use of data-driven tools for this decision-making in terms of a longitudinal follow-up, because what's important for us is uh, do these models uh, improve clinical diagnosis and they can be predictive of disease progression. So this is, these are just surrogate markers that we still need to be tested and work that is still uh, needs to carry out and just some of the performance uh, comparison of different uh, approaches that uh, we are proposing to test uh, in our work. And this work will not be possible without uh, the team of our colleagues. I'm a clinician as a background and we have an amazing group of uh, computer scientists that have worked together with clinicians uh, to make this work possible. Thanks so much. Thank you, Lucia. Uh, now I'd like to have Adam Hantman from HH. MI Genelia Research Campus. Hi, um, can you see my screen? Yes, thank you, Adam. So uh, I like to start off with my first disclosure, which is I have almost no idea what I'm talking about in this field. Um, it's not quite true. Uh, 
I did actually do my PhD with Ed Pearl, studying nociceptive processing and superficial dorsal horn. But for the last couple of decades now, I've been really focusing on motor control and really I'm a systems neuroscientist and I'm trying to understand how the nervous system produces patterns of activity that guide movements. But we also have a strong uh, interest in how feedback actually regulates um, that motor control process. And so we're actually thinking now about potential overlap between nociceptive signaling and motor control. So a potential convergence in which this field might be really um, of quite uh, good interest. <clears throat> but I've been listening to these talks for the last uh, day and a half now, as much as I can. Um, and, and I find it really interesting. There seems to be a real wealth of data being collected. And it seems like uh, it's a real opportunity since you have such multimodal data and so rich of information on the clinical side and on the basic science side of really potentially putting together um, databases, large databases of all this rich data. I was wondering as a question to the field on how much effort is being put on there because I think the sort of artificial intelligence uh, community is doing great, uh, making great strides and trying to process these kinds of large data sets of very complex phenomenon, which I think by myofascial uh, myofascial pain is an example of, and I was wondering what that um, field looks like right now for you, for for you guys. But one thing that seems to be lacking, well, we've heard a little bit about it today, is really also incorporating behavior data. Um, you know, I think behavior will be a good readout of uh, pain syndromes, and it seems like there's some work going on now on incorporating those in, the, in this painful. Um, in, in this pain field on the, in this kind of data. And I just wanted to make the point that like in the system neuroscience field, we've had a real revolution over the last couple of years in annotating behavioral data just on video. And I'm showing that here in this screenshot of work that we've done to annotate different steps of the behavior and tracking in a markerless fashion, the movements. And I think it really suggests a rebirth of this kind of behaviorism and potentially its role in these big data sets that can be mined by our, the artificial intelligence communities. Of course, a big plug for anyone who's going to go beyond video and really get assessment of the muscle activity um, by imaging. Thanks. Thank you, Adam. Next, we have uh, Lala Mulageta, who is the founder of In Silico Labs, as well as the founder of Metalist Performance. Uh, if you'd like to share your screen. Thank you for that kind introduction. Um, see here. All right, I have a video. Hopefully it works. Um, this was kind of last minute, um, and I'm very grateful that you accommodated this. Um, basically, my, my work uh, prior to uh, my two companies, I was at NASA where I was doing, uh, I was basically uh, a lead scientist there where I looked at uh, integrating various computational methods to predict and assess um, space flight risks and design therapeutic for those risks, to put it uh, uh, in, in brief. And since I started uh, Metalist Performance and Insilico Labs, I've been basically using those same methodologies and also my uh, personal interest in peak performance, uh, whether it's for athletes or tactical operators, um, even executives. This is both from the uh, uh, mental and as well as the uh, physical performance aspects. So, and I've been working a lot with uh, tactical operators like SWAT, special operations, military, and so forth. And typically I deal with healthy population. One of my clients who was actually paralyzed uh, during um, uh, an operation that went wrong, uh, he, he was a SWAT and uh, narcotics operator. Uh, basically he became paralyzed from the neck down. He was in, in a rehab hospital for uh, nine months or so. And during that time, he had a very, he was very frustrated. Like this, this was a guy who was very high performing. And now he's reduced to not being able to perform tasks for himself. And he reached out to me and said, hey, can you, can you help me? So what I did was I basically took what I would normally use for high, high performance individuals and looked at it as if, you know, taking somebody who was sedentary and then taking them to a peak performance stage where I used my integrative computational uh, background as well as uh, the myofascial techniques that I've been studying and applying and uh, also modifying over the years to help my clients reach peak performance. And this base, this video 
basically shows a summary. Um, can you guys see the video right now? Yes, we can. Okay, so as you can see, he can't pick up the the tennis ball. This is basically how how much disuse, like the loss of his uh, finger dexterity, he would lost. And effectively, what I did was I through a hypothesis methodology, I basically uh, looked at I, I hypothesized basically he had shortening of sarcomeres in certain areas and elongation in others. And that was basically uh, debilitating his ability to actually uh, move his fingers and also fa fascial distortion across. If, uh, and basically I use various release techniques. And typically what I do is I teach people how to do this rather than me doing it for them. Uh, but in this case, obviously he can't do it for himself. So as you can see here within uh, the first 66 minutes, he was able to pick up the tennis ball. This is after nine months of actually using regular rehab. He wasn't able to achieve that in a very short period of time by using the integrative approach, both from the computational side and also from the um, uh, physical manipulation side of things from my fascial techniques. I was able to help him not just being able to pick up the ball, but also uh, pass the ball back and forth. Now the question is, the, the real test is, can this be sustained? So as you can see, you'll see from the next video that, so I, I basically have him repeat it over and over and let me just. Hello. Yeah. In the keep it going side. So thank you so much. Um, I think it was really important that we have an example of a clinical application um, and, yeah. and translation. Thank you. Um, mm -hmm. Final panelist is uh, Thomas Myers from University of Rochester. Dr. Myers, you're still muted. So you'll need to unmute. Okay, sorry. Can you guys hear me? I've been staring at the unmute button ready to go. Okay. Can yes. you hear me? All right. Yeah. So, yeah, as, as a clinician, um, primarily, um, I, I found all this stuff very interesting. And, and so um, I would assume that most of the attendees maybe don't have a strong background in artificial intelligence. And, and, and I think getting to the uh, question before about how PTs and OTs and speech language therapists may kind of tie all this together, the 20,000 foot view, and I don't want to use a lot of big words about AI or ML or anything. There's basically three types of data that we've talked about, mostly clinical data in, in the realm of like um, imaging and things like that. But there's also demographic data that we can collect on patients, the imaging data that we've kind of talked about. And then most excitingly, um, more recently, the, the what we call RPMs or remote patient monitoring data. And we've, we've touched on some of that a little bit today. There's been some examples but as it applies to myofascial pain, I mean, this could be EEGs, this could be EKGs, EMGs, surface temperature probes, transcutaneous oxygen measuring devices, or P like whatever technology, pH measuring devices, whatever we can uh, come up with. And then once we, we have that kind of data, the way that machine learning and, and artificial intelligence and just ignore these um, these labels here, because this is for a total hip arthroplasty model, but this is kind of like inside the machine, how this is going to work. These are the potential data inputs for myofascial pain syndrome and how artificial intelligence can possibly help us in the clinical realm is that once we, the way AI, AI and ML work is, is that it, fundamentally the question is when I'm presented with a set of characteristics or patterns, how do I make sense of it? How should I label it? That, that's kind of what artificial intelligence is versus traditional statistics is more like when I, when I see a phenomenon, what are the odds that this occurred by chance? So it asks kind of fundamentally two different questions. Um, but the potential data inputs from the, the famous slide at this point could be the chronicity of symptoms, the triggers, a lot of the demographic things, a lot of the elastography type of uh, either MR or ultrasound pH levels. However, we want to collect that. And then the, the algorithm is, or is going to weight these things in ways that aren't constrained by um, usual human logic. You know, it's going to make connections in ways, as long as you define the outcome and you're very specific about what it is you're trying to define because the algorithm is just going to slot things. 
um, either diagnostic. Which, so we have to be clear about what myofascial pain syndrome is and probably even more importantly, what it isn't because that's what the machine is gonna be trained based on in, in a very, I'm taking a lot of liberties here, but, or it could be end up being diagnostic subtypes. It could be myofascial pain syndrome types one through 20 if we end up getting there. Or you could slot it to predict treatments, um, clinical trials that may be available, or even um, for clinicians in real time, um, prognostic and predictive um, um, things that we can use in consultation with patients. Um, we kind of worked on a little bit of a model like that here and because uh, it's very powerful to have some graphs and charts sitting in front of a patient with chronic pain or, or myofascial pain and say, okay, well, based on the last 100,000 people that have looked like you, here's what they can expect um, if you you know, lose 50 pounds or control your sugars or whatever these variables that we end up figuring out, you know, or engage in 30 minutes of exercise five times a week. Here's how it could change your outcome scores. But somebody touched on recently, we also haven't talked about the, the psychological. So there's things like patient activation measures. They're going to be huge um, predictors, I think. And, and a patient activation measure is a quantifiable outcome score that predicts patients' abilities to have knowledge, skill, and um, like the um, confidence in managing their own conditions, medical conditions, and, and eventually their wellness. And so health and wellness are two different things probably, but it's gonna be most important for us to make sure, and it's been touched on that, that whatever we pick as measures are valid, accurate, precise, reliable, and eventually cost-effective, you know, cause it's hard to deliver it to the, to the masses and to 30 to 80% of the people that suffer to, from myofascial pain syndrome if it's not cost-effective. And other things that like AI could touch on are, are, are natural language processing, like how do patients talk about their pain? Um, we could use intonation and inflections, like when people use uh, catastrophizing um, adjectives to describe their pain. So a lot of that could be another node in the, um, the predictive model. Thanks. Dr. Myers, thank you. Um, yeah. We are about 15 minutes behind and I know everyone wants to eat lunch. So um, I'm going to say we're going to spend maybe the next 20 minutes on the panel session and then 10 minutes on questions and answers uh, from the attendees, if everyone's okay with that plan. And I've got the mute button, so I'll assume you're all okay with it. Um, so um, Dr. Myers, you had a question for uh, Dr. Lutz. Would you like to start? And if the other panelists could use their little blue hands to uh, let me know if you have a question to follow up. Thank you. Yeah, oh, yeah, about the astronauts. I mean, was there any, um, so you could get osteopenia, osteoporosis from being non-weight bearing. Um, did we account for any of, of that as a, as a pain, as a, as a possible pain um, driving um, source or pain, you know, for the, um, for creating the pain? What we're, what we're yeah. attributing to low back pain could be, you know, bone pain. Right, yeah, there, yeah, I think a, a, a a finding that uh, was important was looking at their imaging pre and post flight, looking for evidence of uh, vertebral damage. So uh, end plate irregularities, end plate damage. Uh, there were associations between those patients that had kind of the most pre-flight damage, uh, changes of damage during flight, and then these um, the influence of the muscle changes I noted. So that is an important factor. But any bone density, like specific bone density? No, we didn't include bone density as a measure in this particular study. Okay. Uh, is Sergio Sanabria on? There was a, a good discussion going on in the chat box that I thought maybe we could yeah, bring up. But I, uh, yes. Thank you. Uh, we were uh, addressing the question about uh, we have on one side uh, computational modeling and on the other side we have uh, artificial intelligence, machine learning. Both approaches uh, seem to be very powerful in summarizing data, extracting relations and conclusions. For me, the question was a little bit about interaction between these two disciplines. Can they progress together? They are competitive approaches. And uh, Sarmila Mahundar already gave some inputs, but uh, is somebody else as well having other ideas?
I think I saw, Teresa, that Sharmila was uh, responding to Sergio's comments. Um, did you want? Yes, I was looking for my mute button. Sorry. Sharmila, would you like to uh, address it first and then Sylvia? OK, I could definitely do that. Um, I basically feel that uh, AI can be used to actually derive a lot of the metrics from images, sensors, whatever it is that you're doing very rapidly and in a potentially in a standardized way, especially when it comes to things like segmentation and image grading and extracting the metrics, which are all absolutely essential to go into these models. So from that perspective, it could, it could speed up the physics-based models. So that was what my intent. But the second thing that it could also do is exactly what uh, Thomas Myers was referring to, that you actually could be taking not derived models, but all the data all the images and do a purely data-driven model of those who respond to therapy or those who have pain or different types of myofascial pain, one, two, three, four, whatever it is, you could do that too. That's more of a black box approach, but the advantage is if you have a lot of data and you look at the output from AI models, you get saliency maps, which show what are the features the algorithm is really looking at to come to that conclusion. That in itself could direct potentially new features which could then be put into the physics-based models. So I think they're ex extremely complementary at the point that where we are, we don't have a preferred model. I think they both will give us different things. Thank you. Can I talk? Yes. Yeah. Go ahead, Sylvia. Yeah, I just wanted to echo uh, what Sharmila said. Totally, I think they're very complementary. And the example she gave uh, that. Um, machine learning type approaches can be used to kind of take distill large data sets like MRI to the information we need for a model for sure. And we actually do exactly that as well, because uh, like she said, for example, you know, inputs to our model are segmentation of, of muscles and that takes uh, a lot of, lot of time. So uh, algorithms that allow us to extract the data we need for models are super valuable. Um, the other piece that uh, we have been, um, thinking about and working towards is also, um, you know, many times in our models, you have a set of rules or parameters that are very understood or well understood, but then there's also sets of parameters that are more uncertain, the same things like that haven't been directly measured. So um, we can use uh, machine learning approaches actually to identify what are the optimal parameters that give us uh, predictions that make sense or that are consistent with observations. Um, so we're, um, we've been exploring in that direction too. So it's sort of like the, the kind of um, uh, optimizing the physics-based model, but ultimately they give you very complementary things. And, and I think really, I, I see them as more of a continuum really uh, between the data-driven and a physics-based model. There really is a continuum between them. And I think they're both important. Thank you. Uh, Lucia, you're, you're at the top of my list with a blue hand. And lower my hand now, right? Okay. Oh, you had lowered my hand already. Oh, no, yeah. Here you go. Uh, so just as a follow-up for that, and maybe Dr. Howe or um, Dr. Blanker could also address that uh, from the point of view of assuming properties and the information that we don't have for patients, for example, as finite modeling does, element modeling does, um, how can it really advance the field? Um, I think the beauty of the machine learning approaches is, is combining this information and even coming up uh, with challenges uh, in something we have been working on, uh, starting to work on, on privilege information. Uh, if some type of information is missing, is there a risk that we are assuming properties and really not making our diagnostic assessments better? in the computational physics models. Would anyone like to respond? I can answer that, but I don't want to take, um, hi, do you want to, Dr. Yao, do you want to go first? <laughs> uh, <laughs> thank you. So uh, uh, yes, exactly, actually. So um, so using the, you know, realistic material property, for example, is so critical for the, you know, the physical models. So you're right, actually, so a lot of time, actually, so we lack of this kind of, you know, property, especially for the human, you know, tissues. And we probably can use this kind of approach, basically, to look at how the sensitivity, you know, if you have this kind of range of the material property, how it going to impact your model predictions. 
Uh, so those kind of, you know, the optimization. So we can, for example, we can use, you know, this, uh, you know, the uh, AI algorithm to, you know, to further refine, just like, uh, you know, Sylvia actually mentioned, how we gonna refine those kind of models. Uh, some property could be very sensitive, some maybe not. And, uh, but the bottom line is here is, yes, we want to provide actually this kind of more realistic, you know, material properties. And the other things that actually relate to this, uh, you know, the, the, this, uh, you know, AI based, you know, and also the physical model things, you know, I think Dr. Meyer and uh, Dr. Uh, Hentman so all touched that actually, for example, to look at the patient behavior. So, uh, so for, you know, for, from my presentation, we talk about to look at oral behavior based on EMG signals. So it's a tons of recording the data, you know, but how can they really detect those kind of specific events and, uh, you know, oral uh, behavior. So, uh, so this is the, in this case, for example, this kind of, you know, the, the algorithm and the uh, pattern recognition algorithm really helps. So I would say this, you know, AI and the physical modeling, that's a complement each other, you know, I echo Lucia's point, you know, so they have to support each other. So I don't think it's one better than the other, yes. Yeah, Thank and you. I'll just uh, follow that on by saying, um, yes, the, you know, model validity is sort of the, the thing that we talk, we think about we, uh, when we wake up in the middle of the night, what we worry about is the thing we think about in the morning, the middle of the day and the night. <laughs> um, I would say, um, you know, one of the things that really excites me is the fact that number one, there's all these really fantastic new imaging approaches that can actually provide that input that we need, like patient specific input. Plus these machine learning algorithms are allowing us to extract it quickly. So I feel like um, we're, uh, we're nearing a point in time where we actually may be able to create person-specific models that allow us to really explore um, uh, you know, potential therapies on a, on a given person. I'm, I probably wouldn't have said that 10 years ago, but we're getting to that point. I mean, I think the physics models really do uh, provide, I think obviously um, in the context of how valid they are, there's the opportunity to predict things that aren't, haven't been done, like a treatment. Like if you do this treatment, what do you, what does the model think will happen? Um, it's harder to do that with a data-driven model because it's really as good as the data that came in. So it's harder to do those um, predictive non, you know, things that have been observed. And obviously they have to be um, validated, but I think, um, we're kind of getting to the point where we may be able to get there. And I think as a field, we need to really challenge that. I mean, one of the things that, you know, in the lower extremity uh, uh, biomechanics field that we've sort of maybe I would say suffered from is the fact that the lower extremity model that we've used over time, everybody uses the same model, the same kind of man, <laughs> maybe incorporating some other data and really needing to push the envelope forward and making, and, uh, having models that capture the variability in the population and maybe at least of men and women, of males and females at least, but also thinking about racial differences and, and making sure our models are capturing um, the real uh, diversity of people, I think are really important. But I think once we've been doing that, then I think they're really um, uh, gonna, gonna have a, a lot of power providing insight Thank you. Can I, do, um, can I just uh, follow up? On, oh. Can I just follow up on Sylvia's point? Because I think it's it's really, I agree with almost every part of that. Um, I think, and I one of the things I think is really important data going in, getting that you could even, even decide engineering the data coming in to, to actually be informative of that. And, but it really requires a, you know, having done machine learning now for, for quite some time on the sort of practical side, it requires really sort of well thought out data in kind of uh, structure. And I just wonder, given the prevalence of painful situations in the, in the world and given all the great clinical work that's being done, is there actually efforts to combine all these imaging methods with behavioral data, with all the modalities and bring it in in some sort of data pipeline that you can actually mine in a very, very powerful way or is it just coming in haphazardly? Because I think our experience with the stuff we've been doing is that that actually is the most limiting uh, aspect of this. So, so I would say there are efforts in certain areas, um, particularly like backpack and and pulling in a lot of that multi-factorial um, data to to low back pain. 
Um, I don't think we have that in um, myofascial pain, however. Uh, so that is that is something we can consider going forward. I do, yeah. totally agree with that. I think that would be incredibly valuable to really think about how to bring all the data together into a common source. And you can even do cool things like a, uh, we call them challenges in, in other areas where if you have if you, you give the field a whole bunch of data and they have to predict a different set based on that data, um, that actually gives them an enthusiasm for people to like mine it and figure out what they can eke and squeeze out of it. So it'd be cool to have an initiative like that. So this is Yolanda. Just to echo what Teresa mentioned, there are some ongoing efforts through the HEAL initiative to create data repositories and, diver and collect diversity of data from across studies that are being funded through the HEAL initiative. Yeah, I mean, I can speak to that. I was going to kind of piggyback off of that. There's, there's nothing to the degree that I think Adam really has in mind or that we need you know, I mean, like you said, it, it's going to be quality data, and that's notoriously hard to get in medicine. And then you have the different vendors like Epic. A lot of major medical centers use Epic. Some use GB Cerner. They don't talk with each other. The quality of the data is all over the place, you know. And, and even if you have Epic, Epic is, has been billed as like a uh, maybe a registry. But it, if you try to ever get data out of Epic, it's incredibly difficult. It's, I mean... <laughs> There are people that can do it, but there's not even a great program that like floats above Epic that I'm aware of that, that knows how to extract it because the data fields are all over the and the clarity reports. If you try to, you know, it just, it's a mess basically. So that's going to be our biggest challenge on the clinical data side. Can I piggyback one little idea? I mean, like we have the same problem in the uh, single cell sequencing world where we have many different platforms that are creating many different qualities of different degrees of quality of sequencing data. And actually there's some really exciting work going on right now about taking data of all sort of different varieties and qualities and actually leveraging that to actually find the things that are robust to the methods. Uh, and in the sequencing world, that's a really exciting field that you could imagine. And I'm not a clinician, but I, think, I don't know what the real nature of the data is, but it seems like that could be a, a robust thing going forward. And I just think like the ideas of having these platforms where you're gonna ask people to take the same kinds of data, even if there were different machines and things and the same kinds of behavioral data, it, it could be, you could actually leverage those things. Yeah, Cause we're looking yeah. at like the statewide databases like New York state's got um, one that captures all inpatient and outpatient data, you know, because there's practice patterns differ between the Northeast and California and populations and all that kind of stuff. So even the large nationwide registries like the um, I mean, the NISQIP database, when people try to apply machine learning techniques to it, it's just not granular enough. The data doesn't represent yeah. clinical practice. And, and it, unfortunately, it represents billing practices probably more than anything. I, I could probably build a database that tells you how much I'm going to bill for something, you know, because that's the game right now, right? It's not about patient care. It's about, you know, coders going in on the back end and adjusting charges and things like that. So a lot of the codes and things that are in at least databases don't reflect clinical care. It's a mess. Can I just respond to the Adam's uh, issue? Uh, I think a similar data harmonization effort is also going on in the imaging world to make it vendor neutral. In imaging, you basically can calculate a parameter, but the upgrade that comes six months, the better, bigger machine will completely change that. So baseline and follow-ups are different. And for people who are just using imaging off the cuff without actually following any of that, it has been very, very difficult to implement. And I think that becomes the issue. So I think there's a lot of effort towards the image data harmonization in a very similar way, not correcting with physics or not correcting with the knowledge, but just ut utilizing that data. And the other thing is, even when you look at a radiology report, I cannot agree with Th Th Thomas Myers anymore than just simply just clap a hundred times. The reports in the, uh, that you have are somewhat, somewhat standardized in radiology for imaging, but it is varies from institution to institution and actually sometimes from radiologist to radiologist. What we find is if a neuroradiologist grades something in the spine, it's very different than a musculoskeletal radiologist. So there's a lot of non-standardized data, but I think efforts are being made and I think in time we will probably resolve it. 
And we've got time for one more panel question. And I believe one of our organizers wanted to ask it. Uh, when? Okay, thank you, Teresa. I was trying to wait for my turn, but thank you for letting me jump in. Um, I have a question about the timing of incorporating the expertise of the AI and modeling. As you all know from the workshop so far that we have not collected a lot of the myofascial tissue data yet. So we are at this really unique time to either incorporate experts from the AI field and the modeling, modeling scan modeling field early and, and to ensure maybe some proper development that will enable such, or maybe, or maybe you would like to wait until such data developed and then do such modeling. So I am very curious to your thoughts about the timing. When is the bedtime for the modelers and, 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 um, and the AI experts to me? I can kind of speak to that because I wrote a paper about just a general review. So it gets into, and this would be a good, there is no government. So let's, let's pretend for a second, we created a big data repository, like who's going to protect that data kind of a thing. And because it gets into HIPAA laws and all that kind of stuff. And so do you, there's no government agency that kind of, oh, there's no agency that over, and I'm not saying we need a government to do like whatever, but there's no agency that oversees all this data to standardize it and clean it and protect it. But then it's like all of the innovation and technology, like do we develop rules that could hamper the technology that innovates the, the, the abilities for us to come up with new solutions to things? Like if we come up with a bunch of rules that do that, it's gonna hamper the innovation or do we wait till we have all of the data collected and then decide what to do with it? But you know, that then, then we open ourselves up to having you know, a different set of problems, which include, um, you know, potential data theft and, and things like that. It's always easier to break a system than to protect it kind of a thing. And, and so we have to decide what we're willing to tolerate as far as risk. Like, do we create rules that constrain innovation or do we collect the data first and decide what to do with it later? If that makes any sense. Can I, can I jump in in this discussion? Sure. Yeah, so, uh, and, and I missed some of the earlier discussions. Sorry, I had to to go to go away. But I'm very much interested in the issue of data sharing and data repositories, uh, and it is something that I'm passionate about. Uh, we have been uh, essentially putting all of our brain imaging data after every paper is published in a public repository. People have been using them. We put no restriction on how we, how they are used, and in fact, you know, there's good science coming out of it. Unfortunately, I think my lab remains the only place where such practice is actually happening. Uh, and of course, without shared data, we will never really integrate information into something more coherent. Um, and uh, in, in, in principle, NIH poses all these you know, requirements of data sharing, but none of this is really practically implemented or, uh, you know, uh, available out there. So data availability itself is a fundamental issue, especially in pain research, in fact, I think. You know, for example, if you take the example of other groups, for example, the Alzheimer group, they have created a database that's, that's been enormously helpful, that hundreds and hundreds of papers have been published simply by sharing data from many, many different labs. We are very far away from anything of the sort. I agree with you, but there are some other repositories in MSK. The OAI initiative, which was done with four centers, has really served us well. And from that experience, the one thing I would say is from the legalistic point of view as to how you protect the data, et cetera, it's, that is a question. but. The other question is that the design of the data collection and the kind of data, the way you want to curate it, et cetera, I think it's better to get involved in the beginning because otherwise later on, you're doing way more work in trying to clean out that data and make it shareable. At least that's my thinking. Yeah, if I could just jump in real quick here. Um, so this topic in terms of uh, data sharing and model sharing and so forth, is heavily discussed within the interagency modeling analysis group and the multi-scale uh, modeling consortium, which uh, 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 Sylvia uh, mentioned earlier. Um, 
and I'm heavily involved with that as well. In fact, uh, one of the working groups called the uh, uh, Committee on Credible Practice Modeling Simulation in Healthcare. These, this is one of the things that we've actually been uh, tackling th uh, by developing uh, rules and guidelines on how to actually develop models and uh, so that they're um, credible, so to speak, and also they're disseminated appropriately, basically a methodology. So this is a challenge definitely many different groups are trying to grapple with, and it might be worthwhile to actually reach out to the IMAG uh, to actually understand how they're being, it's being tackled. And, and I know NIBIB is, uh, I, I think, a co-organizer of this meeting. So I think there's a potential for collab cross collaboration there to try and solve this issue for myofascial uh, pain uh, research. Yeah, I mean, if that could be something that comes out of the meeting, that would be huge. Yeah, we have a whole session on it at the next meeting. I'm co-organizing it at the next okay. IMAG meeting. <laughs> can, can I add something here? Yeah. Okay, well, last last word. Ooh, oh, is Catherine okay. off? Well, we only have seven minutes left for question and answer. So if, if, if it can be brief, uh, but I do want to try and get some questions in from our audience if we can. Okay, so yeah, so I agree with you. actually, you know, so this kind of data uh, collection design better to start in the beginning actually so and also bring the people from the you know physical modeling people and with the you know the machine learning people together so uh from the physical modeling perspective i say so because they establish a very definite relationship between all the different parameters because it's a very e much easier to understand the mechanism how they relate to each other so so then we can provide actually so those kind of what's the important parameters and also look at the machine learning and see if it's possible by collecting those data, be able to dig into the data and get those kind of meaningful data out, parameter out. So that's why I would suggest actually if we can do it from the beginning to do this data collection from both side expertise, that would be the great. Yeah. Teresa, are you ready for me to do some questions from the audience? You do. All right, thank you. So, um, so we've got about, uh, we've posted some questions into the chat. Again, just letting the Zoom attendees know that if somebody does want to raise a hand from the attendee pool to ask their question directly, they are welcome to do that. And I can try and give you audio uh, to do so. Let's start with this question. Um, this was originally actually posed in session four, but uh, we moved it here because the question is for early diagnosis of causes of myofascial pain, how promising do you consider myometric devices looking at soft biological tissues? Um, examination of an early model of myometric devices in zero gravity conditions was successful. So who do you think, Teresa, might want to tackle that question? Who would like to take that? Maybe Dr. Lotz? Um. Yeah, I haven't, actually, I don't have uh, any experience with that, so I I can't. Uh, okay. Can't Is there anybody question. who can address that? Okay. So I think what we can do, um, if nobody's going to jump to that one quickly, is we can hang on to that one and see if we can address it at a later time. So let's move to the next question we received. In addition to, and these are posted in the chat, if you would like to follow along, uh, Ben Neal posted them in the chat for all panelists at 12.45. Um, in addition to anatomy of multifid eye anatomy assessment, we need information with regard to neuromotor control, as I believe injured multifid eye are associated with loss of proprioception and sequencing of motor firing, including co-contraction, with the transversus abdominis. Can motion models and EMG data, let me see here, I'm losing my question. Can motion models and EMG data be combined as there may be synergism in understanding an axial myofascial breakdown? So who is going to tackle that one? Teresa, that one's looking- He's ready, he, he knows. <laughs> Wanna okay. Your lips? okay. Dr. Lutz. Oh, sure. Yeah, well, I think, you know, from the physics-based models, you know, that there's intrinsic in those, um, you know, that the muscle forces have to balance out to create a, a uh, you know, a moment in the spine that's consistent with the movement that's being measured so that, 
there should be the ability to track asymmetry in model in muscle activation that um, arises from dysfunction of a particular muscle because the, you know, the forces and moments all have to balance out. So that should be an intrinsic prediction that some of these combined finite element uh, movement models generate. Can I make a quick comment? I mean, actually, this is something that we are directly involved in, which is um, not, not so much at the spinal level, but at um, more uh, central brain regions like the cortex of monitoring how these peripheral um, disturbances actually affect the motor plans. And at least in animal models and probably even in human models with EEG recordings, you can actually have a pretty good assessment about neuroactivity that's driving behaviors and how that's influenced by painful stimuli or other proprioceptive stimuli. Exactly, you know, I, I would say that the work in vivo, um, well controlled is still yet to be done though. Okay, thank you, Dr. Hanman and Dr. Lotz. I'm gonna look at this third question that's been posted. Um, this one says, does anyone who measures muscles look into differences between non-injured muscles in hypermobile patients versus quote unquote normal patients? People with benign hypermobility syndrome have a higher incidence of chronic pain than quote unquote normal people. My clinical experience is that a high percentage of myofascial pain patients have generalized hypermobility as well. So they're asking, you know, have you looked into those differences uh, between the hypermobile and quote unquote normal? Is there someone who would like to take this question? One of our clinicians like to take it, maybe Lala, uh, Dr. Myers. So the one thing I, I can say about that is um, uh, I would say that ob observation is accurate yeah. and um, aside from the fact that um, the methodologies that I've provided, it tends to be very good in helping them. Basically myofascial uh, release techniques have been, are generally very effective in um, actually addressing those pains uh, uh, or various types of uh, dysfunction that they're experiencing in conjunction with when it's actually, where I found it to be most effective is uh, uh, incorporating with exercise and also anti-inflammatory uh, nutrition. Okay. Great, thank you. Um, I will then go ahead and move to our fourth question that we have in here. Uh, the fourth question is, I have not heard any discussion about how to measure or visualize one of the primary components of myofascial pain, which is referred pain. It should be noted that uh, myofascial referred pain is not the same, although there may be overlap, as referred pain from nerve compression by disc or otherwise. The real question here, has there been any thoughts about this major myofascial pain feature? Who do you think Teresa should tackle this one? Referred pain. So, so I think that was intentionally not part of the, the scope of the, of the conference because it was considered so different. Um, would anyone like to address it? I think um, Dr. Can I make a small comment? That Please. I was gonna bring it up later. Uh, what struck me in one of the earliest presentations was the incredible innervation of the myofascia, of the fascia. I wasn't aware, it almost reminds me of periosteal uh, innervation. And if you're looking for a way to generate referred pain uh, that's coming from the fascia, having a huge, especially when I see now that the fascia has such a wide distribution, once it gets into the cord and starts connecting up, it's ideally situated to generate preferred pain, which really creates a problem in figuring out in the patient what the original source was in the first place. Thank you. Pain Thank is a product of nerves, not muscles. Right. So uh, so thank you, Dr. Bassbaum. And then we have a final question. If anybody, if everyone's willing for just another minute to, for, to answer this final question, then we can close and go to lunch. Dr. Langevin, are you okay with that? Just one final? Cool. Um, so this is addressed to Dr. Yao and others. We know from up-to-date science that there is no such thing as a muscle, but a myofascial unit. This myofascial unit is embedded within and, integrate and integrated with 
a larger web of tissue that flows from the top of the head to the bottom of the feet. Surely alignment of the DNJ as one example is influenced by fascial restrictions that can be located outside the cranium and down further in the trunk. Do you agree that this influence should make a difference in how you are measuring and viewing your outcomes and the source of pathologies? So Dr. Yao, do you want to start to tackle this in a minute or so? <laughs> <laughs> That's a very challenging question. Yeah, so honestly, first, you know, you know so uh, yeah, so, uh, uh, I, you know, I haven't been really looking into that part yet. So that's why my comments probably, you know, it's not gonna really, you know, uh, make any kind of sense here yet. So, uh, so this is the, uh, you know, always actually, so in the TMJ studies actually, so we always have this kind of, uh, uh, I don't know how that actually developed, you know, so one thing is the model look at the joint itself and other group of people look at the pain. And that's a gap there and how we're gonna bring these things together. So it's always very challenging. Maybe it's related to the other, this, you know, investigator actually their training background. So this is the current status actually for the TNV studies, you know, so pain people talking about the pain things and uh, uh, joint function, joint function, you know. Uh, so this is a very challenging thing. So our research try to, you know, bring this kind of gap right now and how that actually can happen. So, Right now, so my lab haven't reached to that point yet. So that's why, you know, I apologize, you know, I want to give the, you know, very kind of thoughtful actually kind of comments on that, but that's, you know, it's true. So this is that kind of gap there. I mean, I can probably speak quickly to that. I mean, when I used to be a physical therapist, I would treat PMJ. I mean, everybody would get postural exercises, strengthen the rhomboids, the trapezius to get, because when you slope forward, you get kyphotic, you have to extend the cervical spine, which then all the fascia and tissues in the extensor portion of your neck and stuff get tight. So, I mean, it's all interconnected, uh, if that answers the question at all. It's kind of I think. I think it helps answer, answer that question. So uh, thank you. I think uh, we've tackled what we can of the questions from our attendees and our video cast watchers. And, and so Teresa, and I know Dr. Vallejo needed to leave for another meeting, but Teresa, thank you very much for, I think a really wonderful session, session five and some fascinating discussion. So I think that brings us actually now to our lunchtime. Um, so, uh, and we're gonna be moving off into lunch. We're due to return at 2 p.m. sharp, um, where we're going to begin session six, which is gonna be a general discussion and trying to bring together many threads and themes from this wonderful two days of a meeting. And that is gonna be chaired by Dr. Wen Chen from NCCIH and Dr. Dina Fisher from NIDCR. So I'm gonna ask all of my panelists to go ahead and please mute and stop your video feed. And we hope you'll all go off and get a wonderful lunch and have some offline discussion. And in the meantime, I'll mute everything and we will head into our lunch break. Thank you so much. And Teresa, have a great lunch and we'll see you back for session six. Thank you, everyone. Doctors Chen and Fisher, please take us away in session six. All right. Um, Good afternoon for those of us uh, on the East Coast, and I think still good morning to those of you on the West Coast and good noon. Um, thank you for coming back to the last session of this mild fascia pain uh, heal workshop. And in this, um, just to remind everybody for this um, session, it's really a completely a panel discussion session. Um, so for the panelists, in the Zoom space, please mute yourself unless you're speaking. And um, you should have your video on if you are the panelist in this session. And if you have questions during the panel discussion time or you would like to make a comments, please raise your digital blue hand and wait until you're called. And I will uh, moderate the uh, panel panelist comment portion and uh, Dr. Dina Fisher uh, from NIDCR will introduce herself later and she will moderate the panel discussion. So we will start with our first panelist, uh, Dr. Alan Bassman from University of California, San Francisco. Each panelist will have about five minutes to make a, a summary comments. Alan. Well, thank you very much. I have to say I had, uh, I think a couple of people 
previously who were more in the pain field than in the uh, myofascial area or muscle echoed my feelings that I had no idea what to expect, um, but it's been incredible. Uh, I, I don't remember the last time I got up at 5.30 in the morning in order to uh, listen to a meeting, um, but it was worth it both days. Um, I'm, I'm sort of over, overwhelmed with the amount of data uh, and what is possible. I had no idea. Now, the real question, my perspective, I come from a pain world and my interest is in the relationship between uh, the changes that occur in a patient who's reporting pain and all of the observations that were made. And so my longstanding interest would be in trying to understand what is the precipitating factor that drives pain. Now, I'll, I'll tell a very quick anecdote, um, true story. I always tell the medical students, a couple of years ago, I had what was diagnosed as myofascial pain by an orthopedist. Um, I had everything lasted for about two months. It was miserable in my leg. Uh, and I can, I, when I teach about pain, I always say pain is in the brain. It's a percept. And my wife, who's not a scientist, um, understands that, has heard me lecture many times. Um, but I kept complaining about the pain in my leg, uh, around my knee and my thigh. And she said, why do you keep complaining about pain in your leg? Because... I thought pain was in the brain. Uh, but I think that really articulates the question at hand, is there are changes taking place in myofascia? And we heard about a million changes that take place and they're dramatic and, and this, the resolution is remarkable at the chemical level, at the uh, muscular level, at the question of dynamics. Um, but to me, my question is, what is actually causing the pain? Uh, and I. We don't have biomarkers for pain. I, 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 I listen and heard an unbelievable number of potential markers, but I don't know if any of them is a biomarker for pain. And one way I ask the question is, I'd be interested in longitudinal studies. Over time in a patient who presents initially and then it gets worse or it gets better spontaneously, kind of the, the work that uh, Vanya Apkarian has done longitudinally by monitoring brain activity. Uh, and then if you give a patient different analgesics or different approaches, whether it's physical therapy or needling or whatever it is, if the pain is resolved, what happens to that marker that you've been telling me about? Does it change? And in what direction does it change? So that's one question. If, if we're interested in diagnostics of myofascial pain. Now, what I saw were diagnostics of myofascial architecture and changes, nothing about pain. Then the other question I'm interested in is, and fascinated by was the innervation of the myofascia. That slide just really woke me up when I saw how innervated, it reminded me of studies from uh, bone, uh, from Pat Manti, who talked about innervation of bone, which had been largely ignored. Everyone talked about periosteum. And the question in bone cancer, what is causing the pain in bone cancer? I think it's somewhat analogous. Nerves receive inputs and they cause, they're the ones that eventually cause pain. So how does the, the, the muscle, the changes in the myofascia communicate with the nerve? And that's why I was interested in hearing Jordi Serra. Here's somebody who is literally recording from a single C fiber afferent. Now, whether he's, I don't know that he's specifically looked at a, a patient with myofascial pain, but he can do that. And therefore, you're in a position to really ask the question what is the communication between the changes that occur peripherally and the way the nervous system responds? And to what extent are these things predictive? Because if they're not, if the biomarker is not predictive, it's not very useful. So these are the types of questions I would like to see. And I would end by saying what was so dramatic about this meeting is the obvious need for integrating folks in the pain community with folks in the myofascial um, measurement in a global sense community. And I, I emphasize that when, when Vanya spoke about the need for or the uh, having databases that everyone uses, um, what I would say is the pain people will never go to those databases. Number one, they won't even know about them. And number two, when they do go to them, they won't understand them. Uh, so we need uh, 
integrated meetings. And I'll give you one example. Some of you may know about the former Dalem conferences that used to take place in Berlin um, before the wall came down. And it was 40 people who were brought together intentionally from different fields, who were stuck together in a room uh, for one whole week. And they basically taught one another. And they even wrote a book ahead of time, each wrote a chapter so that you could bring people sort of up to date. And it was an incredibly effective way to integrate what are obviously very disparate fields. But the bottom line is, how, does the change, how do the changes actually cause pain? Because the ultimate goal of HEAL is to get around the use of opioids and find new ways to treat. Uh, and I think that this meeting drove that, but we need to bring the pain folks into the field, into these questions. But I thought it was terrific. Thank you, Alan. Thank you very much. So. Um... Shall we move to the next panelist, uh, Dr. Christine Chong from University of California, San Diego. Christine? Hi, can you hear me and see my screen? Yes. Great. Um, so, uh, you know, I think I'm just gonna rip off a little bit of what Alan just said, you but perhaps- the Presentation mode if you can. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, but um, from the imaging standpoint, with regards to yeah. recapping, Sorry to interrupt you a bit, Christine. Can you, uh, I think you might want to um, swap, swap the display. It's right now in your notes. Okay, let's try it again. Sorry about that. <laughs> no problem. Let's try that. How's that? Better? It's still on, in your note. I think you just need to go up. Where, where is that to swap screen? Share screen. Share screen one. Share. There, how's that? Great. Okay, perfect. Um, so uh, discussing a little bit, um, backing away maybe from the granular, very detailed discussion that we had over the past two days, back to the idea of myofascial pain imaging and the traction that it has had generally. And I think part of the problem um, is, is, um, is expressed by some of these images I showed you yesterday. So from the standpoint of the general population with regard to imagers, when we think about pain in the musculoskeletal system, we're thinking about these acute structural changes. And when we move to, as shown in these two images in a person with a rectus abnormality, looking at the edema in the muscle, maybe not even focusing on the fascial margin so much, as we move towards more chronic findings, if we don't see edema, high signal intensity, we don't equate that with the patient's report of pain. But we know as we move to things like the muscle herniation that I showed yesterday in the lower images, the findings are very subtle. And so it's apparent that we're going to need to reset the way that we even evaluate the musculoskeletal tissues. This work from Jang Du and Graham Bitter historically that I was uh, very privileged to take part in really gives us an understanding of that concept that people mentioned today that the myofascial junction runs throughout the entire muscle. So a reset based on the application of novel imaging techniques to be able to really understand the structure that we're dealing with. And having said that, as we consider the the mandate, the call to look at tissue level measurement abnormalities that might be relevant to myofascial pain syndrome. And we look at the agenda, session two, session three, session four, gave us a variety of very, very sophisticated non-invasive tools to be able to assess the structure, the myofascial structure proper, and those ranged all the way from some standard imaging sequences, novel imaging sequences, ultrasound, um, PET, MR, all of them very compelling. But as we then try to put that into the context of how we need to apply those, I think that we have to remember that the true north
really has to be the presentation, as Alan pointed out, of myofascial pain. And I, I took a couple sets of images. This is from Dr. Sikdar's work he presented yesterday as well, that actually, from my standpoint as an imager, gave me something to aim for or target. This is maybe an image of myofascial pain, a trigger point that can be identified. This work taken from the literature recently using T2 mapping to show a myofascial trigger point. So at least now, from my standpoint as an imager, I have something to aim at, something to target that's associated from the imaging standpoint with the pain. And I think that Alan makes a great point, as do the rest of the clinicians here, that we really have to be sure that we're pointing these sophisticated tools at the right thing so that we have one global evaluation. And I think session five really spoke to that, the use of promising technologies to be able to then use AI and other similar tools to put the story together. And luckily we have people who are very well versed in this. Sharmella mentioned the OAI, that large data set that looks at clinical presentations as well as structural findings to be able to kind of put people in cohorts and tease out structural and functional as well findings non-invasively, and then to be able to correlate that with the picture of the pain component. So, I mean, I think that this workshop with all of these sessions really put us in just the right spot to be able to then move to the next step, which I think is what Alan was speaking to in his comments. So thank you very much for your attention. When you're muted right now, perfect. Thank you. Um, thank you, Christine, for that very thoughtful comments. Um, our third um, panelist originally was going to be uh, Dr. Bill Maxner from Duke. He is unfortunately unable to join us today. Um, so we're very uh, grateful that Dr. Kathleen Sluka from University of Iowa has agreed to participate as a panelist. So Kathleen, would you like to make some comments? Are you unmuted, I hope? I can't find my screen. You're good. You look good. You're okay. Are we unmuted? Yes, I took care okay. of that. Okay, thank you. Great. So I'm going to try and channel Bill a little bit, and I'll probably echo a little bit about what Alan says, but I think what came across over these last two days and um, all that we learned was that there's a lot of potential players in the generation of myofascial pain. But ultimately, we need to be determining what are those players and what are their role in generating a nociceptive signal at the level of pain. So I initially started out with a model that I had done before, you know, which included the muscle and the macrophages and and the nociceptors, but it's become really clear that there's a lot of other players, and I've probably left out a few, but that includes things like collagen and fibroblasts and extracellular matrix, and maybe even the fat that we've heard about over time. Um, so I want to reiterate again that we really are talking about pain and the pain um, and something is activating a nociceptor that would then ultimately send a signal up into the cortex before we get to pain. And Alan pointed this out beautifully, but something has to be activating the nociceptor to pain. And we, we really don't know, are do the imaging and the peripheral changes drive that pain? And the other thing to keep in mind is, I, and I think this is probably true, we're looking at a clinical manifestation that there are likely multiple underlying pathological processes that can result in the same clinical manifestation and the same phenotype in the individual with, with myofascial pain. And so um, I thought about as we were working, uh, talking over the last two days, what do we really need to do to move this field forward? Alan said it, uh, and it was really clear, we need an interdisciplinary collaboration. Um, some people were talking about some imaging techniques that were way over my head, but it was really clear they had things in there that could be useful in this population. Um, 
but they don't have my level of knowledge on pain or Alan's level of knowledge on pain. We need to kind of bring them together with the pain scientists and the clinicians need to get on board. And I've just listed a whole multitude of people that could be in this realm to start to move it further. So we really need to get that better understanding and we need to really do an interdisciplinary collaborations to move this to the next level. So some of the questions I thought from a clinical perspective is, um, do we have a real clinical understanding of the disease and its consequences? What we really need are some standard diagnostic procedures. So when we go out there and do clinical research, um, that we're all talking the same language, we're all using the same population. And if you think about fibromyalgia in 1990, the American College of Rheumatology came out with criteria for fibromyalgia that put people in that category and diagnosed it. And as we got more and more science over the years, those diagnostic, diagnostic criteria kind of evolved and changed into something that's probably more like, fi like what we think of as fibromyalgia and a little easier to use. And, but, but they evolved based on the science, but we have to have a starting point where are we? And we need to get some people to get together and figure out what those standard criteria will be to put somebody in a myofascial pain category. Um, we really need clinical studies that are aimed at understanding that pathobiology. And that includes the relationship of all those cool imaging techniques that we've learned over the last couple of days and their relationship with pain, not only at a single window in time, but as Alan said, that longitudinal window, if the pain gets better, do those markers change? Um, but the other thing that I think is really clear, because we're really talking about this myofascial pain, we need a better phenotyping of this patient population. And it, it, uh, what that phenotyping is, but it certainly has to be across multiple pain domains um, and domains that are affected by pain so we can get a better handle on um, what those biomarkers might mean. Maybe some of those biomarkers are more related to function than they are to the pain, and maybe they're secondary to the pain itself. Um, so I've just listed a whole bunch that we know in the pain field are really critical in pain um, and show up in almost all chronic pain conditions and, some, and are certainly involved in the transition from an acute to a chronic pain state, which is my last bit. Myofascial pain, there's an acute stage, there's a chronic stage, they're likely not the same, and there may be different factors between those two, and there may be factors that promote that transition from acute to chronic pain. And if we could begin to understand what those are, we might be able to drive interventions to stop the transition. Um, and, and one of the last things, because I am an animal mo model person, is to really think about, um, we need animal models and real basic research to really understand the interactions between the neurons and the nociceptors and all those non-neuronal cells and structures that are out there in the connective tissue. What is that intense innervation of the connective tissue doing and how are they being activated? There's all kinds of cells in the fascia, not just fibroblasts, but there are fibroblasts, but there's also all kinds of immune cells. There's fat cells, there's, there's um, the fibroblasts create the collagen, there's all kinds of extracellular matrix. What is their role in generating a nociceptive signal? And, and I really believe that this won't come from a single model. We'll have to have multiple models and multiple animal models looking at it in multiple different ways. And how does the muscle interact with the fascia that interacts with the immune cells and back to the nociceptors? Um, understanding this not only at this broad structural level from an imaging perspective of human subjects, but really getting down into the molecular mechanisms will really help us drive the field forward. And I think we can learn a lot from the pain scientists who've already kind of gotten out there and done some of this stuff. And they may be relevant or there may be twists on it that are need to be discovered yet. But if we don't learn those, um, and we don't go after them, we won't get to the level where we can move this forward. And then, and then the um, real clear picture comes back to the referred pain signal of myofascial pain. Um, it is a referred pain signal. Uh, you push on the trigger point, you get referral down your arm or into your head or into your face or into your uh, leg. Um, does, and they're very clear patterns. Is the referral pattern from a muscle 
uniquely differently processed in the central nervous system. We tend to believe that referred pain is going through the central nervous system. So is processing from muscle fascia tissue uniquely different than that from cutaneous tissue, which has been extensively studied in the pain field, less so in the muscle tissue. So I just leave you with that um, in terms of where we can go and what we can start to think about moving forward. Thank you. Thank you, Kathleen. That's a great summary. That's really good. Thank you. Um, so we will move on to the next panelist, uh, Dr. Julie Fritz from University of Utah. Julie, you. do you have slides to share or you just make comments? No, I don't have any slides to share. Um, and, and I think um, uh, I'm going to really echo my fellow panelists here in, in highlighting some of the important issues they've brought up. And, and just as a, as a bit of background, my, my, the perspective that I come to in, in this conversation is, is as a clinician but, uh, and a clinical researcher whose work in pain has generally been on um, a different end of the translational spectrum than a lot of my colleagues here on the panel. So um, I, I think what Dr. Sluka mentioned about the necessity of um, developing teams that can approach this question from a, a, a transdisciplinary standpoint and really reflect the urgency of the HEAL initiative in designing even basic studies with an eye towards their translational potential and accelerating that um, process as much as the science will allow is, is, is critical given where we find ourselves and where this whole conversation started back in session one um, uh, uh, around linking this particular uh, topic to the HEAL initiative and the urgency of that that particular initiative brings forward. I, I, I'll add a couple of other things that struck me in the conversation that's gone on in the last couple of days. And, and I think uh, uh, this overarching issue of what among the different um, imaging modalities and phenotypic characteristics that we've discussed are truly unique to the myofascial pain syndrome seems like a bit of the foundational question that we're, that we're after here. And to really be able to describe this particular category of patient as distinct from a more musculoskeletal disorder um, or chronic pain or um, back pain or whatever the, the condition would be is, is a critical step to advance the field. And really as, as um, some of us have experienced with, with other syndrome-like diagnoses to give it um, a, a credibility that sometimes gets lost when, when it's hard to describe what the phenotype of this individual type of patient really is. Um, one other thing, and again, I think Kathleen brought this up really nicely that I, I, I think becomes important to consider as, as this research advances is ultimately in dealing particularly with the chronic pain, um, uh, myofascial pain syndrome patient, that linking what we're, we're looking at here from an imaging standpoint to behavioral models becomes increasingly critical and, and really unavoidable. And, and uh, sinking this area of research to the interagency pain strategy and the distinction that's made there between an individual with high impact chronic pain versus chronic pain is something that'll have to get brought into this conversation as it advances um, and we begin to understand better uh, what the particular underlying pathophysiology may be for this type of patient. Um, and I think those were the things that I particularly wanted to emphasize. So uh, Dr. Chen, I'll hand it back to you. Thank you. Thank you, Julie, that's a great. Um, so our last panelist for this session is Dr. Daniel Sadekson from New York University. Um, Daniel, would you like to make some comments? Absolutely. I, I'm trying to share my screen now. Great. Let's see. Good, you seeing my slides? Yes. Excellent. Um, so, so thank you, Dr. Chen. Thanks, thanks everybody. I, uh, for one, have very much enjoyed this two-day crash course in the challenges and opportunities of myofascial pain research, and it's been a pleasure to participate. Uh, like my colleague and fellow panelist, Dr. Chung, I am an imager. Uh, in my case, a physicist, a biomedical engineer, and a developer of tools in MRI and some other modalities. 
Um, so I've looked to the NIBIB for many years as a source of support and inspiration. I've put in my time on the NIH study section for biomedical imaging technologies. But unlike Christine, um, I'm not a musculoskeletal imager. I don't have any particular specialty in pain. So you might ask why I've been asked to summarize a workshop like this. Um, I believe it's actually deliberate by the planners. Um, and that's because I represent a target for the sort of outreach that, as I understand it, you're hoping to do in order to bring attention to and develop tools for the study of, of MPS. So in the next few minutes, I just want to comment on potential ways to get traction in outreach and encourage cross-cutting brainstorming going forward by tool developers like me. Um, so uh, here, one more time, is the summary slide that you've seen over and over and is a great organizing principle for the workshop. I want to share with you what I see when I see this slide. Um, what I see is hooks. Um, I'm looking for potential hooks in imaging or sensing. I'm trying to imagine probes, physical or chemical or biological, that might be sensitive to any of these features. Um, so I want to look at um, what imaging or sensing modalities I know that measure related quantities, maybe find analogies that would connect existing tools with the biology or might give hints of new tools. So of course the workshop did a lot of this already in its program, identifying a diverse set of potentially valuable uh, imaging and characterization modalities that already exist and that either have been or haven't yet been applied to, to MPS. Um, I just give you a list here of some of the ones I thought were particularly promising. If I don't mention a technique of yours, please don't take it as an opinion that it's not interesting. Um, but uh, first of all, in the area of multimodality imaging, I think MR PET or PET MR, depending upon uh, uh, where you where you lie in the field, um, was particularly interesting to me. I want to share a dirty little secret about MR PET, which is that while it has remarkable firepower its adoption in the field of imaging has not been quite as vigorous as we all expected seven or eight years ago. So it's actually modality or a combination of modalities that's looking for killer apps that truly leverage simultaneity. And MPS could be such a killer app that drives the technology as well as leveraging it. So that's one way in. Um, the biology in MPS is clearly, as I've learned, multifaceted. There's complex tissue with multiple components and features. So I think it, was clear over the two days, it makes sense to deploy multi-parametric imaging and to try to find instructive correlations, for, say, with multi-parametric MR. And these, by the way, are just images I grabbed from various sessions throughout the two days. Um, the biology is also multi-scale, macro and micro, different spatial and temporal scales. So microstructural as well as dynamic imaging, I think, is important to keep in mind. Two interesting examples we saw included diffusion MR, which measures micron scale water motion in, in millimeter scale voxels, and also elastography either with ultrasound or MR, which can measure displacements potentially even smaller than that. And then finally, if the biology is multi-scale, then it sort of stands to reason that your models should probably take this into account. And the models can actually guide image acquisition, reconstruction and analysis and provide some guides for what to target with sensors. So that's what I saw. Here are some things that I actually didn't see all that much of, or as much as I might have hoped. Spectroscopy was mentioned in a conversation earlier today. Perhaps it was sort of accidental it wasn't included, but either MR or optical spectroscopy have a lot of rich information to, to give. Speaking of optics, optical imaging more broadly has been undergoing a real renaissance in the last decade or more. Um, and so you have photonics, you have a, a wide range of optical contrast agents, larger and larger fields of view and higher resolution. And of course, we, we saw bits of optics show up, particularly associated with animal models, but I wonder whether that could be leveraged more. And then um, I also didn't see a whole lot about point of care or home use devices. You know, with apologies to, to Dr. Lutz, who actually gave an excellent example of that in, in session five covering motion capture. I think it's covered, but it might be worth a lot more on this front. Point of care and home measurement devices are really a dramatic trend in the big tech world outside our smaller scientific world. And it would also be a great way to get big data. Even with relatively primitive measures, you could get with simple cameras or connect devices. And that's how also you get big data that you can leverage AI with in earnest. Okay, so. Last couple thoughts. This is just uh, uh, from that 
talk there. Um, so let's talk about how to engage tool developers. One obvious approach is to create more opportunities for exchange like this workshop. And I captured a screenshot of a particularly lively exchange this morning. Uh, Dr. Langevin asked, how, you know, can you measure pH? And then a discussion ensued about, well, do you mean intracellular or extracellular? And can you measure it in trigger points? And well, how big are trigger points after all? And so on. That's exactly the sort of exchange that gets juices flowing, I think. And then on the topic of aha moments, I noted a, a few over the past two days. So one example came in session two when Dr. Sluka on the panel now, who's obviously a, a, a past master at M MPS said, uh, I didn't realize you guys could image macrophage activity. Um, what resolution, what sensitivity and so on. And then in the other direction in session three, I heard Dr. Eamon, who's an imaging expert state with enthusiasm. Well, now that I've started looking into the myofascial unit, I'm fascinated and I think there is exciting potential to investigate. For those of you who don't know Dick Eamon very well, he's precisely the sort of leading expert you want to engage. He has the curiosity, the connections, and the means to make things happen. And then as for take home messages, here's one for technology developers. This is an important problem and an interesting one and your pet technique, sorry, pun intended, um, could make a difference here. So this sort of message works very nicely to tap into both the altruism and the vanity of tool builders. We love it when our techniques are used and used for something we didn't even think they could be used for. And then for MPS experts, one key thing I think is to remember that imaging can do much more than you may think. It's not just about mapping structure. We can characterize function, microstructure, motion, diffusion, perfusion, metabolism. Um, so don't assume a, you know, what can be measured or not. Make a list of what you want to be measured and give it to us. And so on that note, just one last thought about how to engage maybe the broader community now of tool developers rather than just individual developers. One first idea is to visit them where they live or where they gather. So this is a wonderful conference that I think has been incredibly stimulating. Another thing you can do is actually visit imaging or sensing conferences. Um, get invitations to present your key unsolved problems in myofascial pain. I can tell you that program committees and societies like the International Society for Magnetic Resonance in Medicine, the ISMRM, are always looking for people to present unsolved problems with which our members are not familiar. Um, and you already have the means for partnerships like that. I think among the speakers and panelists for the workshop, I counted three past presidents and four past annual meeting program chairs for the ISMRM alone. And that's just one of the many societies that I'm sure are represented. The second thought, um, uh, build up public data sets. I know you don't yet have all the measurement techniques you want, but this is kind of a, a chicken egg problem. Researchers in machine learning, for example, respond vigorously to public data sets. So the ImageNet data set, everybody knows, drove machine learning forward dramatically. It wouldn't have gone nearly as fast without that data set. There was some interesting discussion in the last session on data sets and challenges, including both enthusiasm and some caution. In medically oriented fields, I just wanted to say, we tend to worry about how clear our data sets, clean our data sets are, how difficult they're gonna to be to obtain, how can we protect all the you know, HIPAA protected information. Sometimes though, I have to say, this is kind of used as an obstacle to starting. Let's form five committees and then think about maybe someday forming a committee to form a data set. Tech types, you know, Facebook, Google types, look at us with raised eyebrows because you can always clean data. You can take advantage of dirty data once you have it, but you can't do anything with no data at all. And then my last point sort of is related um, involving public challenges. This is something else I think we can all learn from the machine learning community. Public challenges can be great stimulators of interest. Um, researchers in academia, also in industry, they're, they're competitive. They love a good challenge. So if you can find a partner in big tech, you're off to the races for PR. And, and just to give one example at my institution, we were more than a little surprised to learn that we could interest Facebook of all companies in the rather arcane problem of reconstructing undersampled MRI data and imaging faster. Facebook has no interest in, in imaging, but they got interested and damn the torpedoes, you know, they were asking us a few weeks later for data. And in a few months time, we were releasing large fully anonymized data sets and hosting challenges at machine learning workshops. So anyway, 
just a, a few thoughts here to consider in maybe planning next steps to follow the workshop. But thank you again for the opportunity to participate. Thank you, Daniel. That was fantastic. Um, this is really great. Um, I wanted to now hand over the, um, the reign to my co-chair, Dr. Dina Fisher, to moderate the panel discussion, which is open to everybody in this room. Um, if you can raise your hand, you can participate. Okay, Dina. Okay, well, um, I, I wanna reiterate uh, Wynn's comments. Those were really excellent and, and thought-provoking summaries and hopefully will stimulate a real great discussion. So um, I'm gonna jump right in. We've got about 25 minutes and I see um, Dr. Tick has raised her hand. Hi there, thank you very much. This has been an amazing meeting and um, of the comments that have just recently been made, um, they're very, very thought provoking and, and wonderful. Um, I just, as a, as a pain clinician, I just wanted to say that um, if we're, you know, the, the issue of looking for a biomarker for pain uh, is extremely, um, I think that's a distant, um, a distant goal. We can certainly find them for nociception, and there have certainly been there's been a lot of work on the central processing of of, uh, of the nociceptive impulses and how they get processed. Those things we can learn about, but pain is subjective. Um, that is, we still take the patient's word for pain. So finding finding a biomarker for that uh, might be a little difficult. Can I, can I respond, Heather, just briefly on the subject in a sense that I think, uh, I'm just jumping in, sorry. Yeah, that's great, thanks. <laughs> uh, um, uh, we actually do have brain biomarkers for not pain itself, but predicting the pain in the future, which in many ways, in fact, is more important than than an objective biomarker of the pain itself. Predicting the, the eventual occurrence of the pain, in a sense, is clinically far more important. Scientifically, I agree that we don't have objective markers of what is pain, just like we don't have objective markers of what is vision, or what is touch, or what is any other perception, in a sense. So uh, yet, mechanistically, we can identify processes, networks, systems uh, that are involved and can predict who is vulnerable to develop chronic pain or not. So that I think is something uh, I thank Alan for mentioning some of this direction of thinking. And of course, the pain is in the brain and without the brain, we, we, we are obviously not asking the right question. Uh, and that's maybe, um, the next meeting that needs to happen about myofascial pain and the nervous system maybe, or the neurons in a sense. Uh, on the other hand, also, I guess I really want to congratulate all of the technology that's out there. And I'm kind of jealous. I love technology. I would like to use them. And, uh, you know, I would like our whole pain community to embrace these technologies. Uh, and, um, I think if anything, that's that's what I have learned from this meeting. I'll stop. Can, can I say one quick thing? So as far as biomarkers for pain, that, that's kind of a loaded question as pain, as we've already seen today, myofascial pain is uniquely different than maybe uh, neuropathic pain or fibromyalgia or some chronic low back pain, nonspecific, or some other pain condition that's out there, osteoarthritis. So I think what we say biomarkers for pain, you're really talking more about biomarkers of a particular subset of pain. And that may be more doable if we think about honing in on the particular pain condition we're trying to, trying to study as opposed to being more general. And of course the biomarkers from acute to chronic trans, uh, pain transition may be more, more general, they may not be, but hopefully um, new, research from Vanya's group and others will address those issues. And can I maybe weigh in just really quickly? Um, I think in addition to the mechanistic models and the physics or biology based models, of course, there are also the machine learning models 
um, like some of the ones that uh, Dr. Majumdar was talking about, um, where you can, you know, you can create a marker that is predictive of either a group of patients or even an individual patient's pain for a particular condition. And then you can go and look under the hood and try to d dissect out what were the key determinants of it. So I think there's a lot of interesting basic discovery and we have the tools for it now, even in the pain biomarker arena. Uh, uh, let me make a comment about the machine learning approach and the artificial intelligence field and how it, you know, in a sense, how it segues with the neuroscience that we're doing. Uh, uh, potentially, they are very powerful, uh, but I also worry that, in a sense, that the field tends to be over enthusiastic as to what they can achieve. It often, in fact, skips control experiments, and it often fails in validating outcomes. In a sense, the machine learning technologies tend to overfit data. And this is something we, in fact, have been struggling with in, in using machine learning tools and constantly seeing that, in fact, they're simply overfitting data. Anyway, it's just a, I, it's not a, you know, it is something that one needs to you know, contain enthusiasm within the bounds of what is doable and what is achievable in a sense. It's not a magic tool. It's not going to answer all, for, all of our problems. Uh, uh, agreed, although I would also note that nowadays there are some machine learning techniques that are in fact explicitly physics driven um, where you can actually understand the outcome and go and look for the basic science to validate it. So I think actually we're finally at a stage where maybe you can start bringing those methods together. Completely agreed about generalizability and, and validation and so on. But I think you know, we shouldn't be so cautious that we don't engage just because of the enthusiasm. I think we should bring that caution in and, and help steer some of the machine learning methods. I agree. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, um, maybe we'll move on to an, another uh, another panelist who has a question, and I think that is Goyang. Thank you. <clears throat> Thanks very much. So I would like um, um, us to um, talk a little bit more about uh, um, uh, non-invasive or quantitative evaluation of myofascial tissue. Um, on uh, MR spectroscopy and the optical imaging uh, was mentioned, and uh, it was um, also something that we recognize uh, lacking some uh, sort of a, um, representation uh, at this workshop. The committee um, from the very outset uh, were um, considering um, uh, a talk on MR spectroscopy and also optical imaging point of care technology. And uh, we were having some difficulties on finding uh, a group um, uh, investigators uh, who are uh, actively developing uh, MR spectroscopy or spectroscopic uh, imaging techniques, or even uh, using um, uh, spectroscopy to study um, muscles and the con connective tissues, and primarily because of the, the sensitivity. Um, so we know that it has a lot of potential to um, probe uh, pH value along with uh, um, and uh, cess imaging and uh, um, uh, AMI proton um, transfer, et cetera. But I think the, the technique at the stage we were thinking, um, there's not a whole lot of research going on, a lot of development um, um, per se, um, in particular to evaluate uh, muscular um, cess, uh, system, muscles and uh, connective tissue. So I think you know, moving forward, this is something that we needed to explore a bit more and uh, um, trying to, to identify you know, um, people who are actively uh, developing tools and applying uh, the techniques. And in terms of optical imaging, um, I think uh, Dr. Uh, Spangenberg uh, mentioned the laser um, uh, Doppler for um, perfusion and also mentioned uh, functional near um, for um, oxygenation. And uh, I think in that area, I would like to, you know, optical, of course, ha has a lot of advantages, right? But the limitation is the depth uh, penetration and uh, um, probably, you know, good for superficial tissue and uh, things like that. So it's something that, you know, I, I think uh, we should talk a little bit uh, more on that. So my, um, my next question is, uh, 
geared is towards uh, the um, technology developers on, uh, on the panel. So what techniques do you think are ready or near ready for being seriously considered for um, myofascial um, tissue evaluation or myofascial pain evaluation? And so we can you know, begin um, evaluating, you know, making those needed correlative you know, studies and to see whether there is a potential you know, for them to become a biomarker. So um, we heard a you know, lot of you know, methodologies and is it really relaxation time, T2, T1, or uh, elastography, or some other uh, things. So what are the low, low hanging fruits that we should you know, look at right now? Christine, you want to tackle that first, or should I try? Uh, uh, maybe we can tag team it, Dan. Excellent. <laughs> <laughs> um, so from the standpoint of um, <clears throat> deploying imaging sequences, I mean, so you saw a whole host of sequences and, and different imaging techniques that are sort of ready to deploy for myofascial evaluation. Um, but I think one key component to that is that we need to choose the tools that are ready to essentially have a multi-institutional deployment so that we can have a patient population that we're collecting similar data on. Um, I mean, Sharmela can speak a little bit to this as well with regard to her managing the big OAI data set where she's taking you know, data from multiple institutions and then trying to create cohorts and pheno imaging phenotypes that then correlate with clinical phenotypes. Um, so I think a lot of the quantitative sequences, Gary showed the ultra short TE sequences, basic quantitative sequences, um, clearly um, you know, elastography and in some cases, Dr. Eamon showed some amazing stuff there that while it hasn't been pointed at the myofascial um, structure, I think could easily be done and broadly implemented. And then while the MR spectroscopy, maybe people aren't actively doing it, I think Sharmella made a good point yesterday and that, you know, again, that, that sort of target for us hasn't been set. So things that she's done historically or in the past or others have done, I think could easily be, again, implemented as long as that's the question that we're trying to answer. Dan, Sharmella, do you have other points? Um, yeah, I mean, I guess uh, I, I agree that there's sort of um, a tier of different techniques, some of which are much more ready for, for prime time now, some of which are sort of at the threshold, and some of which would require some active outreach, say some of the new photonic methods, you know, first you need to deal with the depth penetration. Um, and there are people who are working on that in various areas, or you can focus on animals. In terms of kind of the most immediately accessible. Certainly multi-parametric MR comes to mind. It's on, you know, in, in one form or another, it's on thousands of, of scanners around the world. And if it's not already, it can be transferred um, if, if the right vendors are behind the sequences. I think um, elastography, you know, we heard from Dick uh, Eamon that uh, um, there are clinical commercial implementations of this. So you could certainly do multi-center trials. Um, I think diffusion imaging is actually very common in the sequences, just a little less common in the, um, in the post-processing, but that could be shared. Um, and then, you know, MRPET, for example, is well-established at the centers that have it, but there are comparatively small numbers of centers that have it. So you can kind of rank it by the number of centers you want to be involved in a, in a trial right up front, maybe. Oh, Armilla, what did we miss? <laughs> Yeah, sure. Can, can I jump in again here and just to make a simple point that I think Alan was emphasizing and that's missing in this discussion. And the point is that before we do multi-center studies, we have to first establish some causal relationship in a very small studies that, that can be replicated across different labs or so. You know, what is the relationship of any of these measurements to pain? We still don't know that. Before we do multi-center anything, Let's do a single center establishment of some causal relationship between these, these measurements. Quick, quick pushback. Does it have to be before or can it be during? Yes, it should be before. Otherwise, it's a big waste of money. 
right? Then you will end up with a huge, you know, resources dedicated to very most likely being failure, failures, right? Unless we have some back ba baseline data of some mechanistic understanding of what we are studying. Is, you know, at, okay, well, well, I think I, that's I guess, my prejudice. I guess, you know, imaging can also be discovery science. I think there, there's a misconception sometimes that imaging is just a tool you use to no, 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 help no, you answer a, a physiologic question. Actually, we have so many pretty deep physiologic parameters that we can measure with imaging that actually even just getting a relatively large data set on what diffusion microstructure looks like in myofascial pain, I think that could be valuable in addition to and maybe even help to feed some of the more some of the deeper, you know, say neuroscientific studies. Just an opinion. I don't know. Um, I mean, the imaging information is, of course, useful. There's no question about that. But you know, if we're going to understand the pain, we need to link the pain and the and the imaging data. That's all. Admittedly, I I don't think there's any disagreement on that score. No. I think that is true. I think the issue is how how many patients are you getting. It's a fairly heterogeneous cascade of events that causes myofascial pain. So in order, I think, to uh, accomplish what is the correlation between a particular metric and pain, I think we have to move beyond this almost univariate or one or two variable analyses that we do. And I think this is the opportunity where you can bring in the interdisciplinary teams in terms of doing it. So from that perspective, I don't know whether you need a single center or a thousand center study, but certainly having a few key centers would be very useful. And right. not all metrics. So for example, if PET-MR is not available in all, I'm throwing out a number, in all seven centers, it could be an ancillary part of a focused question in a study. And I think we could, you could structure it as a mixture of all of these concepts. I think it's very doable in this particular time. If you're thinking in terms of imaging, all of the other measures that have also been presented are equally critical and should be folded into it. And again, to answer, the, uh, respond to Alan's statement, pain is in the brain. Sure, but when you've had shoulder pain like I have had for three months, it certainly feels like it's in the shoulder. So I think linking the two sides, my brain just doesn't forget that there is, I kept telling my brain, there is no pain. But I could not, mind over, mind over, you know, the musculoskeletal diseases did not work. So clearly, I think linking the two would be very useful as well from my perspective. Can, can I come back to Dr. Tick's comment? Because um, I, I appreciate the problem that she faces. So we, we can sit on the outside and talk about all, uh, all the wonderful science. Uh, and she is now faced with a patient who comes in with a pain problem. Uh, and she doesn't really know what actually caused it. it you can pal palpate and the patient is complaining and saying they can't sleep. Uh, so what do you do? You, uh, you can't, there's no blood test that says, oh, you, you have diabetes. Uh, so the, yes, there is no, I understand when you say there's no biomarker for pain, but the hope is that some measure might direct you to a therapy that is better than another one. You say, all right, you have pain. Let's start with NSAIDs. Mm, I don't really want to give you opiates. Well, maybe it's neuropathic, so I'll use antidepressants, uh, maybe some SNRIs, uh, maybe some uh, CBT. And, and basically, you go through the whole thing. Now, the problem I realize is that, even from an insurance perspective, uh, you want to make a diagnosis, and you, you're going to stick a person in a PET scanner, and it's going to cost a fortune in order to decide. And that's going to be a problem. Uh, but I do think we have the same problem when we work preclinically. You think it's hard to tell what's causing pain in a, in, a, in a human. Try it in a mouse. And even whether to know that the animal is actually experiencing pain when the majority of people just look at reflexes. Now they try to, they actually do things like grimace scale, where you're trying to read the, uh, with AI to look at the, at, the individual, at the mouse's face. And there are correlates. That's the best it is. But if that correlate is predictive, then it's useful. It's not a, a biomarker in the sense that insulin is a bio, insulin deficiency is a biomarker in a, in a diabetic, but it's useful. That's the difference. And then for it to be useful, it has to be quick and cheap. 
that's the other problem. So this is the ultimate goal. I mean, this is this is fundamental science. I get that, but I appreciate your face with the patient. They're not going to wait for us to, uh, to 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 come up with this. If I can jump in on this, like I've you know, uh, this is Lalam here. Uh, one of the s struggles that I've always encountered, you know, in working with various uh, uh, healthcare research communities, is that there's a tendency to silo how we work. The fact of the matter is that, you know, now let's let's talk, what we're talking about here today is myofascial and then people are focusing on the pain part. But the reality is, is pain really the end all and be all? At the end of the day, we're trying to improve the quality of health of, of people, right? So, and that's manifested in many different ways. Like that could be lack of mobility, lack of uh, just uh, sleep. It, it's, 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 a, it's a multifactorial problem. So it's my personal opinion that if we're going to actually tackle the problems that we say we want to tackle, we have to take an integrative approach. And even if we do these focus studies, I strongly encourage that you, you start incorporating computational modeling early in the process so that as we acquire knowledge, we start incorporating into these models early on so that we have systems that we can use to uh, simulate the basically the effects of myofascial dysfunction and overall health. I mean, part I'm gonna, oh. is, and I appreciate the level of, of complexity um, uh, that has really underpinned this entire uh, uh, meeting um, in terms of the, the different con uh, conversations and the careful thought. Um, and I was, I was just, I just wanted to add in the extra complexity of we can't get right now past in human medicine of uh, taking the patient's opinion for whether or not they have pain. Um, and that's one of the, 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 the complicating features. The other is when we talk about myofascial pain, we've also heard from many of the speakers, it, it co-occurs with other conditions. It is often, some people think it's secondary to other conditions, or it is, it is uh, we heard um, Dr. Serbel talk about osteoarthritis stimulating uh, the sensitization of, uh, and then leading to myofascial uh, pain, uh, myofascial dysfunction. So I'm just trying to add layers of, of complexity here uh, to what, what is already an amazing and very educational conversation. And if I, if I could say one last thing, sorry. Um, regarding pain, so in working with uh, the, the tactical population, one thing that I've noticed is, especially within that group, like you know, SWAT operators and stuff like that, there's a good cohort of them that their perception of pain is so different. Like uh, nine times out of 10, uh, well, not that much, but there's a significant number of them where I will be working with them and all they can tell me is that something doesn't feel right. And when I, I palpate, uh, like, uh, palpitate certain areas where I can, I can feel there's something there and normally somebody would be basically jumping out of the, the chair, they don't. They're just like, that feels uncomfortable and I just have to wait until basically that nodule or whatever relaxes and they regain mobility. And that's the only way that we see that there, there's improvement in their uh, status. And so I think pain is uh, certainly a good metric possibly for a large majority, but there's also a population that is actually very susceptible to musculoskeletal uh, myofascial dysfunction, such as military personnel that if we just focus on pain, it may not be very useful. And, and I'll just go back to, we need to phenotype the patients beyond pain. They need to, we need to look at their resting pain, their movement pain, their pain with activity, their pain uh, beyond their pain, their sleep, their function, their range of motion. All of that is really critical because some things may affect motion and not affect pain and some things may affect disability and not affect pain um, but likely in a lot of studies that have been done um, by us and others if you remove the pain input a lot of those other things go away um, so if you can knock the pain out i can restore function immediately in say someone who has a chronic achilles tendinopathy and i put lidocaine into their into their um, tendon 
their function comes back 100%. Their catastrophizing goes away. This is something that um, says that the pain generator is very important, but there are other things that don't go away and that may be more long lasting. So I think comprehensive phenotyping of this population needs to be done. And I haven't seen it in the literature at the level that's been done in other pain conditions. I, I totally agree with that. And for me, the way I address it is basically the performance capacity of the individuals that I'm working with. So, you know, let's say if we have uh, a breacher or a sniper or whatever, their ability to actually focus on the task and actually execute their mission, that's the primary objective that I, the phenotype, if you want to call it that, that I use as the metric to make sure that the intervention that has been implemented works. Right. Thanks, Sayal. Um, I think, Dina, you wanted to see if Dr. Sikdar could hop in here on this discussion thread. Dr. Sikdar, please take it away. Yeah, I just wanted to, um, to the, the discussion that was happening about multimodal imaging. I wanted to also emphasize that, uh, as we heard, uh, the diagnosis or myofascial pain is primarily based on the physical exam. So uh, we need to be able to link the physical exam directly to the imaging. And I think ultrasound um, is one way to do that uh, in, a, in a very concrete way. So we can actually directly look at what is being palpated and uh, use that as a starting point to then go deeper and add additional modalities on top of it. So um, I think that that's just the one comment I wanted to make and, the, and to see what others thought. So if there's a way to, uh, you know, sort of uh, have this sort of hierarchical uh, approach where we start with the physical exam, um, use ultrasound as one of the entry points and then go into these other more uh, sophisticated, uh, more specific methods, that would be a really uh, neat approach in my opinion. Dina, did you want to hear uh, Ms. Mundo's maybe clinical perspective and then move to see if Dr. Amen has a, a response to Dr. Sikhtar's comment there? That sounds perfect. Thanks very much. So Thank Dr. Mundo, jump on in. Dan, please unmute. Thank you so much. Um, I've learned so much in this conference and I thank everyone for their presentations and the organizers as well. I just keep coming back to as somebody who touches bodies and sees and feels them change in the moment. That um, uh, what keeps coming up for me is when people have pain um, and myofascial pain, it's in their tissue and they can change it with their mind and it can be changed in the moment with touch. And we so often forget that if we put our touch to our pain that we can change it, even though it seems like, um, you know, maybe if we just put our mind to it, that would do it. But the touch, this is something we're not taught in our culture and that it can really change things in the moment. It can change our pain. So maybe it's just elementary, but it just seems to me that something, even studying that uh, can be so important in, in the whole process of patient education and um, people just learning to feel the difference in their shoulders and touching them when they're rock hard and versus doing a, a, a manipulation on them and softening them and seeing it makes a difference in their pain. So that's it, <laughs> that's my big thing. <laughs> Great, thank you. And I, uh, Dr. Eamon, um, would you like to jump on in? I, I, I just had a few thoughts to share uh, really related to the whole previous conversation, but really starting with the, the question that Dr. Liu posed about where are the opportunities? And, uh, and then got the, the interchange here between what is it pain or is it something that causes the pain that, we, that should be focused on? So to me, as I've listened to this, uh, this uh, two day amazing two day uh, event, uh, I heard um, many examples expressed. Well, first of all, I heard that many people say that uh, that the subjectives in this syndrome are so uh, are they the fit the the findings in the, in the system are so subjective that the, the, one of the problems is, is the subjectivity. And at the same time, I heard many many people talking about very specific tissue level changes that are thought to have a high likelihood of leading to some of these uh, symptoms. So um, I don't think there's, a, it didn't sound to me like there was a lack of questions about, okay, what's happening with the, uh, the uh, fascial uh, 
thickening and so on, all the other things. So to me, there are a whole bunch of opportunities identified. I'll come back to that just in a moment. But I think that at the same time, we heard from all the people talking about imaging that there really is a huge toolbox already. There's a huge toolbox of very powerful, measurable biomarkers that probably haven't been particularly explored in this particular area. So it seems to me that there would be great opportunities to identify a few of those, and I'll come back to that in a moment. At the same time, uh, I'm coming to the end of this, at the same time, I think that Dr. Sodickson's uh, uh, nice uh, statement that, look, uh, you know, please take to heart what he said about, about the possibility that you could just simply identify something that as far as you know, can't be measured right now and throw out the challenge to the people that are doing that. Uh, the thing about imaging technology is it moves very rapidly and, and uh, something can be developed to solve a problem and put into action very, very quickly. This historically is the, is the case for imaging. So finally, let me just say that if you can identify a, a few of those things that, that we think are likely related to uh, um, the, the pain that's eventually felt, that are the maybe something are likely to be the fundamental tissue injury or whatever it is that creates this problem, um, then uh, doing some uh, studies to to assess that. And they don't have to. I'm a high. I'm a high. Uh, I have a lot of enthusiasm for what I would call high value research, high value science. That is to say, small studies done ideally longitudinally. And in this case, uh, these kind of symptoms change rapidly. I've heard they're labile. And so to look at some specific target and see how it changes in a short period of time with some kind of type of intervention, to me, that would be a very great opportunity. Not the only opportunity, but that's a potentially a big opportunity right now in my view. Well, thank you for that. Thanks actually uh, to all the panelists for really a, um, such a vibrant a conversation, I, I actually couldn't even jump in to, to grab the hand raisers for until Catherine saved the day. So um, thank you all for that. I, we are um, a, a little bit late moving on and I'm wondering if we should move on to Dr. Langevin's uh, um, closing out of this wonderful two day workshop. Yeah, um, I, this is when I, I think uh, this is just tremendous discussion. I think I wanted to thank all the panelists, um, not only for session six, but everybody who are here and who have really actively participated for the last two days. Um, I think we'll um, move on to Dr. Langevin to provide the summary uh, concluding remarks for the workshop. Alan, are you ready? I am. <laughs> Wow, <laughs> that's all I can say. This has been a really, really great discussion. Uh, I cannot thank everybody enough uh, for all your engagement in this uh, really what turned out to be a fascinating uh, discussion. So I have attempted to put together um, some some summary. Uh, I think the last session have been, has been extremely helpful in that and we've been sort of furiously taking notes. But before we talk about next steps and you know things that we feel are, I would like to go back to session one. <laughs> and um, I think that uh, there was a starting point to this meeting, right? And, um, and, and at this starting point, um, and that famous slide that everybody kind of kept using, <laughs> um, that what did where did we get to what in my view I, I'd like to show some of the things that um, that I, in my view um, were added to this slide in terms of cl uh, closing links making connections that honestly I hadn't thought about before and uh, where I feel like the collective input of all the people who contributed, especially for, with session one, I thought was extremely helpful. So I just wanted to go and revisit that for a second. So if I'm gonna share my screen. And in fact, what I'd like to do, well, if you all recall, I don't have it right here, but. You, you probably all remember that, that big complicated slide I had at the beginning that had all the myofascial unit in, in the center and all the question marks around it. And 
I think there were a few things that stuck in my mind. First of all, I think the myofascial unit is a concept that resonated throughout the meeting. I think people felt like, yes, this is, this is a good way to think about it at the level of the tissue, right? There's some kind of conversation, some kind of, of, of something going on in both, not just the muscle, but the fascia, the connective tissue, the environment around the muscle that also includes the nerves that innervate um, you know, the muscle, both motor and, and sensory, and also the, the part of the blood vessels. And we even talked a little bit about lymphatics. There's, a, there's something that I heard in the first session that I thought was very, very, uh, to me, an aha moment is this vulnerability of this myofascial unit to this sort of chronic nociceptive bombardment. Is it possible that this myofascial unit actually has a, a special vulnerability? And if so, what would that vulnerability be? Now, this chronic sort of nociceptive bombardment, there was um, one of the sessions in one, kind of where, does this, where would this come from, right? And I think it was Dr. Serbel who proposed that uh, it could come from a variety of sources, some kind of segmental uh, problem, either in a joint or disc or even viscera, right? That may cause some sort of reactive, uh, nociceptive um, kind of phenomenon that might actually involve this myofascial unit. We'll come back to that in a bit. So, okay, so if that is the case, we also heard, I think there was a common, a lot of people talked about this kind of low grade chronic inflammatory process. I think that there, it's likely that that's, that's true, that, that this, this myofascial unit is, is suffering um, by some kind of not acute inflammation with like neutrophils and swelling. And it's not like a, an acute injury where there's something that's been torn. It's more of a sort of smoldering, low-grade thing with perhaps some inflammatory cytokines, maybe some low-grade macrophage infiltrations. We heard a lot about that. So how would this low-grade chronic inflammatory process influence what's going on in this myofascial unit? And here we heard two different, kind of almost two different threads that seemed almost not connected. One was that there's something going on with how this muscle is contracting, how this muscle is functioning. There's a hyperexcitability. There are these taut bands. And I keep going back to that because, you know, you wonder, well, why is it just a piece of this muscle? I mean, we know we've all had muscle cramps, right? Where the whole muscle is contracting abnormally and that's excruciating. We're not talking about that here. We're talking about a little piece of the muscle that somehow is taut is contracting, is not relaxing. And that, and, and so this, this, this top band phenomenon, I think we don't really understand why. And then we talk about the, the identifying these compartments using imaging. I think it'd be very important to, to see, it's not just the compartment of like one muscle at a time, it's like within the muscle. Is there a compartment inside this muscle that's not acting like it should? And then this energy crisis or lactic return, somehow, if you've done it, it makes sense. If you have a piece of a part of a muscle that's contracting nonstop, it's not going to be very happy. Uh, eventually, it's going to run out of all kinds of things, ATP, everything else. And it, it's going to start to produce some, some substances that may not help, right? Like lactate or pH may drop. Helen, I hate to interrupt, but do you want to put this into slideshow mode? for the viewers. We're not in slideshow mode? No, you're not right now, but that's okay. Oh, Go ahead no, and just... don't tell me. Okay. Okay. <laughs> so I'm, I'm in stop share. Let me see. Do I don't have my VPN on. But you're okay. Just go ahead and, and put it in. Well, I want, I, I want you to see my slides because I've got some slides. I worked hard on them. <laughs> no, no, no. We can see them. We just need to see them in slideshow. In the mode. Oh, they're just not in slideshow. Yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. They're not, they're, sorry. So they're larger. There you go I'm at sorry. the bottom. From current slide. Okay, so you've seen what I've oh, seen so perfect. far. Thank you, Alain. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Catherine. All right. So the second box I have in here inside this myofascial unit is the connective tissue box, right? Not just the, so 
intramuscular connective tissue inside and also around the muscle, extra fascia. I wanted to just dwell on this intramuscular connective tissue for a second because it was Dr. Stecco at the very beginning who made a very, I thought, interesting observation is that the muscle spindle is actually connected to the perimesium, the, the whole connective tissue envelope around everything. And she even made the observation that a fibrotic process involving the perimuscular fascia and the uh, endomesium could affect the muscle spindle. And guess what? I mean, the muscle spindle is very much involved in muscle tone. Um, now, is it possible that there might be something about the muscle spindle pathology involving this connective tissue envelope around the muscle spindle that could affect neighboring fibers? Um, there's, there's some literature on this, actually, um, that, that uh, a, pr a problem with the muscle spindle may not necessarily affect the entire muscle. It could be focal. So, um, so the other thing is we talked about uh, the fibrotic fibrosis or, 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 or um, a, um, a, a problem with the connective tissue outside the muscle around the nerves, both motor and sensory. And then finally, we talked about fat a little bit. We didn't really tie it back to anything, but it's there and it certainly could matter. So I just wanted to draw a hypothetical question here between, first of all, a, po a possible problem, a local problem that may explain this funny taut band. And I think this really needs further exploration because I can't think of another, of, of a, another reason why just a tiny little piece of a muscle might contract and not the whole muscle. I know that there was the whole motor end plate um, hypothesis at the beginning, and that's also probably an area that needs to be explored as well. Um, now, I think that an important thing to think about, and that's what's brought up again at the first session, is that if you have a piece of muscle that's continuously contracting, that is, that is then producing probably some additional nociceptive input, could that explain this sort of myofascial character of this pain? And somebody um, raised a, an interesting question in session when I believe it was Dr. Oshinsky who said, well, what about if this was a different kind of C-fiber that would generate this? And I think that's a very interesting question. Um, this pain is dull. It's relieved by pressure. It's not it's increased by pressure. There's something about this pain that's different. And we really need to understand what that is. Why is it different? Now, could this also be the source of this additional chronic nociceptive bombardment that would get added on to this initial nociceptive input? Is this possibly why we have a sort of a loop of, of nociception that then leads to this malfunction. And if there's a way to tie the two together, this might be a, a, way, a way into the mechanism that differentiates the syndrome from other types of musculoskeletal pain. Maybe there is something going on that it re reverberates you know, as a circuit. Now the entry, the starting point, the initiating nociceptive input may be very heterogeneous, but it's possible that once you set up this system, you may have some common me mechanistic pathways that you can recognize as, yeah, that's this myofascial amplification that we've been talking about. The other thing is that there might be other ways that this could be amplified. And I sort of put in here a couple of other question marks about perhaps from the perineural, Dr. Barb's work, um, suggests that, right, that, that perhaps there's some dysfunction at the either motor sensory nerve, motor nerve or sensory nerve that could contribute to um, this uh, contractile state and, and, and muscle malfunction and also contribute to the nociceptive uh, input. All right, so just summarizing some of the goals that um, that, that I heard, you know, um, and that we were, we've been sort of chatting amongst our, ourselves with Dr. Chen and some, some of the, um, you know, um, uh, people, uh, the, the um, panelists in session three, just over lunch. And we talked a little bit now, and, and, and I think it's kind of resonated loud and clear that some longitudinal studies with tissue level measurements, and of course, not only tissue level, but the tissue level measurements is what we've 
we're focusing here. Of course, you need other types of measurements, behavioral, um, you know, uh, pain uh, measurements, subjective pain, it all has to be added to this. But the tissue level measurement, how, if, you, if we're gonna be focusing on developing some new measures, how do these measures correlate with symptoms, right? Natural history, acute to chronic pain transition. Um, of course, try and Dr. baskom has been saying this over the whole meeting, it's very, very important. Try look at effects of the pre and post treatment with these tissue level measurements. Do they correlate? Very, very important. Understanding the pathophysiology, understanding better this innervation, which, uh, which is probably not understood well enough. And then this comprehensive phenotyping. So what do we what do we mean by that? So because this is a complex uh, syndrome, we've we've heard everybody has been very much sort of suggesting that we need multi-system. We've heard this right, multi-domain uh, uh, approaches. We have multiple systems involved here: nervous system, musculoskeletal, immune, vascular. We've started. That was one of our starting points. Multi-scale, we've talked about there were some wonderful presentations about the multi-scale nature of what needs to happen here. Heterogeneous, very interesting comments about different muscles not being all the same. Of course they're not, but we don't often, you know, why do people get so much problems with their trapezius, right? Why is that such a, a spot for myofascial pains, the low back? You know, there's clearly differences from one muscle to the next, the temporal mandibular area. So, um, the dynamic component was very interesting uh, comments about people, these, a lot of this, these tests needs to be done while the patient is moving because so much of this has to do with movement or either lack of movement. We, we heard about these multi-parametric and finally AI ready, day, uh, ready data sets. Do we, do we read that, need that? Are we ready for that? Of course, there's always the back and forth. Yeah, we want that. We want this before and, you know, and this is a big, discussion, uh, a lot of this discussion goes on uh, at NIH. So next steps, okay. I think a starting definition of myofascial, uh, the clinical syndrome of myofascial, extremely important. We all have to agree on the starting point, history, physical exam, totally important. What is truly unique about the clinical presentation of myofascial pain syndrome that can distinguish it from other pain uh, uh, presentations. We need diagnostic procedures. If we wanna use any uh, beyond the history and clinical exam, we have to agree on what they are. Uh, clearly putting together some multidisciplinary collaborative networks is paramount. Animal models, we've heard a few uh, that presented uh, yesterday. Um, you know, We need to figure out which ones are the ones that are more appropriate. Tool developers, that was a really interesting, uh, the last, last presentation, Dr. Sodickson, very inspiring. And then, well, you know, what are the most promising tools? So um, I clearly think that uh, this has clearly been the beginning of very, very interesting, uh, I think, opening up of a new field. Um, I really take Dr. Basmom's suggestion that we need to bring more pain uh, researchers together into the conversation. I think that's very important. I think to this time, our goal was we really wanted to get the clinicians who, who deal with the myofascial pain syndrome, who are familiar with it, who examine these patients, who treat these patients. And we wanted to bring them, and, and the kind of the bringing together that we did in the last two days, I think was very successful. We wanted people who could describe what the sim symptom is, the symptoms are, so that the people who do, who, who develop, who, 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 who already have, or could develop some techniques could have the mental picture of what is it that we're developing these techniques to do. And I think we've accomplished that. Um, now, how does this all relate to pain? That's a much bigger conversation. And I think it would need more attention as to what are the key constituents, who are the key research groups that need to come in to, and we really would welcome very much everybody's you know, feedback about how we could uh, have a follow-up meeting to uh, better integrate this with the pain uh, research community. I think that would be very, very important. So, okay, um, I think we're close to a time. Um, I would be very uh, interested if there are any immediate comments for some of our, especially our session six panelists or any other panelists who want to share anything in the last five minutes that I'm gonna stop sharing my screen.
Uh, if there's any sort of um, you know feedback on what I just presented, I would love to hear it. Uh, Helene, hi, this is Jay. May I, can I weigh in? Sure. Would you mind actually showing that uh, the, the overall first slide again? Which first slide? Uh, the, I mean, I mean your slide that showed the kind of the summary. Um, you mean from 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 my pre the, oh yeah sure yeah with all the inputs coming in so what I just showed yes yes because I think it brings home a very very critical point because you started by saying that yes there could be something happening at the level of the um, in terms of the tissues right arthritis visceral etc. Mm -hmm. I would also like to emphasize for the group because as a clinician and as a clinician clinical researcher we look at it this from in terms of. What's the underlying mechanism that's driving the pain? So let's say you had a patient who started out with a true local musculoskeletal type of mechanism of injury, and you treat that, but they have a segmental component that is maybe being, yes, this is it, that may be driven by something else, whether it's OA, uh, disc degeneration, a visceral component. Do you see what I'm saying? So that's why I think this is a lovely slide for us to think about conceptually, because it also incorporates the very powerful osteopathic model of understanding sensitization, facilitation, looking at segments, et cetera. So I just wanted to really re reinforce that for everyone because, you know, myofascial pain, what is it, do you diagnose it with or without the trigger point? That's a critical question. And as Dr. Gerber mentioned yesterday, when we did our uh, extensive literature search, we found out that there's so much disagreement about the terminology that's used to define it. So that's why I agree with what so many of the people said today is about coming up with specific uh, criteria that everybody adheres to and then following that through in terms of putting everything into these boxes and then looking at the changes that occur. And then just one more thing I'd like to add is in addition to what Dr. Basbaum said about trying medications, because this is a healing uh, 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 related initiative, let's look at non-pharmacologic approaches, right? So whether it's dry needling, manual therapies, uh, electrical stimulation, et cetera, because those are used a lot in the community and very successfully uh, anecdotally, as well as in some research studies. Anyway, that's my two cents, but thank you very much. Thank you. Alan, I wanna draw your attention to a comment that Dr. Sanabria has placed in the chat. Uh, noting that as a tool developer, it has been a great opportunity to participate for the first time in this NIH Hill workshop. And he asks, what would be the next or best steps to stay connected to this community and participate in the development of this research body? I think if Dr. Sanabria wants to bring up his video and have any thoughts or interactions with Dr. Langevin, please feel free. Thank you very much. So this is basically my question. Uh, how can we stay connected uh, and participate? Uh, I am as well a researcher in Europe. And uh, for me, it was a very good opportunity from Stanford to be able to connect to this workshop. And I would like to know a little bit more what would be the best ways that we can contribute and uh, help to bring this research forward from the tool developer perspective. Well, I would say stay tuned. <laughs> You know, I, you know, we, uh, we, I mean, NIH is not just only restricted to the United States. I mean, clearly we, you know, we, we, we do do some, you know, international work, although, you know, there are some, some boundaries to that, but um, no, it was, it's, you know, we, we you know, there, it's funny though, that you mentioned that I, there's a lot, a lot of the literature on myofascial pain, myofascial tissues actually is, is it comes from Europe. Um, and uh, I think that this is an area that has been a little bit shunned in this country, like it's something that people just considered was not worth uh, focusing on, and I, hopefully that will change. Uh, I think that we would be very much welcoming international collaborations on this, because there might be some, you know, some, some good, good exchanges for sure. Especially if the meetings in Europe yeah, that's mm -hmm. right. We were all going to be in Amsterdam a couple months ago. That's great. We will stay tuned. And IASP. I yes. see, Len, that Heather Tick. Uh, Heather, did you have a quick comment to make? We are right at 3.30, which is our stop time. But if you have a quick comment to help yeah. close us out. 
Thank you. Yes, I just wanted to agree with what um, Dr. Shaw just said in terms of the um, the 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 possible um, uh, join uh, the, a single um, etiological factor that could be affecting the spindle as well as the other. Uh, conditions and symptoms uh, that are there, and the osteopathic model of being a segmental model of of how we um, how there is a, a, a correlation of um, uh, trigger points being uh, co-located in the same uh, myotomes. Um, so I found that uh, that was very, very interesting, and I, I agreed with that. And I'd also just like to comment that one of the things that we do have to tackle, especially in this country, is what you've just mentioned, uh, Ellen, is uh, if we look at the medical um, education system here, um, most medical students don't hear very much about myofascial pain at all. And they very often don't get very much in their residencies unless they're um, in very specific residencies, but even I've had, I mean, I train, I have trainees who come through the clinic who are uh, pain fellows, who are uh, PM&R fellows, uh, sports medicine fellows, and they don't even have a good grounding in myofascial pain. And, uh, and that's one of the things that we've got to face as well. I, thank you for mentioning that, Heather. It's a gap. It's not only a gap in research, most sadly, it's a gap in, in, in medical education. It's a gap in clinical practice. It's a, it's a huge gap. I, I think of it as a crater. <laughs> so, you know, I think we, we, we need to fill this gap. We, we need to fill it at all different levels. And the medical education is definitely one of them. So thank you for mentioning that. Can I, can I add just one point? I know you're trying to close. Um, from my perspective, one of the real big needs, and it was touched on, uh, is because I'm I, I'm interested in patients, but I work with uh, with mice. Um, is our models? Uh, the fact is that probably 95% of pain research uh, is done on skin. Huh. Uh, some viscera, little bit of viscera, very little. Kathleen is one of the unique people who actually studies muscle. Um, we know that musculoskeletal pain is in fact the major clinical pain problem. Uh, it's not skin pain. Um, we do skin because it's on somewhat easier, it's accessible. Uh, but Jeffrey Lotz's back pain models, I know about them in the rat. I don't know if, they, if they're used in the mouse. It's, a, it's probably a complicated one, but I'm going to be going to talk to him and see if there's any way to adapt it. Uh, we, we have to stop studying skin. Oh, I couldn't agree more. We, we need to go a little deeper. <laughs> <laughs> so, Alain, how are you feeling about wrapping up? Anything final that you'd like to say to bring us to closure today? Well, all I can say is this workshop has fulfilled our expectations and more. Um, really, uh, I'm very, very grateful for everybody uh, sitting through. I know it's hard, you know, these Zoom meetings that go on for two full days. Um, and but I felt I felt like people's attention was was very sustained. Uh, the comments were great. The discussions were great. So really, thank you. Somebody I saw in the chat box if there's going to be an executive uh, summary of, of the meeting. Yes. And and um, importantly, it's all video cast. So if you want to go back and watch any of the segments, uh, you know, you can. It's going to be posted in, I don't know how long it takes, a couple of days, probably. probably. A couple of days at least. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. stay tuned. Uh, check our website and CCIH. Uh, we'll have some, you know, and, and of course, you know, uh, this being a HEAL uh, sponsored workshops, uh, you know, we will, I'm sure we'll have something on the HEAL website as well. Well, thank you, Dr. Langevin. And I just want to say congratulations to the many co-organizers from NCCIH and from the National Institute of Biomedical Imaging and Bioengineering and the NIH partners uh, at the National Institute of Arthritis and Musculoskeletal and Skin Diseases, the National Institute of Child Health and Human Development at the, and the National Center for Medical Rehabilitation Research, the National Institute of Dental and Craniofacial Research, and of course, the National Institute of Neurological Disorders and Stroke, and the wonderful members of your planning committee, you, Dr. Langevin, of course, Dr. Wen Chen, Dr. Murad Sabri, Dr. Guo Ying Lu, 
Dr. Michael Oshinsky, Dr. Alex Tuttle, Dr. Brooks Gross, Dr. Chuck Washabaugh, Dr. Leslie Dare, Dr. Gail Lester, Dr. Teresa Cruz, Dr. Yolanda Vallejo, and Dr. Dina Fisher. I think it was a wonderful event for two days. I'm so glad I could join you to help moderate this. And thank you to our attendees on Zoom and on NIH videocast. And as Dr. Langevin said, come back and watch us again on videocast when the archive is uh, the archive recording is posted. So thank you everyone. And I think we'll bring our meeting to close. And a very special thanks for Catherine for, for keeping us all sane in the last two days and with and conducting this meeting with so much grace and talent. Thank you, Catherine. It was my pleasure. I loved being with all of you for this event. Have a great day, everyone. And I'm going to end our transmission now. Thank you. Bye-bye.